Blue Nose Audio presents Vibration, An Accidental Roommate's Romance, written by Lainey Davis, narrated by Tom Taylorson and Carly Robbins. Chapter 1. Cal. I shouldn't be upset that my family's missing my birthday, but here I am, pissed off. I'm turning 31. I'm an adult. But as each of my brothers and my cousin text me in turn to say they're out of town or have an essential work function they can't miss, I wallow a little deeper into the sting. The final straw comes when my mom texts me to ask if we can move our standing weekly dinner date to the weekend. She's presenting to a new client, and I get that that's important. I feel like a brooding baby as I throw my phone across my office after reading my mom's text, and then I decide I'm not doing anyone any favors being here at work anyway. I grab my phone, fish around for my keys, and walk out of Beltane Engineering without saying goodbye to any of my traitorous relatives. The shitty part of working with my family is that when they do something like this, collectively put me as a last priority, I can't really get away from them to cool down. This place is crawling with Brady's, all doing something more important than sitting down with me for one fucking evening to say they're glad I'm on this earth. I realize this sounds ridiculous, and I'm working on it. That's why I'm going somewhere else to clear my head. Once I'm outside, I don't know where to go next. I have no plan. What does a 30-something do alone on his birthday? I realize I don't have too many friends outside of my family, and that pisses me off even more. Don't get me wrong. My family is awesome. We're Irish, and there is a bunch of us, especially now that my younger brother has a live-in girlfriend. Shit, I bet Nicole would be a blast on a birthday bender. She seems like someone who could drink me under the table. But it's the middle of the day, and I'm not about to call my brother's girlfriend at work. She'd probably come kick me in the balls with her spike heels. I climb into my car and clench my teeth, hoping she starts. I drive a vintage Ford Bronco, bright red, and I've rebuilt her myself with some customizations. What's the point of being a mechanical engineer if you're not going to soup up your ride a little bit, right? It's just that I've been having a ton of trouble with some of the substitute parts I've had to order for the engine. It's getting harder and harder to find original components these days. Big red roars to life, and I rev her engine a few times in the parking lot, hoping I disturb someone inside, and then feeling bad about it. This shit always seems to happen to me, though. My parents told us they were getting divorced on my birthday years ago. Who does that? I was a toddler, but the whole thing scarred my brother so much that my birthday has always been clouded in this sense of unease. No wonder they all schedule trips and client shit for this week. For a long time, I thought I killed my parents' marriage. My brother Liam and I are Irish twins, born less than a year apart. That can't have been easy. But I know now that my parents are just really incompatible. Plus, my dad couldn't keep it in his pants. I'm a lot like him that way. I come by it honestly, I guess. Pittsburgh streets are pretty quiet for a weekday. I crank the radio and roll down the window, feeling the sun on my elbow as I let it hang out the window. This is nice. I needed this thinking time. I give myself a pep talk. My family aren't being assholes on purpose. We're all engineers, and lots of projects really get cranking in spring because the weather turns decent. My family didn't bail on me because they've been cursing my birth for 30 years. It's more that they tend to supervise industrial job sites that can't really excavate a mine shaft when the ground is frozen or saturated with early spring rains. It's just shitty timing. I head north along Route 28, stopping at the drive through beer distributor. I buy a cube of cheap, shitty suds and make my way toward the marina along the river, where my dad docks his boat. Don't mind if I do jumpstart his precious watercraft and treat myself to an afternoon cruise. I get the Aaron Gobralis going and head up the Allegheny River at full speed, even in the no-wake zone, until I remember that the high school kids might be practicing crew or something and slow her down. See? I'm not totally irresponsible. I crack open a few beers and guzzle them down quickly before I decide to see if I can turn donuts in the narrow river. Indeed, I can. Feeling listless now, increasingly bored, I continue on upriver. I'm well outside the city now, approaching the junction with the Kiski River. I slow down for a minute and pound another beer, 
admiring the confluence where the two bodies of water collide. There's a distinct line where the brown water of the fast-moving Allegheny meshes with the almost turquoise water of the Kiski. I think about how they're connected, two parts of the same body of water, like a family. But the Kiski is so different, another color, another direction, another way of moving things. I start wondering if the Allegheny ever notices that the Kiski is struggling, if they fight as they try to cooperate. And then I chug another beer because it's insane to be thinking of rivers as if they had feelings. I pull back on the lever and the boat catches a wave or runs over a log or something, jolting me so that I drop my beer. I take my eyes off the water for just a second as I stoop to pick it up, frantically feeling around until my fingers find purchase. By the time I stand up, I know I'm well and truly screwed. The boat is hurtling toward a small island. I try to slow down, I try to duck, but it's too late. There's a terrible crashing, crunching sound, a jolting crash, and the world fades to black. When I open my eyes, I can't tell which way is up. Everything aches, but nothing as much as my head. I slowly realize... I'm dangling upside down, and the throb I feel is probably the blood rushing to my head. I try to get my bearings, see that I'm somehow caught in a bunch of tree branches. I grip a branch and tug, and, feeling that it's steady, I use it to get myself upright. Holy shit, I say, looking around me. I'm hanging off the side of my dad's boat, which I've somehow managed to crash into the upper portion of a tree. I'm still half-buzzed from all the beers, and I know there were a lot because I see all the silver cans glinting in the sun as the boat rocks in the tree branches. But I know I should get to the ground and away from this disaster. I pat my pockets and am shocked to feel my phone is still in my jeans. I shimmy out of the tree and try to back away as my sneakers sink into the wet ground. This isn't an island so much as a piece of land that's been flooded. The tree isn't sticking very high out of the water, but only because the water comes up about a foot above the soggy sludge. I take a few careful steps back. My head is swimming with panic and alcohol. But even in this sorry state, I know I have no choice but to call someone for help. I pull up my contacts. All my recent calls are to girls whose last names I don't know. Waitresses and bartenders, mostly. My bank teller. I'd really like to call my Uncle Kellen, mostly because he wouldn't yell at me like my dad surely will. But Uncle Kel is out of state with my brother Liam for work, hence my fucked-up pity party. I sigh and blow out a long breath until my entire body feels deflated. There's nothing to be done. I close my eyes and dial, and my dad picks up after the first ring. This better be an emergency. Dad, I swallow. I can feel his impatience, and I know that's only going to get worse. I fucked up. Chapter 2 Cal My father doesn't say a single word to me. He shows up with a crew of old guys and a tugboat, and they yank the boat out of the tree before tossing me a ring and making me swim out to meet them on their boat. I realize it's ridiculous but I try to swim with one arm and keep my phone out of the river, needing to salvage at least some aspect of my life. The guys make a few comments about me being dumb as a bag of rocks, and I don't have it in me to argue with them. Soon, they leave me alone to sit by the rail as we chug back toward the city. I hear my dad working out a barter with the tugboat guys, I guess to cover the tow and repairs. I nearly gasp when my dad offers up season tickets to the Iron Men, but then I remember that my dad is buddies with the owner of the professional football team. I snort. Typical Mick Brady, giving away something he likely got for free in exchange for something huge like this. The light is fading, and the air on the river is cold as I sit there in my soaking wet clothes, wondering if my phone is ruined forever as I shiver. We coast past the marina to the boat repair shop, and I wince at the rumble of the loud garage bay doors going up. I'll be in touch about those seats, my dad says, shaking hands with the boat guys and giving them a wink. I appreciate you guys keeping this between us. I shiver with my hands in my pockets while they make small talk, 
and when my dad starts walking toward his car, I make to follow him. As soon as we're out of earshot of the boat repair guys, he turns and holds up a hand. You won't be messing up my interior today, Callum. We'll discuss this later. He climbs in his car and drives off, the gravel crunching under his tires. This feels pretty shitty, not gonna lie. Right about now, I'm thinking I'd rather just be pissed off back in my office than standing here soaking wet with no ride. I don't know where we are, precisely, but I know it's miles from the loft apartment I share with my brother Liam. My phone won't turn on, so I can't call a lift, and I'd rather walk home than go ask the tow guys for anything else. So, dejected and ashamed of myself, that's what I do. I wake up in the morning to the sound of my brother muttering and clanging pots and pans. I groan. My head is pounding, and my legs ache from walking three miles in wet sneakers. I don't even know when I got home last night, but I sure as shit didn't have the energy to clean up the apartment, which I'd let get pretty out of control while my brother was away on business. Chalk this up as another reason Cal Brady is the family fuck-up, I guess. Eventually, my brother leaves for work. I'm sorry I missed the daily opportunity to make fun of him for ironing the insides of his pockets. But not even that can make me feel better today. I make my way to the office thanks to ibuprofen and breakfast burritos, the grease in my belly doing wonders for at least a few of my issues. Nothing eases the ache when my father won't make eye contact with me at the morning team meeting. I try to follow him to his office to talk about yesterday, but he closes the door in my face. I guess I deserve that. For two days, my father ignores me and my brother rides me hard about being a mess, despite my best efforts to come home and clean up the apartment. Callum! Liam bellows from the bathroom. What in the hell did you leave rotting in this trash can? He stops down the hall toward the trash chute with the wet clothes I threw out after walking home covered in river sludge. I don't say anything to him because last week he yelled at me for wasting resources when I threw away a plastic bag of trash that was only half full. I get the same response when I try to run the dishwasher, also half full, and apparently not loaded in an efficient manner, and I walk away before I raise my fist to my brother's face. I feel like I'm going to snap if I don't do something drastic. I drive to work and storm into my office where, instead of pulling my dad aside to ask when we can talk, I pull up apartment listings online and fantasize about moving away from my family. The first listing I see catches my eye. Roommate wanted. Immediate opening. Large, sunny bedroom available in shared Bakery Square condo. Building has on-site gym, parking garage, secure entry. Balcony overlooks Mellon Park. Utilities included. Serious candidates contact Logan Miller. Huh. I sort of thought I was doing this just to mess with Liam's head or something. But the pictures of this condo are pretty sweet. I start thinking about how I've lived with Liam my entire life and never really got to experience living it up with bros who aren't related to me. His first year of college, I spent a lot of nights in his dorm room and we lived together the whole time I was an undergrad too, even when he started working. How would it be to live with people who don't view me as the black sheep of the family? Would it ease some of this tension if I moved out? I mean, I know I'm going to have to face the music with my dad here eventually, but what if I put up some sort of barrier with my family so I can try to get my head on straight? Bakery Square is a really cool neighborhood. There's like five cool bars across the street from this place, plus a million restaurants, and I could walk to whole paycheck if I felt the need to stock my fridge with fancy cheese. The one picture of the balcony is obviously taken from a seated position, and I start thinking how nice it would be to kick back after work, maybe smoke a J on my balcony, watch the honeys play soccer in the park, and just their sports bras. Then I think of my damn brother ironing his underwear in the living room. Do I really want to leave him alone with himself? I mean, if he's not ragging on me to shine my shoes properly, is he even living? I start to consider walking to his office making nice with Liam and confessing what happened on my birthday with Dad. That's the mature thing to do, right? Fess up and ask for advice to move forward. I don't want to just do yet another impulsive, stupid thing and move out. 
By the time I work through this train of thought, I'm halfway to the office kitchen and can smell donuts. When I get there, I start laughing because Liam is staring slack-jawed at a chick I know. She's Maddie, my brother Zach's girlfriend's bestie. I have no idea why she's here at Beltane Engineering, but I remember her because she always wears a pouch around her waist, and last time I saw her, she told me she keeps her snacks in there. See, this is the kind of brilliance I miss out on living with my family. Brady men just do not have snack pouches. I give her a high five and we eat donuts for a few minutes, shooting the breeze while Liam gawks at her. Maddie and Zach eventually head out of the kitchen and Liam is still standing around catching flies in his open mouth. I swat him in the chest. Dude, what the hell are you staring at? I cram a donut in my mouth as he points around, flustered, asking me who the girl was. Who, Maddie? I'm talking with my mouth full, but he just gave me a lecture about being a slob while he ogled a woman, so I don't bother to cover my mouth. Nicole's friend. Writer? He blinks. I swallow the donut. We've met her before. Liam shakes his head, and I reach for another donut, the chocolate cake one I'm pretty sure he was going to take. Screw him. I smirk when he glares at me. Liam says, She didn't look like that before. And I know he's got it bad for her. I laugh, tucking away this information for future use. But I can also tell that the window has closed for me to confide in him. The kitchen gave me clarity. Liam's not going to be on my side, and he's probably just going to scold me about the whole boat situation, like he scolds me about frosting on my shirt and loading the dishwasher wrong. He fidgets with his tie a few more times and looks like he's going to say something to me but I just shrug. Well, brother, I've got real work to do. See you at lunch. I head back to my office and look at the pile of work on my desk. More of the same, writing up some more reports on motors for industrial fans. I flip open my laptop and the condo listing is still sitting on my browser. No communication from my father. No serious assignments for someone who's been a practicing engineer for nine years. Just busy work. Funneled off to the kid they had to hire because he shares a last name with the owner. I stare at the real estate listing and click the link to start up an email. Hey, Logan. Saw your ad for a roommate. Am definitely interested and can move in right away. I've been to those lofts before. It looks like a kick-ass place to live. As I think about it, I remember when our company did some inspections on the property when the HVAC and electrical systems were installed. It's a cool-ass building, with no family members. I nod, continuing to type. So I can move in any time that works for you. I've got a couch and a bed and don't take up a lot of room otherwise. Email me and I'll sign whatever. Cal E. Brady. Not sure why I stick the E in my signature, but it felt more mature somehow. Callum Eamon Brady is just about the most Irish name a guy could have, but also feels like the sort of name a kid would have. Or maybe I just feel like my family thinks of me as a kid. To them, I'm Callum the Slob, the chill guy with no real responsibility. To Logan, maybe I'm Cal E. Brady, professional adult, enthusiastic roommate. I wonder if he likes beer. I make a mental note to grab some to celebrate whenever he sends me the lease info. And then I sigh and dive into my boring paperwork. Still no word from my dad. It's going to be a long day. Chapter 3 Logan I chew on the end of my finger as soon as I click Submit for the rental listing. I have to make sure nobody from the office comes across it. Not that any of them would be looking, but I know they'd call my listing number just to tease me if they found it. They always seem to find something to tease me about. My watch chimes the hour, letting me know I'm on company time officially, so I put away my phone and get to work. I love my job, even if the other people here are just like everyone else, mean, vindictive, and eager to claw each other's eyes out to get ahead. I know they all think I'm weird, but I have learned I can't let that stand in my way. I'm here because I'm really good at financial analysis, 
I'm allowed to say I'm really good at financial analysis because I have an Ivy League degree in that subject. I am not highfalutin, I mutter. This is objective fact. Living above my means in a condo I can't quite afford is a different matter. Always wanting what you can't have, I can hear my mother's voice saying. I shouldn't have bought the condo so soon, I know that now. It's just that I was struggling to find a roommate while I was still in Philadelphia, and the relocation expert from HR pointed out all the benefits of buying something compared to renting. It's not like I had anyone else to give me advice about this sort of thing. My classmates in grad school were paying for their degrees with generational wealth, and my single mother has been raising me on her own since she was a teenager, and her family cut all ties. I'm not out running up credit card debt on makeup and couture, starting back with my first paycheck. I've been sending enough money home to my mom to cover her rent so she can finally let go of the second job. But I don't think she quit yet. I think she's still skeptical that all this is real. I try not to think about the roommate listing while I dive into my first client portfolio of the morning. I was recruited to be an analyst here in Pittsburgh in my last semester of graduate school. I love the idea of being closer to mom. I originally bought the two-bedroom with thoughts that maybe she'd come stay with me, or at least visit sometimes. It hasn't worked out yet, though. As it turns out, I can't quite afford to pay her rent and the mortgage on a posh condo in a trendy neighborhood. I remind myself that this is a college town. There are plenty of young professionals who will be eager to find a tidy, quiet roommate like me. It's just a cash flow problem, I whisper. I am not living outside my means. I talk to myself. A lot. I have to try and find my way forward as I straddle two worlds. One of my feet is always stuck in the sidewalk cracks in the neighborhood where I grew up, while the other reaches around in the dark, trying to find the right way ahead. So far, I'm my only guide. I look up at my diplomas. Right now, they're in a cheap frame from the dollar store. But eventually, I'm going to have them framed with those nice mats I see fancy people have. I, Logan Miller, earned full scholarships to Temple and then to Penn. And now I'm sitting in my own office working as an analyst at a hot financial firm in Pittsburgh. Not a cubicle, I mutter, admiring the view of the river from my small window. I've got an office with a door. I'm lost in these thoughts when said door whooshes open. Marie, my supervisor, bursts in. Let's go, Logan, she sneers, emphasizing my name. Staff meeting with top brass. Hmm, that's very unusual. Top executives typically are scheduled out well in advance, and meetings with them come with agendas and save the date notices from their administrative staff. I close my computer and grab my clipboard and notebook, tucking a pen behind my ear as I follow Marie to the large conference room. The space is buzzing when we arrive. All the analysts and sales staff clamor to find seats at the table before Mr. Alexander, our director, or is he the owner, I wonder, walks in with a pair of assistants at his heels. He types on his phone as he walks and hands the device to one of the assistants, while the other hands him a folder. I can see talking points paper clipped to the top of the folder, but can't make out the text. All right, he says, and the room goes silent. I know this is an unusual meeting, and you're all curious why we're here. He looks up from his notes and around the room, where everyone is wrapped and staring. We have just received a signed contract to manage the investments accounts of the Rudy family. Jaws drop around the table, and some of the analysts slap each other high fives. I have no idea what this means, so I put my business smile on my face a practiced expression I've learned to wear in professional settings until I figure out what to do with my emotions. I write, Rudy, on my notepad, as Mr. Alexander starts talking about how this high-profile account means a lot of prestige for the firm. 
I'll be looking for my best analyst for this account, he says, looking slowly, pointedly around the room, nodding periodically. I feel a flutter of hope at this statement. I might not know who this family is, but if they've got a lot of money to invest, I know I can help them do so profitably. Could Mr. Alexander possibly pick me, a brand new employee fresh from graduate school, to work on an account that is clearly meaningful to the company? As this is a high-profile account, I'll be meeting with all of your supervisors in the coming weeks to determine the best team to service the Rudies. If I'm not being clear, that means pull out the stops for customer service. No limits on the budget for whining and dining. Everyone starts murmuring and whispering, and Mr. Alexander holds up a hand. We will also be planning our regular gala to close out the fiscal year. All of our top clients will be invited, and you will be expected to attend and help them celebrate all the magic we have made together this past year. More murmuring from around the table, and sinking dread from me. I don't do well at events. I worry constantly that everyone can tell I grew up poor, that they can smell it on me no matter how fancy a dress I buy or how carefully I walk in my heels. I am an analyst for a reason, and that is because I do not do very well talking to people. The account managers schmooze the clients, share the information I give them, verify the plans I map out. I sit in my office with my forecasting software and my multiple monitors, and I run numbers. I like numbers. They're predictable, and they don't disappoint. They do not involve emotions. Mr. Alexander ends the meeting abruptly, disappearing down the hall with his staff close behind, and everyone erupts. I bite my lip, unsure whether I should stay and eavesdrop to figure out what's going on, or slink back to my office and keep going with my reports. Devin, a guy who has so far been the least mean to me, catches my eye. Isn't it great? I bite my lip, considering. Devin has not outwardly mocked my name and did not laugh at me the day I came to work wearing two different but similar shoes by accident. I nod and decide I can trust him to fill me in on this. Actually, you know, I'm not from Pittsburgh. Can you tell me who the Rudy family is? His eyes bug out of his head. Oh my gosh, seriously? They own the Iron Men, the pro football team? I grimace. That, Rudy? This city is absolutely obsessed with its professional sports teams, and I grew up about an hour away. Football and hockey were the lifeblood of my hometown, an economically depressed post-industrial area. I understand the allure of professional football. It brings people together and gives them hope. I can't believe I didn't make the connection. This family must have more money than God. Man, Logan, where have you been? He shakes his head. It's gonna be a bloodbath battling for whoever gets that account. In high school and college, I was always waiting tables while football games were on in the background. Sports were the soundtrack to my life. It seems surreal to imagine I might brush up against this world in real life. Devin shrugs. Well, one of us is going to be working a lot on this account, that's for sure. You think we'll get box seats at the games? I'm about to shrug and tell him I have no earthly idea when Marie clears her throat. I see that you're busy gossiping about the new client, she says, narrowing her eyes at me, not Devin, making me wonder for the millionth time whether I just always seem to land in jobs with miserable colleagues or if people really are this grouchy. I guess I thought once I was working somewhere with a decent paycheck, my coworkers would be happier people. Shall I tell your current clients to wait for their financial reports? Or would you like to explain to them why you put their work on hold to talk about other clients? Marie truly is impossible to please. I know she supervises at least three other people at this table and manages all their accounts, and they're all actively squealing about the Rudy announcement. She must be able to be nice to clients, 
or else she would never have gotten to this position. What do I need to do to get her to use some of that kindness with me? I breathe slowly through my nose and stand up. I apologize for lingering after Mr. Alexander ended the meeting, I say, and I walk out of the conference room before she has a chance to say anything more. I close my office door and try to gather my thoughts. I conclude that expressing interest in a new and much-desired account would put a target on my back socially, and company culture is already pretty rough for me. I've only been here a few months. Better to build rapport and do good work with my current client portfolio. I hear a ping from my purse and realize I forgot to turn my phone on silent. I'm glad I left it behind when I went to the meeting. I would have been mortified if it chirped while Mr. Alexander was speaking. I slide my phone out of my bag, intending to power down until my lunch break. But I see that I've got a new email. Someone named Callie is interested in the apartment. I feel relief melting through my bones at the thought of the financial cushion I'll get from the rent check. Callie offers to move in immediately, making me suspect that she's also dealing with some sort of stressful situation. Through my closed door, I hear Marie in the hall talking to another analyst. We've got this in the bag, guys. No worries. It's not even a competition. You're the best analyst we've got and clients love me face to face. I hear them agreeing. I'm not even sure who she's talking to, but I know it's a guy. There are very few women who work here. I knew finance was a male-dominated field. I had an advisor during undergrad who used to try to give me pep talks, tell me I had the right mind for this line of work, but I'd have to hurdle over men who don't know how to behave around women. I start to daydream about how my work life could be better. If Marie and one of the jerky were assigned to the Rudy account, maybe they'd be so busy that I'd get shuffled to another team. People who respond when I wish them a good morning or invite me to join their conversation rather than walk away as I approach. Maybe I'd have a boss who was more supportive, more like the teachers I had at Penn. My professors were tough, but kind. I had brief internships in a few different companies in Philadelphia throughout my coursework. The people there were a mixed bag. Many of them as miserable as my colleagues here, but some had a certain spark, a love of their work. I'm sitting clutching my phone, remembering the week I spent shadowing in a tech startup, when Marie bursts into my office. Her eyes widen as she sees me sitting with my phone in my hand. God, Logan, I can't believe I have to micromanage you like this. Why are you not working? Seriously, get your ass in gear so I can send the Emersons their third quarter forecast. I have no response. She has indeed caught me not working. I could remind her that I'm salaried and often work a few minutes late or come in a few minutes early. It's okay if I take a break, surely. But I don't say any of that. I swallow and nod and pull up my software, clacking on my keyboard until she huffs out of my office and stomps into her own. I feel so alone and confused. I wish for the thousandth time that I had girlfriends I could call about this. Everyone on television would be whisked away by a best friend for pedicures. Or shots. A best friend could tell me Marie is rude to brush off her comments and focus on the prize. It's just that I'm not so sure I know what the prize is, actually. My chest aches and I feel so out of place. I feel a tear form at the corner of my eye, and I flick it away and shake my head. Nope, I chose this. I can do this. I pick up my phone and dial my mom, needing some sort of comfort and reassurance. Lo, I hear a lot of commotion in the background. Of course, she's at work. I check the time. Should be in between breakfast and lunch rush. Hey, Mom, I say, biting my nail, and then stuffing my hands onto my lap as if she could see me doing that. You doing okay? Eh, you know. Party of six left a 10% tip this morning. Felt like chasing them down the sidewalk, but it's raining here. You know how it is. Why do people do such a thing? I hate that for you. She makes a grunting sound, and I listen to the familiar noises of the back of the restaurant. 
Pans clatter, the dishwashers make jokes. Sounds like someone's playing music. Did you get the check I sent, Mom? Logan, she sounds upset. You can't be doing that, baby. You need backup money. I told you, Mom, I can spare it. I lie. I can't quite spare all that I sent, but I wanted to pay her full rent. Let her drop the warehouse job. Maybe live a little. She's only 40. She shouldn't have to work herself to the bone around the clock. Mom sighs. I just... This is all very new. You're very new there. You know how it is with new people at work. You have to pay your dues, and we don't know if you'll still be there a month from now. I close my eyes. You didn't leave the warehouse, did you? Another sigh. Baby, I can't just give up a good job on a hope and a promise. I have a lot of seniority there. Well, they should pay you more then, I snarl. And she snorts. That'll be the day, Logan, won't it? Hey, what time is it? Are you calling from work? I'm taking a break, I tell her, reminding myself to stay late and make up the difference today. I hope Marie doesn't wander past. God, what if she's listening at the door? Is that really how people behave in professional offices? I guess you're right, I say. Things aren't exactly what I was expecting here. Not really. You causing trouble with your questions? You always had so many questions. I'm not sure what I was expecting when I called my mother. This is always how it goes with us. No room for coddling. Tough love. I'm trying to keep my head down, Mom. I'm trying. Well, I do appreciate the money you sent, honey. I really do. I'm really proud that you got a paycheck big enough to send me that kind of change. You just keep working hard and keep in their good graces. I will, Mom. She hangs up abruptly when someone calls her name. I remember being surprised in college to overhear some of the girls in the dorm talk about how the culture at restaurants was brutal. That was the word they used. Ever since I was old enough for a work permit, I've been working in restaurants. It felt very illuminating to hear someone use that word, to give voice to the type of energy I felt waiting tables. Brutal. I wish I could go back and find them and tell them things aren't much different in business. My feet hurt less, but I'm still holding my breath a lot. My phone pings again. Another email from Callie. No, Cal E. Maybe she spells it weird, which is fine because I'm a girl named Logan. What a pair we could be, right? Maybe Callie could become my best friend, and we could do spa nights with those mud masks on our faces to soothe our pores. I could tell her how much Marie makes me feel like garbage, and she'd say something witty to make me feel better. I look at her emails again. There's something comforting about the way she avoids capital letters, and I decide it means she doesn't take up much space. To me, this signals that she is considerate and clearly in a bind to live somewhere else, based on her enthusiasm. I silence the voice telling me it's a terrible idea to sign a lease and live with someone I haven't met. I ignore the niggling fear that I'm risking a personality clash. I take a deep breath and send her the generic lease agreement I found online, and when she returns it, initialed and signed, I do a little dance. Things are looking up. Chapter 4. Cal. I look up from my paperwork when my phone pings, letting me know I've got a new email. Sweet. Logan sent one of those e-document lease agreements. He seems like a guy who has his act together. It briefly occurs to me that I could be setting myself up for a terrible living experience. But I'm a pretty chill dude. I've got divorced parents, weird brothers, and a female cousin who is basically the bratty sister I've always needed to let me know when I screw up. This will be fine. I can tell. I stand up and stretch, noticing a dull ache in my limbs left over from the boat crash. I've been sitting way too long. I hate being at a desk. Most days I wish I'd gone into civil engineering like my brothers. At least then I'd be out in the field on the reg, climbing poles and checking out mine seams. Who knew mechanical engineering involved more paperwork than it did getting my hands on mechanical engines? I remind myself it'll likely be a long-ass time before my dad trusts me with any hands-on work. 
we still haven't talked about my birthday. Well, moving out of my apartment ought to get my blood flowing at any rate. It's true what I told Logan. I pretty much just have my clothes, my bed, and my couch. Shouldn't take too long to throw all that together. I will need help to get my bed in big red, though. I poke my head out my office door to the cubicle farm. I'm painfully aware that I really only have an office because my dad runs this place. Despite passing my professional exams, I'm basically a paper pusher here, like all these guys with no privacy. I look around, trying to find one of the interns. Yo, Drew! I lean against the wall of his cubicle, and I feel it wobble a bit under my weight. I straighten up as he turns around. You want to earn a quick fifty bucks after work today? He arches a brow at me. I remember what it was like to be in college. I also know what we pay our interns, so I definitely understand why Drew starts nodding before I even tell him what I need. It shouldn't be more than a few hours, I tell him. I need help getting my couch up on top of my Bronco, and maybe a hand taking my bed apart. I don't have much stuff. Sounds like a plan, he says. Did you drive today? I laugh. I also remember what it was like taking the bus to and from campus every day. Although I'm sure my dad and uncle would prefer if I didn't park Big Red in the company lot. She's not much to look at. A little bit like me. Rough around the edges, full of big ideas. Not content to sit parked among the neat and tidy company cars without dripping a little. Around four, I grab Drew and we head to the loft I've been sharing with Liam for a few years. Of course, the place is spotless. I know Liam thinks he's doing me all sorts of favors, picking up after me all the time. But truthfully, he drives me insane the way he's always rearranging the cupboards so I can't find anything. Like, I'd probably remember to pick my running shoes up out of the entryway if it didn't take me so long to find my protein powder to make a recovery drink after my long runs. I have high hopes this won't be an issue living with Logan. Drew and I get my clothes and trash bags pretty easily, and the rest of my personal stuff in my duffel bag. I borrow a handful of bungee cords from my brother, and the two of us get my couch settled in on top of Big Red. It doesn't take long to disassemble my platform bed. I can't decide if it's awesome or sort of pathetic that my entire life fits inside my car, I say to Drew, who shrugs. You don't even have video games? He looks around the living room as I do a final sweep of my bedroom. I remember that I do actually own a suit, but since my room here didn't have a closet, it's hanging in my brother's. I feel a pang when I see that he's hung it carefully in a garment bag for me, obviously cleaned after the last time I wore it to a company event. We aren't really gamers, I say to Drew. I grab the suit, remembering that I'm not moving to the moon. We mostly wrestle with each other over the guac at family dinners and go running together. I shake the duffel bag with all my running gear. I take one final look around the loft and then toss my keys on the counter before I pull the door shut behind me. Drew and I drive to the east end, rocking out to some jams as we sit in traffic with the windows rolled down. I pull into a loading spot in front of my new digs and ring for Logan, who buzzes us in. I'm not sure what to expect, but it's definitely not the chick who opens the door when Drew and I get to the apartment with our arms full of trash bags. Are you Logan's girlfriend? I ask at the exact same time the girl asks me, Are you Callie's boyfriend? I crack a smile. Boyfriend? Me? Nah, I'm single. Where's Logan? I want to meet my new roomie. I crane my neck to see around her, catching a whiff of her shampoo as I do. She smells very... clean. Her hair is all smoothed back in some sort of twist, and she's wearing all black. She must work in a stuffy office with a dress code. Um, where's Callie? She asks, putting her hands on her hips, causing me to notice how the material of her blouse pulls across her chest. Callie? She rolls her eyes. I'm Logan Miller, and Callie Brady answered my ad for a roommate. She frowns at the bags in my arms. Are you helping her move? Drew starts laughing and tosses his bags inside the door. Oh, snap, Brady, he says, bending at the waist to catch his breath. You're screwed. I suck in air through my teeth and consider this woman. I am Callum Eamon Brady, I tell her. And you've got a dude's name. Her eyebrow shoots up. Well, you've got a woman's nickname. My nickname is Cal, I tell her 
tossing my trash bags in the door on top of the ones Drew dropped. Cal, space, E, space, Brady. What's so feminine about that? Logan rolls her eyes at me and throws her hands up in the air. I should have known better than to trust someone who doesn't use punctuation or capital letters in their email. She shrieks. What the heck are we supposed to do? You can't live here. This is definitely not what I expected. But after the week I've had, I'm definitely not up to moving my shit back home and having to beg my brother to let me inside the door. I walk inside the condo, checking out the space. There's tons of room here and really good light. I use punctuation, I mutter, walking down the hall. I stop in front of the empty room. I grin at the view of a bunch of kids playing soccer in the park down below. It's nice here. Drew, let's bring up to bed next. I start to walk back out, looking around for something to prop the door open. Logan follows me, her dress shoes clicking on the polished concrete as she hurries. What are you doing? You can't move in. I can't live with a... with a man. I flip the deadbolt so the door won't slam and turn to face her. Listen, toots, you have nothing to worry about from me. What you see is what you get. Just because I have a peen doesn't make me any more of a threat than whoever you were expecting when you signed a lease without meeting your roommate. I hear her groan as Drew pushes the button for the elevator, still laughing. He and I hustle with the rest of my stuff, and in about three more trips, have everything I own deposited in heaps around Logan's formerly tidy condo. You're something else, Brady, he says, holding out his palm for his cash. I fish around in my jeans for my wallet and shake my head as I count out the bills. This is really no big deal, I tell him. He looks toward the balcony where Logan is pacing and tugging on her hair in frustration. It falls out of the twist and slithers down her shoulders, long and brown and shiny. Sure, man, Drew says. It's no big deal at all to be living with a hot librarian. I grin at him. You get that vibe, too? Drew heads out, and I adjust the couch, moving Logan's armchair to the side so the couch faces the TV she mounted on the wall. I flop back with my hands behind my head as my new roommate slides open the balcony door to come back inside. So, I ask her, what's your deal, Logan the girl? Chapter 5 Logan I'm not a girl, I huff at him, feeling very childish indeed when I do. Cal has certainly made himself right at home, which is unnerving and calming all at once, somehow. What are you doing? He grins at me, and I stare at his perfectly white teeth. He has the kind of teeth where you can tell his parents sent him to the orthodontist. I'm always very self-conscious about my smile. I was probably the only teenager around who wished for braces, while everyone around me was groaning about not being able to chew gum. I add invisible braces to my mental wish list for when I get my finances sorted out. I'm relaxing, Logan, kicking back on the couch in my new apartment. What's it look like? He laughs and sits up, stretching, and I stare at him as his t-shirt lifts, revealing a sliver of flat, tan abdomen. I take in the long lines of my new roommate, the veins in his forearms, the way his too long hair curls around his ears and at the nape of his neck. After a bit, he groans and stands up, stretching and giving me more of a view of his stomach. I can't look away. I cannot live with someone who looks like this. It's indecent. He stoops to pick up some of the trash bags that evidently contain his belongings, and I watch as the muscles in his neck flex with his effort. You like watching me work hard? He shouts over his shoulder as he walks down the hall toward his room, and I follow, drawn to him. This might be the longest time I've spent alone with an adult male. What am I thinking? Allowing him to unpack, to actually move forward with this ridiculous arrangement. I can't live with a man, not a man that looks like, well, like men are supposed to look, I decide. I'm not a virgin. I've given sex the old college try. That doesn't mean I'm going to have sex with him. Maybe it's like Cal said. Him having a penis doesn't automatically make him a bad choice for a roommate. 
No, it's more that I don't know him. We haven't discussed our lifestyles. What on earth was I thinking, sending him a lease agreement before I met him? Hey, Logan, can you hold this for me? Cal's voice carries me back to the present, and I look in the door to his room. I'm already thinking of it as his room. He's kneeling in the middle of a pile of boards, holding a wrench. Thingy. I could use a hand just keeping this steady. If you're willing. His face is so earnest, like there's truly nothing else he wants or needs than a steady hand to help screw two boards together. I feel myself waiting to try to figure out the joke, holding my breath to see which social norm I violated. But none of that happens. Instead, he just lifts his eyebrows higher and higher in anticipation of my answer. Let me change out of my work clothes quickly, I say, dashing down the hall to my own room before he can respond. I hang my slacks on the hanger carefully, toss the blouse in the hamper, and yank open my drawers, searching for something I won't mind ripping. My wardrobe is nearly 100% office wear at this point. I had to devote my entire clothes budget to finding a set of things I could wear to work every day without looking like I'm repeating the same five outfits each week. I glance at my drawers and decide my old uniform from waiting tables will have to do for assembling furniture. And I yank on some ripped jeans with a diner t-shirt. All right, I say to Cal, noting that he's setting up his bed on the wall he shares with my room. Our heads will be inches apart separated only by some drywall. I bite my lip, urging my brain not to linger on thoughts of Cal in bed. Tell me what to do. He lines up a board and tells me to hold it steady as he quickly cranks in a few screws. I see that the wrench tool is hooked up to his keychain, which is attached to his belt with a chain, but not like it's for show. His tools seem well-worn in a good way. We make our way around the rectangle, and I see that his bed goes on top of a set of drawers. That's pretty smart, I say, marveling at how quickly the whole thing comes together. I'm a smart guy, he says, grinning again. We talk as he screws, sharing the basics of our jobs. I can already tell you're a lot like my brother, Liam, he says with a nod. You like things to be particular, right? I can almost feel you itching to organize my sock drawer once I get this thing put together. I huff out a laugh. Okay, fair. I do keep a tidy house. I bite my lip and frown at the heaps of bags he seems to have kicked all around the room. Surely he's not going to just leave them like this. So, you've got brothers? Was the person who helped you today one of your brothers? Drew? Nah, he's an intern. My brothers wouldn't help me move into an apartment sight unseen with a stranger. His eyes flare and he grins again. It's an expression that seems to come easily to him. I think I just needed to do something I knew they'd hate. I don't know. How many brothers are there? Just two? We have different moms. My dad was a bit of a lech. A what? Different moms? He nods and beckons for me to hold one last board, and I realize I'll have to climb on top of the bed structure, very close to where he kneels with the tools. I make my way over to him, and he smells like sawdust and a little sweat. I'm surprised to realize. I like it. Cal says, yeah, so my dad, Mick, cheated on mine and Liam's mom with Zach's mom. Zach is just about a year younger than me. His mom skipped town. It's a whole shitstorm. So then my dad's brother, Uncle Kellen, moved in with us with my cousin because his wife died of cancer. I scoop up the last of the screws and hold them for Cal as he talks, loving the feel of his rough fingertips against my palm when he takes the tiny fasteners. That's so sad, I say in response to his story. Yeah, I remember my Aunt Helen. She was pretty great. But I will say... It was awesome having Orla and Uncle Kel in the house with us. She's more like a sister than a cousin, and it's sort of like we all grew up with two dads. That's two more than I had, I blurt before I can think twice about it. I slap my palm over my mouth, so shocked that I would share such a thing with someone I just met. I make it a point not to talk about my past, not to be the white trash swan who rose from the slums to get herself educated. 
Single mom, huh? Cal doesn't seem like he harbors any judgment or fascination with what I've heard. He just takes it in as information, like it's perfectly normal to have either two fathers or none. I nod in response to his question. He never even stuck around to meet me. I tell him with a sigh. Cal stands up from the finished platform of his bed and turns to face me. He plunks a heavy hand on one of my shoulders and looks me in the eye, and I feel like I might combust, between the heat of his skin and the burning honesty of his gaze. Well, he sure did miss out, Logan. Before I can respond, he turns to hoist his mattress up from the ground. He seems to have duct taped it into a long tube, I guess so it would fit in his moving truck better. He fishes in the back pocket of his jeans and extracts a pocket knife this time, and I stare in wonder as he slices open the tape around the mattress and tosses it on his bed. I've never seen a man move like this, so sure of his body in space, so at ease in his movements. Cal straightens the mattress on his bed and then lifts his shirt to wipe at the sweat on his forehead. My eyes bulge when he pulls the shirt off and tosses it in a corner before he flops down on the bed, limbs spread wide like a starfish. Phew. There's that done, he says. Then he pats the mattress next to him. Why don't you come sit and tell me about how hard you always work to help your mom out? I stare at him, frozen in place. How do you do that? I ask him, studying his face, trying not to stare at his naked chest. Do what? I gesture around the room. Just say something of huge significance with no warm-up? Like it's not a test? There's no test, Logan, he says, patting the bed again. But I am going to want to know how the hell you ended up with the dude's name. Chapter 6 Cal Hmm, Logan says for the tenth time this morning. It's my third day in the condo, and we haven't talked much since I moved in. She works long hours, and I've been crazy busy with paperwork since both my brothers went out and brought in a bunch of new business to Beltane. I try and linger at work to see if my dad will summon me, but he doesn't. Which probably means he's saving up for some sort of family-only confrontation. I look across the room to where Logan stands with her arms crossed, chewing the tip of one finger and frowning at me. Hmm she says again. I glance at the counter, where I can see that I've spilled some milk when I was pouring my cereal. And then I notice that I didn't rinse out the bowl when I went to take my shower, so yes, I can see that it has formed a bit of a crust in there. I'll clean up the kitchen before I take off, I tell her with a wink. Scout's honor. You were a boy scout? Logan seems surprised as she leans to buckle her shoe. She wears these adorable little heels with a strap with no socks. And I love how she carries them pinched between her fingers until she's just inside the doorway. Well, I stopped after Cub Scouts, I tell her. But I wore the hell out of that uniform in elementary school. Logan looks down the hall, squints and says, Hmm, again, then leaves. I sigh. I haven't unpacked all my bags yet. I know she's got to be bugging about the heaps all around. Shit, I'm going to have to do something about that, which means missing my run today. As soon as Logan takes off, I drag a sponge across the counter and fill my breakfast bowl with water to soak. Heading down the hall, I quickly gather up all the bags and, not bothering to fold or sort, I just shake their contents into the drawers of my bed. I glance into the bathroom and then rush in there to pick up the towel I left bunched on the sink. Crap, I mutter, looking down at the towel. It's Logan's. I don't own any towels, and I've been borrowing hers since I moved in. I really need to get my shit together. I give the apartment another quick look and decide it's much improved. So I stuff a granola bar in my bag and head out to Big Red. By the time I get to work, I have an email from Logan. I want to laugh when I see the subject line, house meeting. But when I open the message, I grimace. She's typed up an agenda that includes items like communal belongings, and shared household responsibilities. I'm still wincing at the email when Liam and my uncle come up behind me in the lobby. How's the new dwelling, kiddo? 
Uncle Kellen is like 50% cool and 60% as uptight as Liam and, apparently, Logan. I roll my eyes and hold up my phone for them to see. I feel like I have to be in my best behavior all the time, I tell them. Kellen nods approvingly at the screen. This meeting seems like a great way to establish boundaries, he says. Liam snorts. Welcome to adulthood, Callum. You'd better accept the meeting invite. He and Kellen snicker as we all take the stairs up to our respective offices. Normally I'd duck into the kitchen with them to shoot the breeze, but I'm irritated. Logan is well within her rights to be pissed at my mess and that I took her towels without asking. But why can't she just say so? All this chin-tapping and silent planning is going to drive both of us up the wall. I've already got my dad giving me the silent treatment, leaving me to marinate in my shame. I do not need this shit at home, too. I click decline to her meeting invite and stuff my phone in a drawer where I ignore it for hours. After work, I head home and, honestly, I've forgotten about this morning and the whole meeting thing until I unlock the door and see my roommate sitting at the counter with her head in her hands. When she looks up at me, she's not angry like I expected. She looks sad. Hey, I say, feeling like an asshole and powerless to do anything about it. You declined my meeting request, she says, shaking her head. I just... She waves around. We need to talk, Cal. I slide into the stool next to her and sigh. You're not wrong about that, Logan, and I'm sorry. I've been a slob. But seriously, it's better for me if you just say so rather than ponder it for a week and invite me to a meeting about it in my own home. Your home? Here comes some of the anger I was expecting. And honestly, I feel like I know how to handle that better. Yeah, my home, I tell her. I signed a lease. I sent you a check. I live here. If you're pissed about me leaving my crap around, I want you to say so. And eventually, if you do something that pisses me off, I promise to tell you too. Logan's mouth works up and down like I was just speaking to her in a foreign language. Hmm, she says again, and moves to tap her chin. Oh no, I say, grabbing her hand. I tug her to her feet and nod my head toward the door. Come on. We're going across the street for a beer and talk this out like men. That gets a laugh out of her. I don't need to tell her nobody would ever confuse her for a man, except me. I also don't release her hand as we make our way across Penn Avenue to the new restaurants that made me want to say yes to this condo in the first place. There's a whole food court, basically, of high-end choices all under one roof. I finally let go of Logan to gesture around. What's your favorite? I love it all, so you pick and I'll buy. She shakes her head. No, I tell her, placing my hand on my heart. This is me atoning. I'm getting dinner. Now, tempura or tostadas? She shakes her head again and bites her lip. I have never had either of those before. Now it's my turn for my jaw to go slack. Never? Like, not once? Where'd you move here from? I know Logan said she grew up without much money to spare. It makes sense that she wouldn't have eaten out all that much. But I swear she said she went to college and grad school in Philly. Don't they have Japanese food in Philly? Growing up, I thought Olive Garden was the fanciest restaurant around. We mostly ate leftovers the diners sent home after my mom's shifts. She shrugs, and I wave a hand. Never mind, I tell her. I'm buying you some of everything. She starts to mutter about it being too much but I assure her I eat like a horse and would have ordered extra stuff anyhow. I grab a few things from the Japanese and the new Mexican food stands and order us a few different beers. Settling into the wooden table, plunking our multiple order numbers on the end so the servers can find us, I rest my cheek on my fist and meet her eye. So, Rumi, I need you to tell me exactly what has pissed you off about the apartment. Logan squints and sips at her beer. Oh she says. Wow, this is really good. I nod. Yes, I have excellent taste in beer, I tell her. But you have to say it. You have to say, Cal Brady, you gotta pick up your shit. She smiles and takes another sip of beer. Come on, I urge. Out with it. She sets her glass down a little harder than I think she intended, and some of the beer sloshes out. She hurries to dab at it with a napkin. 
Okay, so, Cal, it would be great if you could rinse your dishes before you put them in the dishwasher. I pat her hand. Yes, see? That's a totally reasonable ask. I will definitely work harder to do that, Logan. And I'm going to order new towels, too, I promise. Her eyes widen. Oh, yeah, I say. I've been using yours, like, every day. I wink at her. How many weeks do you think it will take for me to get you to ask me outright, Cal, can you stop wiping your ass with my good towels? Logan throws her head back and laughs long and hard, tears forming at the corners of her eyes. As she tries to catch her breath, the server arrives with some of our food. I gesture for Logan to pick first, and she reaches timidly for the batter-dipped shrimp, as if that could taste anything other than amazing. Logan dips the shrimp in the teriyaki sauce and pops it in her mouth. I watch as her pink tongue sweeps out along her lower lip, and then her eyes flare. Oh my God, she says with her mouth full, and then reaches for another shrimp. This is amazing. I grin, grabbing a shrimp and holding it up toward her to toast. This is the start of a beautiful cohabitation, I tell her. I'm going to show you the world, Lolo. Chapter 7 Logan I feel unsettled. This morning, as I studied Cal shoving laundry in the washer with his foot, I knew he wanted me to just tell him what was upsetting me. But the truth is, I don't quite know. He lives here now. It makes sense that he would be fully in the space. It's just that Cal is so loud. Not physically noisy, but his presence is loud. He's everywhere, humming in the shower, laughing out loud at television shows in the evening. He wears bright-colored T-shirts and sneakers he calls his chucks. It's been a few weeks already, and I cannot get used to the way he just makes himself known in the condo. I lean against the wall of the hallway, watching as he looks at his phone while he eats his breakfast. He laughs and slaps the counter. I realize I've never done this, most likely because I always knew that my mother had to sleep. The more I study Cal just freely being, the more I realize how long I've been holding my breath. My mother always worked more than one job, and I spent my entire life avoiding making noise in case she was trying to lie down. Teachers never called my house because my behavior and academic performance were impeccable. I didn't act wild or play rough, and if something was funny on the TV turned down low, I bit my lip and just smiled rather than laugh out loud. Hmm, I say, the power of the realization stirring up a wave of emotion. There's nobody here needing their rest, and yet I still don't put on my shoes until I'm near the door, in case the sounds of my heels on the floor might disturb somebody. Don't start with the hmm again, Lolo. Cal points his spoon at me. Just spit it out. What did I do this time? He looks down at the counter. I didn't even make a milk puddle. Yet. I shake my head at him. It's not that. I just remembered something. I bend over to fasten my shoe. I don't have time to talk all this through with Cal while he's moaning in appreciation as he shovels cookie crisp into his mouth. I have a work meeting about the Rudy accounts and the upcoming gala event. I'm running a bit late, but I'm not mad. I won't schedule a meeting with you. With a clatter, Cal tosses the bowl into the sink and turns on the faucet to rinse everything. I swear, he rattles the dishwasher tray as loudly as he can while he sets his dishes in there for when we run it later. I can order some dishes and stuff, too, he says. Yours are really nice. Honestly, I don't even know what to type in. Is there, like, apartment starter kit for immature men or something? I smile at the row of plates in the top rack of the dishwasher. I found those used online, I tell him. Someone was leaving for the Peace Corps and unloaded her whole apartment. Aw, oh, dang low. He gestures at the pots and spatulas and things I have hanging on hooks. You literally got a startup pack, Cal shakes his head. Hey, you want a ride? I normally take the bus to and from work, 
one of the perks of this condo, is the proximity to the dedicated busway, so the commute downtown takes under 10 minutes. That's a kind offer, Cal, I tell him, but I think the P3 can get me to my building sooner than Big Red at this time of day. Fair enough, he tells me, stooping to grab his messenger bag by the door. I can at least accompany you to the elevator. I ride to the ground floor, trying not to think about how nice he smells this morning, or how interesting it is to me that he can go to work in ripped jeans and a flannel shirt. I know he has a real job, as my mother would call it, and he's mentioned more than a few times that he has more money than sense. The truth is, Cal is a marvel to me. Easygoing, comfortable in his skin, financially secure enough his entire life that he never worries about anything. It's sort of like, I'm watching a documentary about how other people live. But instead of being on television, he's right here with me in the elevator, smiling and smelling like aftershave. I'm still thinking about him when Marie calls our team meeting to order. Devin sits beside me, taking notes. I've already decided not to bother trying for the Rudy account, and things have been much smoother for me since I holed myself up in my office and ran financial scenarios for the lowly clients with only a few million dollars to invest. I've put together some pretty exciting investment forecasts this month and feel proud of that. I smile, remembering how one client wanted to focus on companies promoting sustainability, but still turning a big profit for investors, and how excited they were when I put together a portfolio that met both of their bottom lines. Logan, a voice hisses by my ear. Huh? Devin kicks my shoe, and I whip my head up toward Marie, who is smiling cruelly. We were discussing the optics of our analysts bringing a plus one to the gala, she says. Since you're the only female analyst, we weren't sure how it might look to the wives of our male clients if you were to arrive without a date. Someone at the table makes a comment under their breath I can't quite make out, and my cheeks heat as I realize they're making fun of me, or implying that I would hit on the clients. Or maybe both. Excuse me? One of the guys. Why can't I remember anyone's name? He sits forward and says pointedly, I said what's it matter? You're too uptight to steal anyone's husband. Fuming, I ball my hands into fists. I'm about to snap back at him that half my clients are actually women. When Marie says, I don't suppose you could manage to pay someone to escort you? It's really better if we promote the idea that we're a family-friendly organization. Besides, everyone else will be paired off. It would really mess up the seating arrangement if you showed up alone. Well, I almost shout. My eyes flare. My heart rushes. Considering I live with my boyfriend, I'll make sure to include him on my RSVP. The room goes silent, and they all stare at me. That's probably the loudest I've spoken in a really long time. It felt good, actually. My mind races as I try to figure out what I need to do about everything that just happened here. This feels like an issue for human resources, but I can't help but recall Marie's comment that I'm the only female analyst. I'm not going to do myself any favors by reporting the unsavory remarks here today. It would be entirely obvious it was me, and I'm pretty sure I'm still within my probationary period where the company can let me go without severance. It takes a few minutes for me to remember that I also just told a blatant lie about Cal being my boyfriend, and that I've now roped him into coming to this stuffy event with me as my date. Oh, God, he's going to have to pretend to be my intimate lover. I bury my face in my hands, unaware if the meeting has carried on without me. Eventually, Devin kicks my shoe again. Hey, he says. What was that all about? I look over at him. Maybe you can explain it to me, because I certainly have no idea. Marie is always mean to me. Then I slap my hand over my mouth, because I don't want to be someone who speaks ill of my superiors at work. No good can come of that. Do you really live with your boyfriend? Devin seems stunned by this information. You never talk about him. 
I clear my throat and explain that I never talk about anything personal at work at all. I guess that's true, he says. Then he pauses. Some of us grab 501s after work on Fridays. You should come. 501s? My mind races, worried there's a company policy he's referencing or something. Devin laughs. Yeah, you know, work ends at 5, so at 501. Devin's eyes widen as he realizes I still don't quite know what he's talking about. I sigh. He sighs. Immediately after work, we grab a beer on the North Shore. He pats the table twice. You should come, he repeats. I stare at him until he starts shaking his head and walks out of the conference room, whistling. Chapter 8 Logan When I get back to my office, I fumble around for my phone and send a message to Cal. I need to tell you something. Will you be home after work? Almost immediately, I see the three dots appear, so I know he's using his phone during work hours. I have to remind myself that some people don't stash their phone away while they're on company time. My phone pings with his response. What's up? I am downtown anyway for an inspection. Buy me lunch? That works. I try not to think about the perfectly good lunch I already have packed in the company fridge. It'll keep for dinner, I decide. Despite the conversations Cal and I have had about honest communication being the ticket to living together, I decide the better move ahead is to ask him to carry on this ruse with me than to go to my bitchy supervisor and explain that I don't actually live with my boyfriend and don't have a plus one to the gala. Then I look over my shoulder, in case she's standing nearby and can hear me use the word bitch in my thoughts. I dive into some reports I've been working on until someone raps on the door to my office. I look up, surprised to see Cal standing there, wearing his usual attire, in my stuffy professional office. Oh my God, I would have come down to meet you, I hiss at him, scrambling to my feet and closing the door behind him. What's the fun in that? He grins. He does have a dazzling smile. I shake my head as he crosses his arms and leans against the wall. So, what's up? I bite my lip and wince. Is this about the dishes and towels? I swear I'm going to ask my mom to help me figure all that out. I shake my head. No, Cal, it's not that. I sink into my desk and hide my face in my hands while I give him the brief rundown. He leans forward, his palms flat on the desk. Let me see if I've got this right. You want me to pretend we're banging and shacking up, and I'm going to be your date for a fancy party with professional athletes and millionaires? He sounds like he's trying to be stern, but he's still smiling, so I'm not sure what to say in response. I just nod. You'd owe me, Lolo, he says, his grin growing. Yes, I tell him. Anything. He nods. I'm going to hold you to that. Come on and feed me already. I was serious about you buying me lunch. He gestures toward the door, and I grab my purse, walking through the door he holds open. Then I gasp when I feel his hand around my waist. My eyes widen as I look up at him. What? He squeezes my hip with his long fingers, and my body feels like it's lit on fire. He starts ushering me down the hall, and I see people staring at us through open office doors through the blinds in the conference room. When I visit my girlfriend at work, I'm not going to not squeeze her ass, Cal says. And then he winks at me. I swallow, trying to regain my composure as we walk past reception. Janine at the desk beams at Cal, who shoots finger guns at her and says, thanks again for getting me to my girl here. She waves as the elevator dings and the doors glide open. Cal grabs my hand and tugs me inside. When the door slides shut, he says, I'm already good at this. I nod vigorously, because he really is very good at seeming like he knows me intimately. The problem is that my body is responding as if it really does want him to keep exploring. I sigh deeply and lean against the wall as the elevator makes its way down to street level. Cal leans on the wall next to me, studying me. You're messy, 
aren't you, Lolo? He says. I arch an eyebrow at him. I don't mean like towels on the floor spilling cereal milk like me, Messy. I mean like you've got yourself into an interpersonal mess and you have no idea how to clean it up. Well, I tell him, tugging on my skirt to try and straighten it as we walk through the lobby. That feels accurate, if blunt. We eat burrito bowls, his with multiple types of salsa, and the fajita toppings, and guacamole, mine feeling very bland in comparison. It would never occur to me to ask for multiple salsas, if they didn't offer that. Cal, of course, moans appreciatively with each bite. I like the bowl because there isn't a good fillings-to-tortilla ratio here, and the tortilla is too chewy, he tells me. Why do you get the bowl instead of wrapping it up? I look down at my dish. I don't actually know, I tell him truthfully. It's how I've always ordered here. The lid makes it easy to wrap up and eat the rest later. The rest? You're not going to finish it? Cal has devoured nearly the entire thing in the few minutes since we sat down. I shake my head. Horrified at the idea of all that food sitting in my gut while I'm trying to concentrate at work. He pats his stomach and belches. Shoot, I could eat yours right now, too. I'm always hungry, though. My mom calls me a garbage disposal. He wads up his napkins and starts to tidy up his trash. Oh, hey, I forgot, he says. I won't be home after work. I eat dinner with my mom on Wednesdays. Generally, we all invade Uncle Kellen's house another night of the week, too, but that tends to fluctuate based on who's having a crisis. I listen as he describes his family, marveling again that such a group of people could be real. I always assumed those sorts of families only existed on television or in books. Those fictional families were my only company growing up. I have no idea how I'd act around cousins and uncles and siblings. I can't believe that's really your family, I blurt, and then blush, not meaning to interrupt him. What? You don't have family drama? Cal grins and tries to reach for my leftovers. I swat his hand away. It was always just me and my mom, I tell him. I sigh. I was so excited when I thought Callie was moving in because I wanted to do spa nights with her and vent and have her give me advice. He nods. I can see how I would be a big disappointment with those expectations. He grins, and I shake my head again. Then I startle when he reaches across the table and takes my hand. But Logan, you can vent to me, and my advice is shitty, but I'll give it to you if you ever want to hear it. I swallow noting the sincerity in his eyes. Thank you, Cal, for the offer, and for agreeing to pretend to be my date. For all of it, he grins again. Just don't ask me to do that spa night stuff. I'm not painting my nails. What about the mud masks, though? Maybe while you're watching Avengers? It feels so natural to banter with him like this. Is this flirting? I just like making him smile. And it does feel good to be honest and open with Cal. Hey, he says, sitting up straighter and letting go of my hand. I instantly feel the loss of heat from his warm palm. Speaking of being open, did I tell you my brother Liam knocked up the girl he's been seeing? Cal shakes his head, laughing. Everyone thought it would be me sailing that boat, but Liam? He's the uptight one with a stick up his ass. He has bought me so much leeway. I can break my femur paragliding, and they'd all say, well, at least he didn't get anyone pregnant like Liam did. Is it really such a bad thing? From the sound of things, Liam has a stable career and can provide a good home for a baby. I can't imagine this sort of thing is super devastating to people with money. Oh, no way. It's totally fine, Cal says, waving a hand in the air. It's just... Wait till you meet Liam. He alphabetizes our cereal boxes. So the idea of him being careless is just funny. We're just giving him shit. I decide I'm well past comfortably full and start to wrap up my lunch to take with me. I can't believe you're really not going to eat the entire thing, Cal says, tossing his napkin into the compost. He turns to face me as we squeeze through the door to the busy sidewalk. 
Want me to walk you up? I can kiss you in front of that receptionist, give you the full onion breath experience. Cal waggles his eyebrows, and I shove him in the chest. Ugh, you're so gross. I roll my eyes, but I can't help smiling at him. He's kind of delightful. Thank you for the offer. I'll see you later. Chapter 9 Cal Liam made me swear not to tell our mom the time bomb news that he knocked up Maddie. The only reason I even consider keeping my mouth shut about it is because he explained that there's a lot of health concerns with Maddie's diabetes. I don't have a degree in medicine, but I guess you don't have to in order to understand that sounds risky. I was super interested, professionally speaking, in Maddie's insulin pump. The last time I saw her, she was showing me the mechanism for how it delivers insulin through a tiny needle that just sort of hooks into her skin. I feel a fleeting disappointment that I'm not working on research and development for a device like that. It's a familiar feeling these days. I spiffed up Logan's hair dryer for her so it's like a turbo blaster. That's about the most mechanical engineering work I've gotten to do this month. I like working with my family at Beltane, but industrial inspections just are not very fulfilling for me. Sometimes I have conversations with guys on job sites, and they're like changing the world. Me? I'm checking out efficiency in furnaces on factory floors. Sure, sure, I'm making sure employees don't asphyxiate. It'd be nicer to make sure diabetic people can have healthy pregnancies. I arrive at Mom's before Liam. I'm worried that if I go in there, I'll either blurt out about Maddie or else Dad will have told her about the boat and she'll freak out. So I pause outside to make sure all the railings on her porch stairs are secure. That's important, right? I examine the paint on the metal rail until Liam pulls up. Thank God you got here, man, I shout at him. I'm not about to go in there alone with a secret. I'm cut off by the front door springing open and my mom exploding out onto the steps. What took you both so long? Was this about a secret? She stands with her hands on her hips and brows furrowed while Liam looks like he wants to strangle me. I sigh dramatically. You caught me, Mom. I was just about to spill the beans to Liam. We walk inside, and she thrusts a bottle of wine into my hands. It's a twist-off, so I open it for her and make a show of pouring her a full glass. Turns out, my new roommate? Ah, she says starting to drink the wine. Yes, Logan. Finance guy? I nod. Almost. Logan is actually a girl, but it's cool. She and I get along great, and it's fine. Mom squints at me, and Liam looks like he might laugh for the first time since he found out Maddie was pregnant. You're living with a woman? That you just met? I wave a hand at her and take a swig from the wine bottle as she squeals at me, a disgusted noise that makes me laugh. It's not like that. I'm telling you, it's totally platonic. She's even making me buy my own towels because I was using hers. Callum Brady, that's disgusting, Liam says, reaching for the wine bottle. I hand it to him and he pours his into a glass, taking a long swig. Yeah, well, I've also been using her dishes. I wanted to ask you about that, Mom. Where should I get dishes and shit? Shit? Really? You're going to curse at your mother after you just told us you're living with a woman we haven't met? Would you want to meet my roommate if he were a he? Yes! Mom sounds really exasperated, and I feel saved by the bing from the oven timer. There's dinner. Boys, set the table. Liam makes a face and hands me a stack of plates, which I turn upside down to look at. These are nice, Mom. Seriously, where should I get stuff? One slips off the bottom of the stack as I flip them over, and it hits the floor, but doesn't break. Whoa, Mom nods. Fiesta wear, she says. That's where all your things are from. But it sounds like you left everything at your brother's loft? I assumed all that stuff was his, I say with a shrug, rinsing off the plate. It is all mine. Liam folds a napkin neatly at each of our place settings. Of course he's folding the napkins, and I don't even know where to buy napkins. I wonder if our parents were all so messed up with the divorce that they forgot to teach me that etiquette stuff. I went to the factory outlet and bought a whole set. Oh! Mom exclaims as she carries a casserole pan to the table. That's a great idea. The factory outlet could be so fun. They have a tent sale coming up. 
You know, I don't have any daughters. Maybe Liam's friend Maddie would want to go. Oh, and your brother Zach's girlfriend. What's her name? Isn't she friends with Maddie? Liam turns ashen at the mention of his lady friend. Nicole, I add hopefully. Nicole and Maddie are best friends. It's true. I bet they'd love to go shopping with you, Mom. But Logan has her own dishes already. It's me who needs them, remember? Mom waves a hand. I'll buy them for you. And she can get some different bakeware. They have butter dishes and sugar bowls, all that stuff. I make eyes at Liam, wondering when Mom turned into a walking catalog for kitchen shit. But he looks like he swallowed a worm. And I remember that we're hiding the big secret that he got Maddie pregnant. So, back to Logan. I start, wondering if I should fill them in that I'm going to play the part of her date for that work thing. But as Mom looks at me so hopefully and Liam looks at me so gratefully that I've pulled attention from his issues, I decide I actually don't want to go into all that with them. I take a bite of casserole. This is really good, Mom. Thank you, baby, she says, patting my hand. Logan? I nod, swallowing. Yeah, well, she's not from around here and her family isn't tight, so she'd probably dig that dish sale. Hanging out with you, I mean, and Nicole, maybe? Nicole's kind of mean. Maybe Orla should go. Would that be weird? Liam frowns. I think it sounds unusual. Mom waves a hand. I'm still Orla's Aunt Sheila, even if I divorced your father. Give me everyone's email and I'll set something up. I make a face. I don't have Nicole's email, Mom. I'm telling you. She's mean. Mom points at me with her fork. If you want my help getting dishes for your new love shack, you'll get me some shopping buddies. I open my mouth to protest. She gestures with the fork again. I mean it, Callum Eamon Brady. Now eat your dinner. I nod. Yes, ma'am. Chapter 10 Logan The rest of this week is so strange. I start paying attention to everyone else on the analyst team, and I decide two things must be true. First, they are all really awful people, except maybe Devin, but he doesn't ever say anything to challenge the sexist, mean things they all say, so the second thing I decide is that I need to be wary around him, even if he seems nice. Friday comes in like a freight train with deadlines and presentations to the higher-ups. We're about to start the third quarter, and I worked like a fiend this week, starting to get end-of-quarter reports together for each client in my portfolio. I get everything prepared to present in both bar graphs and pie charts, knowing some of the company leaders need that visual element to understand at a glance what impact we've made for the clients. I wear my fanciest suit, but pack something more casual to wear later in case Devin was serious about happy hour. There were a few times in college where people from class would invite me to a party and give me an address, only for me to show up at a daycare or cemetery. I think I give off a vibe that I'm desperate for friends. But I don't need friends at work. I'm here to do a very specific thing, and I remind myself that I'm good at it. When it's my turn to present, I enter the zone. When I first started grad school, I couldn't even stand in front of the class. I'd get so nervous about how my speech sounded, or that it would be obvious I had no idea what I was talking about. But I took advantage of every mock interview and mock presenter opportunity at Penn and gradually learned to have confidence. Well, during presentations, anyway. Right now... I put all my strategies into play. I focus on the clock at the back of the room, so it seems like I could be making eye contact with any and everyone. It's been a good quarter, I start, offering some summary remarks as I pull up the slides on the huge monitor. I noticed some of the other analysts had trouble earlier, so I'm glad I had remarks memorized that I can deliver while I'm clicking around. I advised most of the clients in my portfolio to increase their investments in biotech this quarter, I state, and I grin when the graph comes up on the screen. As you can see, this turned out well for everyone. After the meeting, I feel excited. I decide to do something to celebrate this afternoon, even if there's no drinks with colleagues. 
I don't even really like them that much anyway, so I'm not going to let it sting me if this was a bait-and-tease situation. I'm about to text Cal and buy us some mud masks for spa night, when Devin catches up to me in the hall. Hey, he says. Hold up. Hey, I say, nodding and pausing outside my office door. Devin puts his hands in his pockets and shakes his head. How did you get Truman to up his investment in that diabetes treatment company? My eyebrows shoot up. Nobody here ever asks me to collaborate or talk about strategy. Oh, I bite my lip. Want to come in my office and I'll show you some stuff? It had been a real triumph getting Marie to agree to share my advice with the clients. More than once, I wondered if she was resisting because she wanted me to look bad. But even Marie responds to black and white data. I bring Devin around to one of my monitors, where I keep an RSS feed of news articles scrolling all day. I have financial statements and predictions on the other screens. I point to a string of articles from university research publications. I had seen this patent come through for a new medication pump that's twice as efficient as the market standard. Devin's brow furrows. You understand that kind of thing? I thought your degree was in finance. I shake my head. Oh, I have no idea about bioengineering, but I know which are the major scientific journals, and when I see the scientific community excited about something, I study similar trends in the market after patents are awarded and advise my clients accordingly. I take a deep breath after saying all that, and Devin's eyes are wide. You're putting all those things together? How do you have the headspace for all that? Thinking he's teasing, I laugh, but then I realize it's a serious question. Isn't that what all of us do as analysts? Logan, he gestures around my office. You're very likely a damn genius. You know that? I shrug. It's probably just that I know how to use the different databases available. I can tell Devin is astonished, and I don't want to come across as bragging, so I try to change the subject. So, um, is the offer still up to come out for 501s? I flush immediately, knowing I probably sound totally desperate. Which I am desperate, really. All I've ever done is work, and usually the people around me seem to know a bunch of undocumented rules about how the real progress happens in social situations. I need to go get these beers and learn how to be normal. Devin's face shifts to a grin. Sure is, he says. I'll bang on your door on my way down. All the other junior analysts are tall and male, so they keep a brisk pace as we head from our office building across the Fort Duquesne Bridge to the bar. The guys cross North Shore Drive at a rapid pace, and the light turns yellow as I'm huffing to the corner, struggling to keep up even in my flats. You can make it, Devin yells stepping back out into the street when he sees me on the opposite corner. The other guys pause and look back, like they're startled to realize I've joined them. Come on, Logan, Devin beckons, and I feel a rush as I hustle across the street as the light turns red. I just jaywalked during rush hour. I feel an odd thrill at the idea and smile, forgetting how irritated I felt that they all walked so far ahead in the first place. You're coming in? I think his name is James. He seems like he doesn't really believe I'll do it, but I nod and shrug out of my sweater, tossing it over my arm as we enter the crowded bar. James pushes ahead, spotting a tall table that's still available. All the guys drape their suit coats over the tall stools, but don't sit. Someone produces a tray full of shots, and I stare at the liquid, which smells like those awful cinnamon brooms people sell near Halloween. It's a fireball, Devin says with a shrug. They all lift their glasses, so I grab mine. Ian. At least, I think his name is Ian. He clinks his glass against mine and says, To adventure! There's something about the look on his face that tells me he's probably teasing me. Like it's not an achievement at all to run a red light or go out for drinks with practical strangers. I'm way outside my comfort zone, but I tap my glass against his and meet his eye as I repeat his words. 
When I pour the alcohol in my mouth, I vow not to cough, but my eyes practically bulge out of my head as the burning liquid sears my esophagus. Whatever a fireball is, I never want one again. Ian shakes his head and blows a raspberry, slapping the table and flagging down the server. I listen as the guys all order pitchers of beer. I certainly hope whatever they're drinking next doesn't taste this awful. My phone buzzes in the pocket of my sweater, and I pull it out to stop it vibrating on the metal chair. It's a message from Cal. Hey, Lolo, want to race home? You on your busway? Me in Big Red? I smile and let him know I can't today, because I've gone out for drinks with colleagues. And then I cringe because colleagues is so lame when I should have said, the guy's from work, or something. Look at you go. How you getting home later? I send him a shrug emoji and slip my phone in my pocket. Looking up just as Devin starts telling the guys about my diabetes tech research. Logan basically knows everything about everything, he says, and I try not to concentrate on Ian's frown. I shrug. You can set up alerts so you get emails if anything newsworthy is happening in any of the industries where your clients are investing, I say. It just means I spend time reading my emails while all the forecasts are populating. I bite my lip and take a sip of the beer, wishing I knew some other way to talk to them, wishing that being good at my job didn't make me such a loser socially. Ian takes a long pull on his plastic cup and says, You've been here like a minute, and you're already the top candidate for the biggest white whale client we've had. My eyebrows shoot up at this comment. Me? Oh, no, I don't want to be considered for the Rudy account. I shake my head, taking another sip of beer, trying to look cool. You really have no idea, do you? Devin looks at me the way I look at my newsfeed in the morning, like discovery awaits. No idea about what? But before he can respond, I jump, feeling an arm snake around my waist. I turn my head up to see Cal standing at my side, and I can't help the smile that takes over my entire body. I instinctively melt into him, feeling twenty times more at ease suddenly. What are you doing here? Cal winks at me and takes my beer from my hand, downing the rest of it, as I stare at him. You have location sharing turned on in your phone he says, wiping his mouth with his hand and then dropping a kiss on the top of my head. I flash a glare at him until I remember that he's supposed to be my boyfriend because I asked him to pretend, which is why he has his arm around me now, his fingers tracing small circles along my hip. Oh, is all I can muster as Devin shoots out a hand to introduce himself. Cal Brady, he says, nodding at each of the guys. I hope you're taking good care of my girl here. Chapter 11 Cal The second I walk into this bar, I can tell Logan is uncomfortable. Her posture is all stiff, sitting in the stool, and I can see her fiddling with her cup of beer. She probably doesn't even like commercial beer. Well, if you can even call the piss these assholes are drinking beer, looks like pale yellow water. I stalk my way over to her, brushing past servers I usually chase down after a hard week of crunching data for my dad. I don't even have to try to pretend when I get across the room to Logan. I feel like some sort of caveman as I watch those guys looking at her, like they can't decide if they want to destroy her or fuck her. Pricks. I can tell I interrupted one of them about to say something shitty, but we go around and do the small talk thing. So, Cal Brady. One of these assholes says my name like he's so much better than me. What is it that you do? I shrug. A little of this and a little of that, I tell him. I mostly do Logan here when she lets me. I don't even feel sorry for saying it, because the color red that she turns is pretty spectacular. Plus, she sinks into my side a little deeper, and I can feel the shape of her boobs pressed against me. I need to pull myself together and remember this is just an act since she asked me for a favor. Cal is a mechanical engineer at Beltane, Logan says. He's got a particular interest in engines. Engineering, huh? You probably know my clients over at Beagle. One of the assholes has my attention now, 
and I whipped my head toward him. Beagle? Like the autonomous vehicle guys? He nods and Logan whispers, James, into my ear. I try not to pay attention to what it does to my body when I feel her breath on my skin. James, is it? You work with Peter Harris and the guys at Beagle? James nods. Yeah, man, he's really cool. I work with his personal account, though, not the business or anything. Another douche pipes in, saying, Well, if Logan really just wants the small clients, maybe you can trade her for the Rudy account. That gets a round of laughter from the table, and I have no idea what any of them are getting at. Two things are abundantly clear here. These guys do not like Logan, and I have to get an introduction to Peter Harris. Beagle is named for Darwin's ship, the one that safely and swiftly carried its genius cargo around the world and artfully sailed through the London Bridge. They make autonomous vehicles that focus on safety, and they're known for their algorithms. Peter Harris has never had a traffic mishap on his test routes. I salivate at the idea of work like that. I try to change the subject. Beltane doesn't really work with anything new tech like autonomous vehicles, but my brother did bring in some machine learning stuff. I shrug. I mostly work with industrial sites. They don't even pretend like they care, and soon, Logan and I are just spectators in their big circle jerk. I start to play with her hair, twirling it around my fingers because it feels nice. She smells nice, too, like she's been walking outdoors. She sips politely at her drink for a bit before I say, Well, babe, you about ready to head home? Logan looks utterly relieved as she nods, hopping down from her stool immediately. Thank you for inviting me, Devin. She smiles at the least jerky dude, who rolls his eyes and grins. This was nice. Logan is a terrible liar, but some of the guys wave and I guide her out of the bar, keeping my hand on her hip even after we get outside. Then she doesn't push me away, so I keep it there. Your co-workers are a bunch of dickwads, I tell her as we approach Big Red, parked along the street. I'm lucky I don't have a ticket, since it looks like this lane was supposed to become a driving lane for rush hour. I wrench the door open and help her up inside. I'm really glad you said that, because I wasn't sure if it was just me, she says, puffing out a big breath. No, Lo, they are just shitty people. How can you stand them? We spend a few blocks talking about how she always feels a weird tension in the air at work, and how much she hates not understanding where it came from. I guess I just sort of thought finance was a stressful industry. She's quiet for a while, and I pat her leg. She turns to look at me. Want to know what I was going to do tonight before I went to the bar? Hit me. She grins. I was going to buy us some face masks and see if you wanted to do a spa night. I kicked ass in a presentation today, and I just wanted some pampering. I don't even know what is in those face masks girls use but I honestly don't see how anyone could say no to Logan if they saw the look on her face right now. We can stop, I tell her, putting on my blinker and parallel parking near a drugstore. Do they sell these things at Rite Aid? She shakes her head. No, it was silly. You said you didn't want to do spa stuff. Ah, come on, Logan. I was only teasing. I'm not too macho to be pampered. I reach across and unbuckle her seatbelt. I'm sure they sell all these things in manly sense too, right? Logan shrugs and grins. I'll be right back. No nail polish. I shake my finger at her, and she shakes her head, smiling, as she runs inside. She comes back ten minutes later with a bag, and we head home. Logan tells me to change into sweats and get barefoot. So I do, and we settle on the couch. Okay, she says, and then she claps her hands. I can't believe I'm really doing a spa night with my roommate. It's my first time, too. I deadpan, and she elbows me, but I like that she shifts closer to me on the couch. I got us peel-off face masks and exfoliating foot masks. Foot masks? She nods. They're baggies with, I don't know, chemicals inside. Take off your socks. I watch as Logan peels open the packages, and I cough at the strong smell when she hands me the white, crinkly baggies. We're supposed to put these on and leave them for an hour. Logan wiggles her foot inside the bag and giggles. It's cold and slimy. My big foot barely fits inside, and we both laugh and struggle to wrap the tab around my ankle. Maybe I'll only partially exfoliate, I joke. 
We prop our heels up on the rustic crate Logan uses for a coffee table and drape goopy sheets on each other's faces. I swallow as I feel the pads of Logan's fingers pressing into my cheeks, her thumbs dancing above my eyebrows. I try not to linger when I apply hers for her. She's your roommate, I remind myself. Off limits. Eventually, we get to the hurry up and wait part of spa night, and Logan tells me it's time for us to dish. What should we talk about? She's so cute and enthusiastic. I don't get why people have evidently been so mean to her all the time. I think she's great. I need to introduce her to my family, Stat, so she at least can get to know some Pittsburghers who aren't total assholes. I shift on the couch and tilt my head so it leans against hers. I figured out what I want as my favor. She looks at me, hopefully. Please don't say something terrible right now. Nah, I just want you to introduce me to Peter Harris. The Beagle Guy? The Beagle Guy. Logan's phone timer goes off, and we both peel the masks off our faces. This feels really weird, by the way. I offer to throw out our garbage since I don't want our house covered in frou-frou goop. Funny how I already think of Logan's condo as our home. I almost wipe out when I stand up with the baggie on my foot, but I get it together and slide back from the trash. I'm going to tell you a secret, Lolo. Please do? she says, leaning an elbow against the armrest. I hate working for my dad. Oh, she says. I could sort of tell that you don't love your job right now. Shit, is it obvious? Hmm. One of my brothers would have said something if they could tell. I think you're just really observant. Anyway, I'd love to work in an industry like autonomous vehicles. How fucking cool would that be? Logan nods and looks like she's thinking. Wouldn't that be more for computer engineers, though? I shake my head. Oh my god, no way. First of all, mechanical engineers would be the guys who... You should say people. She interrupts. Surely it's not all men, right? I snort out a laugh. Right, people. The people who have to modify the car engine so it talks to the computer program controlling it. I mean, think about it. I mimic turning a steering wheel. Someone who understands engines and moving parts has to be the one to plug this bad boy into a computer system that would operate it right? Logan shrugs, but I'm on a roll, just imagining what it would be like to have my hands on car parts all damn day and get paid for it. I mean, just think what I could do with the cooling systems, adaptations to the chassis. Logan pats my hand, and I look down, surprised to feel my whole arm tingle at the contact. I don't know anything about any of that stuff, she says. Without thinking, I pick up her hand and kiss her knuckles, and her eyes go wide. I like you anyway, I tell her. And damn it, it's true. But then I realize it's also just another example of how I act before I think. Impulsive. So, what do you say? Seem fair to introduce me to your buddy James's client? Logan smiles. If anything, I'm getting off easy. Are you sure that's all you want in return for... Her voice drifts off as the footbag timer goes off. I stand up again and offer her a hand, noticing that the top of her head only comes up to my shoulder. My brothers and I are all tall and lanky, like my dad and uncle. Even Orla is 5'10", which I know is tall for a chick. Not sure why I'm noticing Logan's body. Maybe it's because we're focused on face and feet and exfoliating. Whatever that means. We waddle down the hall together to the bathroom, and she bends to peel off her footbags. I lean past her, getting a whiff of her as I grab some towels from the shelf. In return for what? It's still new to be in close proximity to her like this. I like how I can see her face moving around. I think I can see her pulse moving in her throat. She shrugs. You know, for acting like you're my boyfriend. I step into Logan's space, and I watch as her chest rises and falls with her breath. This is really no hardship, Lolo, I tell her. Then a thought occurs to me. Have you had boyfriends before? She shakes her head and frowns. But you've had sex and stuff, right? I scratch my head, but don't step back from her space. You're not a virgin. 
Chapter 12 Logan It's hard for me to concentrate with Cal standing so close to me. I feel like all I can smell is him, and all I can hear is my blood moving through my veins. I'm not a virgin, I tell him. Cal leans his shoulder against the tile, still somehow surrounding me with his long legs, and his arms are on either side of me as he holds a washcloth. You don't strike me as the fuck em and leave em type, Lo. No boyfriend? Not the captain of the debate team or something like that? I snort out a laugh. Um, no. I never had time for dating, but sex felt like something I should try. Something you should try? Jesus, Logan, the things that come out of your mouth. I swallow and tuck my hair back behind my ears. I feel disheveled. On display for him here from the inside out, I clear my throat. My mom didn't have time for much, but she made absolutely certain I understood that getting pregnant would lead to a very, very difficult future for me. I hear myself telling Cal about our lack of safety net, how we didn't have extended family who helped with babysitting, or rent money, or anything like that. She got pregnant with me in high school. I never graduated, so I... I close my eyes and take a deep breath and tell my roommate my weirdest secret. I figured out what date on the calendar would allow me to still graduate high school, even if I got pregnant by accident, obviously accounting for any potential prematurity. Obviously, Cal says. He leans back against the sink with his arms crossed, face wrapped. I wish we weren't having this discussion in the bathroom. Or at all. Right. So I knew no matter what, at least I'd graduate high school and I... I pause and look at Cal, who is fascinated, eyebrows raised, waiting to hear the rest of this story. I chose someone from physics class. He had a car so I knew we could use it to... You know... Did you give him a blowy after study hall, low? Cal grins. I roll my eyes. No. I shove his chest. He deflowered me. Oh my God. You did not say deflower. I nod. So you didn't want to date Mr. Bunsen Burner after that thrilling ride? I make a face. I don't know if thrilling is an adjective I'd choose. The sex had been really disappointing. Not painful, but it certainly didn't feel good. I spent the entire time contemplating the superior, exhilarating thrill of sledding down the stairs in my apartment building with the neighbor kids when our parents were all at work in the summertime. I tried again in college, I tell him. And grad school, I shrug. None of the boys I chose, the ones who seemed organized and put together, None of them made me feel safe. The utter terror at getting pregnant before I met my life goals was always so overwhelming, I just couldn't relax. So I mostly lay there biting my lip and waiting until I could get back to reading my book. It just isn't for me, I don't think. Oh, Logan. Cal's face shifts, and he steps closer to me again. I feel his breath on my face. I fucking hate that it wasn't good for you. I can see his nostrils move as he breathes, and his scent is intoxicating. I certainly never felt this way around anyone from physics class, but I don't think I need to tell this to Cal. What do you mean? I ask him. Thinking again of that moment during my third attempt where I realized it's all just a lot of hype. Fiction. Like the idea that people live happily ever after? Even with my hand, the pleasure I can find is just okay. When I try, I can feel myself approaching a pinnacle sometimes, but there is no toppling over, no explosion or fireworks. I'd rather be forecasting. He steps closer to me again and touches my face. My eyes go wide at the feel of his gentle touch. If it were me, it would be good for you and you wouldn't have to ask what I mean, he says, his breath ragged. I feel overwhelmed and hot, flustered, and I start to panic a little bit. He's too close and too big and too off limits. We live together. I need to go to bed, 
I tell him, ducking out from under his arm and walking toward the door. Thank you for doing spa night with me and picking me up and stuff. I hustle down the hall to my room, closing the door before I can tell whether he's followed me. Of course, he's right behind me because we live together. He's my roommate. My male roommate. I'm starting to realize that I made a huge mistake letting a man into my personal space, because now I can't go anywhere to escape him. Lo, I'm sorry, he says through the door. I shouldn't have gotten in your space like that. I hear a thunk, like maybe he's resting his head on the door. I stand in the middle of my room, trying to catch my breath. I nod, but he can't see me, of course. Are we cool? I try to speak, but no sound comes out. I clear my throat and try again. Yes, Cal, it's fine. I'm just really tired, okay? He doesn't say anything. I'm going to go to bed. I stand in the dark, in my room, listening, until I hear his footsteps pad down the hall. Chapter 13 Cal I feel bad that I made Logan upset, but if I'm honest, I'm glad she shut herself in her bedroom. I don't know what the hell has come over me. When I saw her at the bar like that, looking unbelievably sexy and uncomfortable, something shifted. I wanted to protect her from those assholes. But I also found myself thinking impure thoughts about my roommate once she got talking about her background. I snort, disgusted that I'm feeling proud of my restraint for not pressing my lips to her throat. My family is really right about me. I give no thought to the consequences of anything. Meanwhile, Logan maps out every possible consequence of sex apart from pleasure, apparently. What the hell kind of jerks was she propositioning that couldn't even get her off? She didn't come out and say so, but I'm pretty sure her facial expression said it all. No guy has ever made Logan come. That's a crime against humanity. I'll never admit this if she brings it up to my family. But I kind of liked our little spa session. Not that I'm going to go out and buy that makeup stuff. But it was nice, sitting next to her and just talking. We told each other stuff. Real things. I feel a lot closer to her. Which makes it even worse that I keep thinking about kissing her and sniffing her hair. My family is doing a long run this Saturday. So I sneak out of the condo in the morning. Logan hasn't gotten up yet. And I figure she can use a day without me in her business. But then when I leave, it's weird driving to meet my brothers without Liam beside me in Big Red. He and I lived together for so long, it was always the two of us going out to find Zack and Orla. Now each of us is arriving alone. I don't love it. Today we're meeting in our secret trail in Highland Park. It's not technically a secret. I mean, it's a public trail in a huge city park. But it's one of those hidden ones not many people know about. The four of us Brady kids used to sneak there when we were younger and pretend we were alone in the wilderness. I spot my family near the trailhead waiting for me, and I slap my brothers on the back like I haven't seen them in a year. Impregnate anyone new today, Liam? It's fun to tease him about this, because his face turns an amazing shade of purple almost immediately. He punches me in the shoulder. Defile your female roommate, Callum? I'm about to come back with something witty when I realized that I sort of almost did. Before I can respond, my dad and uncle walk up behind us. What's this, roommate? Uncle Kellen leans on my shoulder to stretch out his quads. He ruffles my hair. I thought your new roommate was a guy named Logan. I shrug. Dad just glares at me. Turns out Logan's a girl in this case. My uncle makes a concerned face and my dad snorts. Who knew all three of my boys would be living in sin? Orla pretends to vomit. Come on, Uncle Mick, don't be a hog. I nod, stretching my own legs. It's really not like that with Logan, guys, I tell them. She's... Well, you just have to meet her. Uncle Kellen pats my arm. Good idea. Bring her to dinner tomorrow. He takes off into the woods at a fast clip. Every week, I forget that he and my dad are in amazing shape even though they're in their fifties. They don't ease into our runs, because they don't need to. They're like gazelles, and I feel my muscles protest as I work to keep up. 
I don't really know if Logan wants to be subjected to a Brady family meal, I say as Orla snorts. Well, neither do I, and I still manage to show up, she says, laughing as her ponytail swishes. She passes me on a tight turn, and I almost slip off the edge of the hill. I sprint to catch up with my dad and try to signal that I want to talk to him, but he keeps his eyes ahead on the path and trails Uncle Kellen. We finish our run, and by the time I get back to Big Red, Dad has left, and Uncle Kellen has already cooled down from his workout. He's not even breathing hard. Bring your friend to dinner, Callum, he says, and points a finger at me. Nobody should eat alone. I get back to the apartment and find Logan sprawled out at the counter with at least three laptops open. Her eyes dart back and forth between the screens, and she's typing furiously on the biggest laptop. Hey, I say tossing my keys on the counter and kicking off my sneakers. She looks up and grimaces. I pause, then I bend and pick up my sneakers, lining them up neatly in the bin by the door. Hi, she says, then bends her head back to her work. Are you trying to take over the world there? I grab a banana and walk behind her, squinting at the graphs and numbers flying by on all of the monitors. She shakes her head. Just trying to get ahead of these reports for my clients, she says. With a few more clicks, she rests her hands on her laps and sighs, turning toward me. The energy between us feels normal right now, and I'm grateful. I slide into the stool next to her. I'm really happy working with these clients personally on their individual financial plans, she says. The other guys all want to be the one to manage this big, new account we've got, and I just... I don't need that pressure. I nod and eat some more of my banana. I talk with my mouth full, which I know is bad manners, but usually I lose my ideas if I don't spit them out immediately. It seems like you've got the skills they probably want for the big cheese, though, Lo. She rolls her eyes. I have my entire career to make big moves, she says. She waves a hand and starts closing the lids to her laptops. I want to establish rapport at work this year. I'm building a foundation getting situated in my new town. You know how it is. I have no idea what she's talking about, but it sounds like she's trying to lay low because these jerks are mean to her. I grunt at that thought and bite back all the rude shit I want to say about those guys. Speaking of getting situated, I say, my uncle invited you to family dinner tomorrow. Logan's eyes flash. She looks like I just asked her to eat uncooked squid or something. Family dinner? I nod. Yeah, me, my brothers, Orla, my dad, everyone. It's super casual. Uncle Kellen's a really good cook. Logan looks over at the stove, which is still a little crusty from my last experiment with boxed pasta mix from the other night. Note to self, ask Uncle Kellen what cleaner will unglue that gunk from the stove. Logan still looks terrified, so I pat her arm. Then I feel those weird sparks and yank my hand back. I promise everyone is really nice, I tell her. Well, that's not technically true. Zach and Liam are grouchy and Orla's kind of irritable. She blinks at me. Also, Nicole will probably shriek a bunch of profanity, but Maddie is nice. Logan looks like she's going to hyperventilate. I grab a piece of paper from her notepad. I'll make you a chart, I tell her, starting at the top. Dad, I guess you'll call him Mick, and Uncle Kel are brothers. They run the company where we all work. Uncle Kel is a widower. Dad is a sleaze. Zach and Liam and I belong to Mick. Orla is Uncle Kellen's daughter. Logan nods as I write all their names. This sounds familiar. Thank you for the refresher. Okay, so Nicole is Zach's girlfriend. She's a real pistol. I'm super glad she tolerates him. Maddie is her best friend. My brother Liam knocked her up the first time they slept together. I point my pen at Logan. Always use condoms, Lolo. Bag it up every time. You don't need to tell me that, she says. Oh, shit, I forgot about your whole situation. I put the pen down. I'm such a jerk. We like to give my brother a lot of crap, but honestly, our family is super here for this baby. Liam has lots of support, swear to God. Logan tears up a little bit at this, so I hand her the Brady family tree. Her eyes are so big and searching, and she was totally honest with me yesterday about her terrible sex choices. I feel like I can come clean to her about the boat. She listened when I said I didn't like working with my family, and God, 
it'll feel good to just tell someone. There's something you should know before we go, I tell her, just in case someone mentions it. I... It feels really crappy to be bringing this up to her all of a sudden, and I start sweating again. What is it, Cal? I did something really stupid before I met you, and I haven't faced my reckoning yet. Your reckoning? Is this a historical novel? I roll my eyes and give her the summary of what happened. She looks utterly horrified. Dad hasn't said a single word about it, Logan. His silence is the worst thing. My family isn't like that at all, I tell her. I'm worried he's waiting for everyone to be present before he brings it up and just roasts me, and I deserve it. But honestly, the not knowing and the anticipation of it? I drift off and mimic an explosion. That sounds terrible, she says, biting her lip. It sounds like your family talks through everything, whether you want to or not. I snort. What if you emailed him a meeting request? Put the boat incident on as an agenda item. I laugh harder than I have since my birthday at the thought of sending my dad a calendar invite. Oh, sweet Jesus, Logan. My family is going to love you. That's sweet, Cal, but really, you need to talk to your dad. What if you call him? I feel a lot better having told someone. But I also know that this psychological torture is all part of my consequence somehow. I plunk a hand on her shoulder. I'm going to go shower and stuff. Dinner's at five tomorrow. You in? She nods, and I walk out of the room before I say something else insensitive. Chapter 14 Logan I sit in Cal's car, tapping my nails on the pot of the plant I bought across the street. Cal insisted, we don't need to bring any food and that his family is really particular about alcohol. But I couldn't show up with just myself, no matter how many times Cal rolled his eyes. My mother would probably drop over dead if she thought I was going to someone's house empty-handed. Are you sure your uncle likes succulents? I look at Cal hopefully as he shakes his head and weaves in and out of the traffic along Penn Avenue. We're running a bit late because Cal didn't want to interrupt me when I was working and I was waiting for him to tell me it was time to leave. I always feel better when I use alarms and timers to get places on time, but Cal says it's okay if we are the last ones to arrive. He loves everything, Cal says then punches the horn as someone slows to a stop at a yellow light. We could have made that. It'll be okay, I tell him and myself. I can tell he's anxious to be around his father, and I bite my lips so I don't encourage Cal to just bring up the boat situation. I don't want to touch him again, even reassuringly, because I'm still not recovered from the throbbing sensations that racked my body Friday after our spa night. It seems like neither of us is going to talk about it, and I'm glad. Better if we just pretend nothing happened and go back to being jovial roommates. A nagging thought eats at me that not talking about things seems like a pattern for Callum Brady. He was gone when I woke up yesterday and made himself scarce most of today. But then I remember that he's actually really suffering because his dad won't discuss the accident. Maybe none of the Bradys are any good at communicating. Maybe he just stinks at initiating conversations. Cal parks in his uncle's driveway and dashes up the steps to the front door. So I follow. He's met by a chorus of shouts, and I concentrate on my breathing as a swarm of people press around the doorframe, staring at me. Is she here? A woman's voice comes across the din, and I wonder if this is Nicole. Partner to Zach, tends to swear. I mentally run through Cal's notes about his relatives, hoping I don't make a blunder. A curly-haired woman charges through the group of lanky men and thrusts a drink at me. Here, you'll need liquid courage for this, she says, taking the aloe from me. Aw, Uncle Cal, she brought you a plant. I'm ushered through to the back patio and handed a plate of cheese and fruit. A tall man with dark hair and Cal's face sits opposite me. This must be his father. He cracks pistachios into a napkin and nods at me. McBrady, he says. I hear you wound up with my Cal for a roommate. 
something like that? I tell him. There's no trace of anger in his face as he brings up his middle son. It's very strange to me when people can compartmentalize their feelings. I feel wary. Nicole slides into the chair next to me. I hear you're a financial analyst, she says. I nod and Nicole squints at me. All those finance guys are horrifying. Nicole sips her alcohol. I'm thinking it's whiskey and shakes her head. She looks like she's going to say more, but Mick cuts in. Finance, eh? You work with investments? I nod and swallow my bite of cheese. I focus mainly on individual accounts, not hedge funds or anything like that. Mick leans back in his chair and pops a green nut into his mouth. I'm going to be a grandpop soon. Did you hear about that? I nod. Give me your card. I want to set something up for baby Brady. Gotta look out for his future. Mick, you don't know if it'll be a boy, Nicole says. He waves a hand. We don't make girls, he says, gesturing around the deck. Um, hello? I'm here. A woman who must be Orla walks out onto the deck, clutching a dish of guacamole to her chest, as Cal tries to reach around her and steal it. Well, honey, you're the exception, Mick says, blowing her a kiss. Orla rolls her eyes and plunks into the chair next to him. I assume Mick is just making conversation about coming to see me at work, but he asks again for my information. Oh, I say, blushing and biting my lip. All my stuff is inside. I have a card in my purse somewhere. When I got swept into the house, one of the Bradys took my purse to some bedroom, and I haven't seen it since. Thankfully, Cal comes to my rescue, telling his dad, I'll text you Lolo's info, dad. Wait till you see the buttholes she works with. I want to bury my head in my hands and really wish Cal would talk about something else, but his face is so hopeful as he waits for his father to acknowledge him. I don't like how his family's attention is turned toward me, but I guess that's better than Cal getting reamed out in front of his family. Nicole gestures at me with her drink. It doesn't surprise me in the least that you work with a bunch of monsters in finance. I was at a tech startup before I moved to Stag Law. She practically growls. So much patriarchy. God. Nicole leans back as Zach leans behind her and rubs her shoulders. I'm not sure when he came outside, but he brought a tray of beers with him, and Cal hands me one, twisting off the top as he does so. I try not to look at the muscles in his forearms. Nicole continues with a mouthful of potato chips. I can see why Cal likes her. If you get sick of testosterone city over there, let me know. I have contacts with this kick-ass group of female entrepreneurs. Startups are always looking for an MBA. Aren't startups risky? I peel the label off my beer bottle nervously, really wishing the conversation would drift away from me already. How is it that this entire party full of people is focused on me? And Nicole, she shrugs. You've got an Ivy League MBA. It's not like you'd be unemployed long if something went belly up. You should think about it. These tech companies always have someone good with ideas and someone good at networking. But never anyone who understands the financials. Come have drinks with me sometime and I'll introduce you to folks. Since when do you have friends other than Maddie and Emma? Cal throws a napkin at Nicole, who gestures at him with a fork like she's going to stab him. Well, Callum, these aren't friends, per se. They're women in business. Networking connections. She jabs something on her plate with the fork. We vent a lot. Oh, and we're doing a book club. Not this again, Orla shakes her head. But Maddie perks up and reaches for her bag next to her chair. She pulls out a very tattered paperback. Orla she says. I'm telling you, it's so good. Maddie hands me the book, The Red Coat, and fixes me with a pointed stare. Logan, you need to read it. Liam and Zach roll their eyes. Zach leans back against the railing on the deck, shaking his head. I never in a million years would have pegged my girl to be into reading romance novels. So sappy, Liam agrees, and starts making kissing noises. Maddie and Nicole look like they're going to murder their Brady boys. Listen to me, assholes. Nicole seems fully enraged by now, and I notice Mick shifting uncomfortably in his chair, peering inside like he's hoping Kellen comes out soon with the food. 
Maybe that's just me. But I guess I'm glad they're all focused on something else. Nicole actually stands up clutching the book. This is a sweeping tale about relationships and love and honor and caring for other people. Plus, it's about revolution and history and fighting for what you believe in. Isaac Brady, if you want access to my honeypot ever again, you will read this book until you know that reference. Zach, I recall Cal telling me Isaac goes by Zach, points at Nicole and says, if I want to learn about the Revolutionary War, I just need to go to the Fort Pitt Museum down at the point. You can keep your kissing book. Liam moves to offer him a high five, but Maddie throws her copy across the deck and pegs him in the face. The book highlights all the gritty realities of parenthood, too, she shouts. The love story is just part of it. This is really about the human condition. Cal leans closer to me as they all continue shouting at one another. I feel like we should both read this book. It must be good if Nicole is making threats and Maddie is throwing shit. I nod as he pulls out his phone. Oh, he says, showing me. There's an audio book. Should we listen? I like the idea of us reading the book together, discussing the story over food. Cal might not be Callie, but I'm really starting to see how this living arrangement offers everything I'd been fantasizing about. This family is strange and loud and evidently needs a lot of work on their communication skills. But I feel so thrilled at how readily they're including me. My cheeks start to hurt from smiling as I help Cal check the audiobook out from the library. He downloads the book and slides his phone in his pocket. Uncle Kellen brings out a huge pan of food, and chaos erupts as everyone digs into the casserole. I'm able to settle back in my seat no longer the focus of attention, and just observe. The Brady family is awesome, frankly. They tease each other, but obviously help one another with everything, from opening beers to taking care of each other's cars. I've never had anything like this. The silent treatment Cal mentioned, I can relate to. But I don't really see evidence of that. Right now, the Bradys are all shouting and joking and complimenting Kellen's cooking. Every now and then a family like this would come into the diner when I was working. I'd hang back and watch as they shared food with each other, offered helpful suggestions to each other's challenges. They all seem comfortable and relaxed. I feel like I've been clenching for my entire life, anxious I'll flounder and start a chain reaction that would leave us homeless. We were always balancing on the edge of a razor always one small emergency away from not covering our bills, even with me chipping in with my part-time job. I sit on this deck and imagine what it would have been like with more people to share in the work of keeping it all together. I wish my mom could be here now, relaxing. She's probably at work, I think. Cal squeezes my shoulder and mouths. Are you okay? I nod and smile, because I am. I am doing better than okay, despite all the challenges I faced. I just wonder when I will be able to let go and enjoy it. Chapter 15 Logan Monday morning, Marie bangs on the frame of my office door, which I kept open today for some reason. What did you do? She asks, tapping her foot. I try to imagine what she's referring to, and I squint, thinking through my to-do list from the morning. I ran a forecasting model for a few of my accounts, I tell her, and start to fumble around with the papers on my desk when Marie makes a sigh-groan type noise. I mean, what did you say to this new client? I've got a Mick Brady here refusing intake procedures and insisting he meet with you directly. Oh, I say, I didn't know he was serious about coming in, he's... I remember that my colleagues think Cal is my boyfriend. He's my boyfriend's dad. Marie presses her lips together and glares at me. Well, as your supervisor, I'm telling you to tell your father-in-law he has to stick with protocol. You are not involved in client relations, Logan. You run the numbers. Do you think you'd get a referral bonus? Seriously? I open my mouth to say something when Cal's dad pops his head into my office. There you are, Logan. 
Told you I'd be by to set something up, he elbows Marie. Did Logan tell you I'm gonna be a grand pup? Mick squeezes past Marie and sits down across from me at my desk. She is flustered, because this definitely isn't how clients usually come on board. Mick, she says, smoothing out her suit jacket. I thought I was meeting you in the conference room to talk about the perks of investing with us. He waves his hand at her dismissively. I don't need to know the perks. I just want Logan to set something up for my new grandson. Marie grits her teeth. Logan wouldn't know how to do the setup for something like this, Mick. Cal's dad's face shifts, and he tilts his head to the side as he reaches into his suit pocket. He pulls out a fat envelope and throws it on the desk. Oh my God, he brought cash. I steeple my fingers, pressing them together firmly and breathing deeply. Mick gestures to the packet. Sweetheart, he says to Marie. Why don't you go take care of that for me while Logan handles my business? She stares at the money. Mick leans closer to her. It's probably better if you call me Mr. Brady, he says. Mick is what my friends call me. Marie turns beet red, and I try to savor the sight of her. I know I'll suffer for this later, but right now, in front of a client, she's totally trapped. I bounce my knee up and down anxiously until she scoops up the bills. I'll just figure out what to do with this, she says and backs out of the room. Mick leans back and pushes the door to my office shut. She's a real piece of work, he says to me. I don't know how you stand being around that sour puss all day. I'll tell you, I didn't make it this far in business without learning how to read people, and this office has a bunch of duds. I swallow and nod. I'm still not done savoring the look on Marie's face when Mick told her off. But all that evaporates when I remember what Cal confided in me and how Mick is giving him the silent treatment, supposedly. Do I come clean that I know about it? I have no idea how to proceed here, so I just stare at him. What's eating at you, kid? You worried I'm going to say something awful about Callum? I swallow, not sure what to say. He leans back in his chair. My boy and I are going to have a conversation about that eventually, he says. I assume you know what I'm referring to. I nod. I haven't quite worked out my feelings about what happened there, Mick says. Don't you worry about. He and I will be just fine. Like I told you, I can read people. That doesn't always mean I can read them immediately. He takes a deep breath, and I can tell we are both thinking of Cal. This family has gone through worse. I nod again, wondering if I'll ever recover from the contrasting emotions today has brought. So, Mick says, tell me what you've got in mind for baby Brady. You mean now? He laughs. Well, sure. I'm here, aren't I? I take a deep breath and spin one of my monitors toward him. You know, you caught me off guard, Mick. He leans forward and winks. Yeah, but I bet you have ideas anyway. When I laugh, my feeling of relief is genuine. He's right, and I like this much better than trying to figure out Marie and her moods. Financials are much more in my comfort zone. You've got at least 19 years until he or she will need any of the funds, I tell him. We can comfortably assert a little risk. I'm really liking some of these biotech opportunities in India. Mick and I pour over my prediction models and set up a nice little fund plan for Liam and Maddie's baby. It occurs to me that I didn't even realize this was a thing people did until recently. And here I am having a conversation with someone wealthy enough to do it. And he trusts me to help him. Want some pistachios? Mick reaches into the same pocket where he stored his cash and procures a single serving package of nuts. He is, without a doubt, the strangest person I've encountered since moving to Pittsburgh. But I get the sense that, like Cal, he's just absolutely showing me his honest self. And right now, he wants to eat a snack and talk about investments. Sure, I say. We end up chatting until he stands, pulls me in for a hug, and says he has to leave. 
I like you, Logan, he tells me. You're going to be good for Callum, I can tell. You gotta stand up to the sourpusses around here, though. He gives me a salute and takes off before I can remind him Cal and I are just friends. I slump into my chair and exhale, exhausted by the hurricane he just set in motion. Later, on the ride home with Cal, I want to tell him everything about the day. But he reminds me we are about to reach the point in our audiobook where the redcoat soldier and his colonist lady get married in secret. Remember that I waited for you, Lolo, he says, pulling out into traffic after picking me up from my building. I could have listened to this entire thing today at work. I roll my eyes and try to convince him that he needs to hear me out about my meeting. But he turns on the recording and starts saying, La la la, I can't hear you. The narrator mentions a belt hitting the floor, and Cal snaps his mouth shut. Shh, I say, swatting at his arm. And then the two of us stare at each other as the McClintons consummate their marriage. Repeatedly. This is a dirty book, Cal says, eyes wide as he merges onto Forbes Avenue. Shh, I say again, shifting uncomfortably in my seat as I listen to the narrator describe intense passion between the main characters. At one point, Cal pauses the story and looks at me, eyes wide. I'm not sure why I don't hang out with Nicole more often, he says, fanning himself. Did you know this was a dirty book? I shrug and reach past him to push play again, so I can hear what happens next in the story. For once, I'm glad there's traffic so we can continue listening. Linus McClinton asks his new bride if it's normal for a man and a woman to feel such a connection, and I feel myself tense. This is always the part where I tune out of a romantic movie or novel. I've never felt such a thing, not even an inkling. And I want to cringe when fictional characters suggest that true love is out there for the grabbing. I nod in relief when Sally confirms that what she and Linus are experiencing is unbelievable. Surreal. Thank you, I say to the car at large. Cal slaps the pause button as he pulls into the garage of our building. Hot damn, he says. When he pulls his Bronco into the parking spot, he slithers down in the seat, looking limp. How can you just sit there like that, all unaffected? What do you mean? Cal looks at me like I have two heads. Logan, we just listened to the sexiest love scenes and you're... He gestures at me and mops at his brow again. I shrug. It's like Sally said there at the end. What they have is extraordinary. It's a fiction. A fantasy. Cal raises a brow at me in the dim light of the parking garage. By fantasy, do you mean you'd be down for some inspired role play? Because I could get a musket. I swat at his arm. I already told you. All that stuff, it doesn't affect me. What stuff? Sex? You mean to tell me you don't have a lady boner after listening to that? I recoil away from him and open the door to the car. A lady boner? Ew, Cal. He rolls his eyes and tosses me my bag, shouldering the driver's side door shut and following me to the elevator. He leans on the wall facing me as we wait for it to arrive. You can't tell me you weren't affected by listening to that, Logan. His voice is lower somehow, his eyes darker than usual. I do feel something, but I don't know how to identify it. My neck is sweating, and I can feel the blood in my ears throbbing as Cal raises a hand and tucks my hair back from my shoulder. My mouth feels like I swallowed peanut butter too quickly. But none of these symptoms matches anything I've read about or heard described in the so-called dirty books so far. I don't know what this is. The elevator bings as the doors slide open, and I climb inside, licking my lips and trying to swallow. Cal looks at me strangely as he saunters inside. I take a deep breath. Thank you for the ride, I tell him. No sweat, Lolo. Want to keep listening while we make dinner? The next few chapters of the book involve a shooting and a dangerous encounter with the rebel army and I notice it's much easier to be around Cal while we're listening to that. Chapter 16 Cal 
Liam and Maddie finally tell my mom about the pregnancy, and she stops hounding me about taking Logan shopping for dishes. For about two days. Then, my phone starts blowing up every hour until I promise that I'll bring my roommate along the next time Liam and I meet Mom for dinner. I'm not sure why I thought a nice little dinner for five would be less of a production than sending the women folk shopping, but Logan has spent the entire ride so far fretting even worse than when she was meeting the Brady crew last weekend. She didn't tell me what she was making, Logan says nervously twisting the bottle of wine in her lap like it's coated in sandpaper or something. I don't even know if white wine was the right choice, but the woman at the store says most people enjoy a nice Sauvignon Blanc. Am I pronouncing that right? Cal, you have to swear you won't let me pronounce things wrong and sound like a hick in front of your mother. Jesus Christ, Logan! You're fine! It's fine! Calm down! She snaps her head back like she's been slapped and I feel like shit. I'm so sorry, I tell her, shifting down into fourth as the traffic crawls along up 279 from downtown. God, Logan, everything I say and do lately just turns to shit. What's wrong? She frowns, looking concerned, and starts twisting the wine bottle again. I slap at the steering wheel. I'm all worked up about what you said my dad said in your office, I tell her. I also don't know if my mom knows what happened. They still talk and I don't know what the hell she really thinks about our whole situation. I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't with that. What do you mean? Logan's eyes are sometimes so wide and innocent. I feel like I'm sinning just being in the same room as her. I think back to how I was creeping into her space after spa night, and I feel like even more garbage. I take a deep breath. If my family thinks we're sleeping together, then I'm impulsive and dumb for moving in with a woman and getting into her pants. If we're not sleeping together, then I'm dumb and immature because you're amazing and I haven't settled down yet and I'm still going out and getting wasted on my birthday, crashing boats into trees. Cal, she says, reaching for me. I pull my arm out of the way, not ready for the kindness of her touch right now. It's been over a month now since you moved in since the boat thing. You've been a pretty good... I'm the grunt boy at work, Logan. Nobody trusts me with anything resembling real engineering, and I obviously can't be trusted with anything more than paper pushing. You work with people who are assholes to your face. Me? I work with people who will never, ever stop viewing me as the good time guy. I'm great at parties. Terrible when things get real. I exit the highway and turn toward my mom's neighborhood. She moved to some swanky suburb after she and Dad got divorced and commutes every day to her office in the city. I watch Logan's face as she assesses her surroundings. Luxury cars, immaculate landscaping. I've been real with you, Logan says, pulling her eyes away back into the Bronco and toward me. I've told you things I never told anyone else. Well, I mutter. Fuck. Thank you for that. You're the only one. She smiles and stares back out the window as I swerve around the floral dividers that are centered in each intersection of Mom's neighborhood. Things are really starting to bloom now. Everything looks great on the surface. Cal, she says, her voice quiet. I think you need to be real with your family, too. I grit my teeth and shake my head, not able to think about the emotions threatening to rip me apart right now. I pull into Mom's driveway behind Liam's parked car. You ready for this? She smiles and nods, slithering out of the Bronco. I really should get her a step stool or something so it's not such a big drop for her. Logan gets about two steps toward the door before my mom bursts through it. They're here! Liam, come get her coat. No, wait. Stay there with Maddie. Your brother can help her. Logan! Mom claps her hands together and clutches her chest. I never thought my Callum would ever bring a woman home to meet me. She actually starts crying. Mom, it's not like that, I remind her. Remember, Logan is my roommate. Mom waves her hands around. I'm going to be a grandma, she says, draping an arm around Logan's shoulders. You'll forgive me for being emotional. Oh my God, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Sheila Brady. You must call me Sheila. Liam and I exchange a glance, and I crack a smile when he rolls his eyes. 
Thankfully, Maddie interrupts the sob fest and starts asking Logan how far we've gotten in the audiobook. Eventually, Mom slows her roll, and we're soon sitting around the table with snacks and drinks while we wait for a frittata to crisp under the broiler. That's a phrase I wasn't familiar with at all. Because my entire life, my mother has made really bland diet food or else ordered takeout. But now that Liam and I are bringing women around, she rolls out the red carpet. Maddie fans herself with a napkin and shakes her head while she tells my mom about the red coat. The McClintons are going through all this strife because Linus is a red coat. But he's starting to see that the rebels have a valid beef with the British. And Sally is helping him through parting ways with his brothers in arms. Liam scratches at his stubble, looking intrigued. I thought this was a kissing book. Oh, I interject. That's in there, too. Whoa, man, is there kissing. But yeah, there's also all this stuff about the battles and loyalty and... And doing the right thing, Logan says, nodding. I can definitely relate to Linus sort of figuring out he's working for the wrong side. Logan's co-workers are terrible people, Maddie says to Mom. She gestures with a carrot stick and tells Mom about Dad's visit to Logan's office, a meeting that has quickly become a treasured part of our family lore. Logan, her face a little flushed from the wine, leans forward and puts her elbows on the table. On second thought, as I study her, she's more than a little tipsy. Can I tell you a secret? Mom and Maddie are rapt, and I'm worried because Logan never gets personal with people. Other than me, I guess. They said I had to bring a date to the gala because the client's wives would think I was trying to get in their husband's pants. Mom gasps. Maddie pulls a bag of candy out of her fanny pack and passes Logan a piece of licorice. That's pretty fucking bad, Maddie says, patting Logan's hand. She gestures at me. Cal is coming to protect me, she says, and slaps the table. Just gonna make sure I don't steal all those greasy rich men right out from under their wives' noses. You know me. Hey, Mom, I interrupt. Can we maybe get some food into Logan here? Mom orders Liam to get the pan out of the oven and leans forward, gripping Logan's forearm. Logan, sweetheart, that is a human resources nightmare. People said these things to you at work, during work hours? Logan's face pales at Mom's mention of HR, and she starts shaking her head rapidly. It's not like that. I'm just new there, is all. Finding my feet. I don't want to rock the boat. Her voice drops off, and Mom and Maddie move their chairs closer and start hugging her. Logan starts to cry. I look at Liam, panicking. I have no idea what to do with a group of women crying. This is literally the first time something like this has happened in my life, and I feel helpless. Liam shrugs and makes a don't-ask-me gesture, and I roll my eyes at him and clear my throat. Hey, so, I'm going to be Logan's date for this thing and sniff it out. Plus, Nicole is helping Lolo connect with some networking opportunities. Mom starts shaking her head. This type of behavior needs to be nipped in the bud. Hey, I say, patting my mom's arm. If Logan's ready to make that move, we'll help her. Logan blinks away her tears and just looks back and forth between all of us. Liam serves her a slice of frittata, acting like he heard of that food before today. Logan takes a bite and closes her eyes, saying, You're all being very supportive. I'm sorry to ruin your dinner getting over-emotional. Nonsense! Mom takes a swig of wine. You didn't ruin a thing, darling. I really just want to get situated. This was a big move for me to a new city. I know I should be grateful for the job offer and the opportunity. Maddie snorts. Grateful? Please. They're the ones who should be grateful you're lending them your skills. I heard Mick talking about the investment package you set up for him. Really? Logan and I say this at the same time, and I'm glad to see she smiles, noticing that. Maddie nods. We were presenting him with the final version of the corporate history. She turns to Logan. I'm writing a corporate history for Beltane. It's how I met Liam. Anyway, he was trying to deflect because praise makes him uncomfortable. Oh, it absolutely does not. Mom looks like she's going to smash her wine glass when Maddie says that. But Liam rests a hand on Mom's shoulder as Maddie keeps talking. He's pretty blustery, but I think deep down, he's very moved by what his colleagues all said about him. Even the people he's had to fire over the years said really respectful things about how he handled that. None of us has anything to say in response to that little bomb Maddie dropped. 
so I dive into my dinner, wondering what to make of all of this. I'm relieved when Maddie and Mom pivot back to talking about the Redcoat book. Logan is quiet on the drive home after I told her to stop telling me she felt embarrassed for the things she said. Seriously, Lo, I tell her. Mom is on your side, and you already knew Liam and Maddie were on Team Logan. But why? she asks. Who am I to earn their advice and their loyalty like that? I shrug, even though it's dark and she can't see. You're my friend, I tell her. That makes you an honorary Brady. More silence. But then, I've never been on anyone's team before. Well, now you're stuck with us, I say, chuckling. As long as I don't fuck up too badly, like crash one of their cars. Ouch, Logan, what the hell? I stare at her, shocked that she'd bring that up this way. I just feel like your family doesn't even know you and your dad have this rift, and you haven't even told them you hate your job. How can I let my guard down if their own blood relations aren't immune from being shunned? I'm not being shunned, Logan. But Ed's going to tell me I disappointed him and I'm going to feel like shit, and I'm ultimately going to stop acting like an idiot. Hopefully. I shrug again. Plus, you'd never do anything that dumb. You're like Liam. His worst mistake is making my parents into grandparents, and they're both delirious with joy about it. Cal? She touches my arm again, and I wonder if her skin will ever stop making mine sizzle like that. What's up, Logan? I'm nervous about this weekend. Just keep your eyes on me, doll. That's why I'm there, right? I pat her leg and then yank my hand back to the steering wheel where it belongs. It's awfully complicated trying not to flirt. Like Logan, I wonder if I'll ever find my footing, as she calls it. Do you think you might want to go to HR, like my mom suggested? I swallow thickly as the question hangs in the air. I can practically feel Logan panicking at the question. Hey, I tell her, hearing her breathing quicken. Forget I said it. You don't have to do anything that makes you uncomfortable. I'll be by your side at the gala, but I'd be at your side no matter what, okay? She nods, but the energy is different in the car. I crossed a line somehow, and I don't know how to get us back on track. Things were easier when I didn't care what anyone thought. Chapter 17 Cal The next few days hanging out with Logan are so chill that I almost forget I promised to take her to her work party this weekend. We've been listening to our book. It's hard for me not to listen ahead when I'm out for a run or doing something with my family and Logan's not around, but I try to imagine how I'd feel if she listened without me. Plus, I love listening with her. We're always pausing and talking about the story. It's funny, the things she and I both notice and relate to. Most evenings, we sprawl out on the couch with popcorn and listen to a few chapters. Honestly, it's been really cool getting to know someone who hasn't been there for my entire life story. It'll be nice to hang out with her at this work thing. Saturday morning, I meet up with my family for our usual long run. Nicole actually decided to come this time, and she's all put out that I didn't bring Logan. Callum, I was going to yell at her to come with me to the networking thing this week. She never did email me. Nicole points a finger into my chest like it was me who forgot to email. I don't really think she's much of a runner, I say, shrugging and bending to stretch. Besides... She's going nuts, getting ready for the gala thing tonight. Logan looked like she was going to cry when she told me a bitchy woman at work said something shitty about her hair. I think Logan's hair is beautiful. That's just objective fact. She was feeling self-conscious about it, though, so Logan was planning to go get all done up at one of the salons near our condo this morning. I'm really hoping I don't punch anyone tonight, I say before I remember that my family doesn't know I'm acting like Logan's boyfriend for work purposes. What's tonight? Can I punch someone? Zack looks like he's in a black mood, and I start to wonder whether Nicole held firm to her promise of keeping her honeypot to herself. I shrug as we start running through Frick Park. It seems like all the tadpoles born this spring have become super loud frogs overnight and for a while we're surrounded by the sound of our sneakers on the path and a bunch of croaking amphibians. It's sort of nice, especially considering we're still inside the city. 
Hello, Cal. What's tonight? Liam and Zach flank me, while Nicole and Orla move on ahead. I can hear them talking about the red coat book, and I wish I could ditch my brothers and join that conversation instead. Ah, Logan's co-workers are a bunch of assholes, I tell them. Liam knows, of course, after that whole emotional dinner fiasco with Mom. I guess he and Maddie didn't talk about it with Zach and Nicole. I'm going to her party with her. Free food and all that. I try to play it off like it's no big deal, and I'm surprised when Zach nods. Oh, right. Dad told me about that. Dad? Zach looks over his shoulder like he's checking for his girlfriend. Yeah, he says. You know, Dad went and opened an investment account with Logan. For the baby. I knew secondhand that Dad opened an account with Logan but it hadn't occurred to me that he shelled out enough to get invited to the gala event. I know Dad has been doing okay over the past few years, especially since my brothers have opened up new income streams for Beltane. Did you know Dad was swanky schmooze invites rich? He has that much money to toss around? Liam nods. He won't tell me how much, but he did agree that the people from Logan's work are a pack of assholes. Hey, you think you'll be sitting with Dad? Shit, I hope not. It won't be easy to play the part of Logan's boyfriend with my dad interrupting me all the time to ask questions about hygiene or herbal supplements or whatever weird interest he's got right now. If he decides he's speaking to me tonight, he probably will, because people will be looking. I laugh at my brother's comment, and the path starts heading uphill, so none of us are really talking anymore as we focus on our breath. I figure it's better this way. I don't want to say anything else that will tangle my responsibilities. I wish Logan had told me my dad was invited to the fancy party. I probably also should have remembered to have my suit dry cleaned. By the time I get home, it's way too late for that option, but I borrow Logan's iron while she's still out at the salon, and I think everything turns out okay. I decide I'd better not put the suit on to eat lunch in case I spill something. So I'm sitting in the living room in my boxers, post-shower, eating tacos from across the street, when Logan bursts into the apartment. I almost drop the delicious meat on my chest when I see her. The stylist did something to make her hair bouncy, and I can tell she's got makeup on, even though she doesn't look fake. She just looks... fancy. You look really elegant, I tell her, nodding and licking taco sauce off my fingers, while she peels off some sort of foam shoe. What's all that? She grins. I got my nails done, she says. They give you these foam flip-flops so you don't mess anything up walking to your car. Of course, they weren't expecting me to be walking home a few blocks, but they still look okay. Logan extends her leg, pointing her toes and wiggling them all around. And I've never really been a footman, per se, but hot damn, she looks sexy right now in her shorts with those dark purple toes and nails, and the fancy hair. Damn. They look awesome, I tell her, standing up from the couch, and then sitting back down immediately when I remember that I'm only wearing boxers, and the toe action has caused a little stretch and lift down below. She bites her lip and studies the fridge, settling on a cup of yogurt and a banana from the counter. I'm starving, but I don't want to smear all my makeup, she says, daintily licking her spoon and biting the fruit. My crotch situation is not improving as I watch all this happen. I clear my throat. I have the same concern about getting food on my suit, I tell her, gesturing to my semi-naked couch outfit. I grab a throw pillow from the corner of the couch and toss it on my lap, leaning forward on my elbows. What time do we have to leave? Five she says around a mouthful of banana. I'm going to finish getting ready, okay? And she's off down the hall before I can respond. Shit. Since when does the sight of Logan send me to half-mast? Check that. Full-mast. Gah. I guess that sort of thing is inevitable when you live with a chick and you're also attracted to chicks. I should stop saying chick. Orla's always on me about that. Eventually, I make my way to my room and into my suit. I know I told Logan I'd dress the part for a fancy people party, but I just don't have it in me to wear stuffy dress shoes. That's Liam's thing. I tug on my dark green tie and smile down at my brand new matching chucks. I know Logan's wearing green tonight, so we'll match. 
Sort of like prom, I guess. I'm in the middle of wondering whether she went to prom and whether her date tried to match her dress when she backs down the hall half-naked. Hey, Cal, can you help me? I freeze in my tracks, just staring at her skin on display. She's not wearing a bra, and the smooth expanse of her back moves as she breathes. Logan has her salon curls swept up with one hand while she tries to hold the pieces of her dress together with the other. I say nothing, trying to move my eyes toward the ceiling so I don't look down the dress in search of her ass. I can't reach the zipper, she says, wiggling the fabric around in her left hand, still not looking at me. I make a grunting noise, because that's all I'm capable of right now, and swallow, reaching for the dress. The shiny fabric is silky smooth as I root around in search of the zipper. I find it, somewhere in the middle of her ass, and my fingers linger as I tug the zipper into place. Fuck, this is hot, I think, fumbling around for the hook at the top. I put one hand on Logan's shoulder and pop the hook into place, noticing that the dress forms sort of an X in the back. It's elegant and shimmery and clings to curves I hadn't noticed before today. Not like this. I start to wonder what she tastes like under all that hair, with her big brain and excellent hygiene. And then I have to know. I have to taste her, like I have to breathe. Before I can control myself, I lean forward and kiss the nape of her neck, where she's holding her hair out of the way. She drops her hair with a little gasp, spinning around in my arms, which I don't retract. When she meets my eyes, she looks frightened, and I feel like shit. I'm so sorry, I whisper. I shake my head and reach for her hand. Forgive me, Logan, you just looked so... pretty. Her mouth forms an O, and she blushes, looking even more beautiful. And then she smiles and I feel like the sun is shining down on me. We stand there in the hall, staring at each other, all dressed up. Eventually, Logan says, Thank you, Cal. You look amazing, too. Her smile shifts, and she squeezes my hand back before dropping it. Let me grab my bag, and we can call for a ride. You ready? Yep, I say even though I'm thinking I have no idea what I'm doing. Not one bit. Chapter 18 Logan Cal takes my hand as we walk into the grand entrance of the Union Station building. My breath catches when I realize how much I enjoy holding his hand. I'm still a little shaken by his kiss at the condo, not because I didn't like it, but because of how much I did. I can still feel the whisper of his touch on my neck, like his lips branded my skin. I look up at his face, trying to make sense of the joy I feel at the idea of him branding me, claiming me as his. Cal gestures up at the arched bricks and beautiful glass of the building. Can you imagine getting off a train here? So cool, right? All I can do is nod feeling dwarfed by the grandeur of it all. Cal pats one of the brick columns. My uncle and brothers would have a field day if they were here. They'd want you to understand, structurally, everything that makes this place special. I look up at him, confused. But you don't want to do that? He shrugs. You know, buildings don't do it for me, Lolo. I'd rather tell you all about an engine. He tugs me through the entrance, where the restored, original benches are still placed around. The elegant train station is now a tower of high-end condos, but the ground floor is used for events. I feel out of place, like I've got a third-class ticket sneaking into the first-class lounge. I watch as my colleagues see me arrive, and then turn back to their drinks and conversation partners. That's fine. I wasn't expecting a warm welcome here, but... It does sting. It's such a contrast to the way the Brady family, for instance, has welcomed me. Steadfast at my side, Cal leans in to ask me, when can I meet the Beagle guy? I blink at him. I had totally forgotten about that. 
Then I feel bad because he's talked so much about wanting to talk tires with the founder of that company. I know it's a big deal that Cal confided in me that he's been unhappy at work, that he wants to try something different and longs to work someplace like Beagle AI. I've been so selfish, bogarting conversation about my own work situation instead of helping him get ready to dazzle Pete Harris. I nod and bite my lip. Cal raises a brow and gestures his head toward the bar. Let's get us some fancy drinks and then you can go insert yourself in the conversation. He smacks my butt when I don't move, and I'm so surprised that I burst out laughing. Loudly. People turn and stare, of course. I flush, and Cal just grins, steering me toward the bar with his arm around my waist. I realize how much I like the feel of that. He's so warm and confident. It does interesting things to my body to feel his touch, and I notice that a lot of the women here are staring at us. We get in line for drinks, and I study Cal's appearance. He looks amazing, actually. His unruly hair is combed, and he must have some product in it because it stays put, the gentle waves framing his face without looking sloppy. His suit fits him really well, and even though he's wearing his standard sneakers, the look works for him. Even in a room full of wealthy, refined people, Cal seems comfortable and at home wearing sneakers with a suit. I can barely breathe. I'm so anxious about tripping on my dress. Cal starts to circle his thumb along my hip where his arm snakes around my waist and one of the women serving appetizers on a tray gives me a tight-lipped glower. Well, that's par for the course for me. I'm used to getting the stink eye. Not typically from service industry professionals, though. Lo? I realize Cal has been talking to me, and I bite my lip again. What do you want to drink, sweets? I make a face. I don't like being called those kind of pet names, even though I don't really think Cal means anything patronizing by it. Too many diner customers used to take liberties and call me that, and try and touch me. I realize people are waiting in line behind us, probably staring at the dumb girl who's holding up the line. Whatever you're having, I blurt, remembering that Cal always seems to know what tastes good. He arches a brow at me as the bartender slides two tumblers of liquor toward us. Cal drops some cash in the tip jar, and I feel bad that he's doing me the favor of being my date, and yet he's the one paying for the tips. I'll get the tip next time, I tell him, quickly grabbing the glass and moving it toward my mouth. Whoa, whoa, Lolo, he says putting a hand on my wrist to stop me knocking back the shot. This is a fine Irish whiskey, girlfriend. We sip and savor. Good save, son. A hand claps onto my shoulder, and I look up to see Mick Brady standing between us, an arm around each of us. Glad to see I've taught you at least one important thing in this world. Hey, Dad, Cal says, gesturing toward his dad with his glass. You probably taught me a few things. Well, Mick says, whiskey is the most important part at a shindig like this anyway. Mick nods at his son, pulls his arms from around us and rubs his palms together. Tell me who's here. Who do I know? Cal just shrugs. I can tell he's uncomfortable being here with his father and also being here with me playing pretend. Mick doesn't seem to notice anything amiss, though and I'm glad Cal and I have established friendly rapport with his family. I decide to give Mick an overview of the room. We've got the Stanton family over by the fondue, I tell him, and then I squint as I study the space, looking past my colleagues and trying to identify our clients. Oh, and the Kellys are here. Do you know them? Their law offices are near Beltane. Old Kelly and I go way back. Mick says, nodding. He glances around. Tell me, Logan the girl? Is it okay to call you that? That's how Cal first mentioned you. I don't get a chance to answer as he rushes on. You got anyone here from any public utilities? Did Cal tell you that's our focus these days? I shrug. He didn't mention it. I'm not really sure where people work unless they're on my client list, I tell him. I could probably ask around for you, if you want. Mick waves a hand and takes his son's whiskey from him. No need. I'm going to mingle. 
See what I can drum up. And he's gone before either of us can say another word. That seemed like an okay interaction with your dad, I say, looking over Cal's shoulder and watching as Mick sidles up to a pair of older men who seem delighted to see him. He seems to know everyone. Cal puts his hands in his pockets and looks upset. He does know everyone, he says. Then he shakes his head. There's a strange silence between us until he gestures toward my drink. So first, you want to smell the whiskey. Go on, I give it a sniff. It smells warm somehow, and sharp, but not unpleasant like the fireball the guys handed me at the bar the other weeks. Open your lips a bit while you sniff it, Cal says, stepping closer to me and watching. My mouth falls open as I inhale, the scent mixing with his aftershave and making me feel a little woozy, if I'm honest. Now, sip it slowly, Cal says, nodding. His eyes have gone intense, deeply brown, so they're nearly black as he watches my mouth. I've never had someone study me as I eat or drink before, and I'm self-conscious, worried I'll cough and sputter like I did at the bar. Hold it on your tongue and let it spread through your mouth, he says, his voice low and deep. I can see a vein moving in his neck above his collar, and I like watching it, like seeing him swallow. I don't feel like I'm pretending with Cal right now, but I also don't know how to describe whatever this is. I tip the glass into my mouth, and my eyes flare at the feel of the alcohol. It tingles a bit, but doesn't burn. Breathe through your nose. I do as he asks, sensing that he wants to reach out and touch me and wishing, strangely, that he would. I remind myself that his father is here, and this is a professional function. I swallow the whiskey. Tell me what you taste, he says, his face so close to mine. So close. It's smooth, I whisper, and warm. My breath is coming so fast, I feel like I just worked a rush hour shift at the diner. I'm surrounded by Cal, by his scent, by his arm on mine. The warmth of the drink is spreading through me now, but it's not unpleasant. I don't feel afraid of these things like I did in the parking garage that time. Ever since Cal kissed my neck, I've been craving him. Cal shifts closer to me as I raise the glass again to take another sip. Logan, there you are. I'm startled by the voice of Mr. Dolan, one of my favorite clients. Jim, how nice to see you. I smile and raise my glass toward him. I'm so glad you could make it tonight. Wouldn't miss a chance to hang out with you, my dear. Say, who's this fella? Cal grins and extends his hand for a shake. And I'm conflicted, because I already miss the feel of his big hand on my arm. Cal Brady, he says. Then he winks. I also wouldn't miss a chance to hang out with Logan. I've been following those companies you mentioned, Jim says, nodding at me and scratching his chin. I feel like you've got a sixth sense about investments. My portfolio is way up from last year. I just do what the algorithms tell me, I tell him, smiling into my drink. It's somehow less delicious without Cal's hot gaze on my lips. Don't sell yourself short, Logan, he says, just as another client wanders over. I wanted to say hello before there was a line, she says her laugh tinkling over the sound of the live band playing jazzy music. Mary Emerson is extraordinarily wealthy, and hers is the largest account I've been given in my short time with the firm. I'd always make time for you, I say. I extend my arm thinking she will shake my hand, but Mary pulls me in for a hug. She turns to Jim and says, I just doubled my investments with Logan after I saw my latest dividends statement. I spoke with my brother in New York, and he's thinking of stopping in for some financial advice, too. Logan is magical when it comes to these things. That's what I was just saying. The two of them start chatting about how pleased they are, that I'm looking after their financial future, and I allow myself a small moment to feel proud that I've made such an impact on each of them. It feels good, especially when they talk about scholarship funds they're setting up with some of their earnings. I like knowing that someone will be able to go to college who wouldn't have been able to otherwise, like me. 
They love you, Lolo. Cal's breath on my ear makes me shiver, and I glance up to see yet another version of his smile. This one is joyful and sultry all at once, somehow, and I think the whiskey might be getting to me, because his expression no longer seems friendly. It seems like he's interested in something more seductive. I'm torn between leaning into his touch because I crave it, and not doing that because Cal's father is here. Just then, I spy James over Cal's shoulder, talking to a group of people. Hey, I say, nodding toward James. You should go talk to your beagle guy, Cal grins. Pure friendly this time. He runs his hands through his hair and smooths out his suit. Gah, this is exciting. Do I look okay? I laugh. You look fantastic. And then I suck in a breath when he plants a kiss on my cheek, an echo of his kiss a few hours before. I watch as he makes his way over toward my colleague until Mary squeals. Logan, what a delightful young man you've found, she says. I flush, remembering that of course Cal is putting on a show because he agreed to. Thank you, Mary. He is. I don't meet her eye as I watch his face come to life meeting James's client. This must be the engineer Cal had been gushing about, because he's gesturing with his hands, grinning widely. And then he catches my eye from across the room and winks again. Mary seems like she's going to swoon. I can practically feel the passion between you, she says. And I should feel relieved by Cal's acting ability. He's obviously done his part being convincing because the company wanted me to seem like someone in a stable relationship to convey confidence to our clientele. Surely that's what Marie meant to say when she allowed my coworkers to belittle me and talk about my personal life during a meeting. I think back to a time I had been selected to go on a trip to meet some lawmakers in high school. The other kids chosen were popular, and none too kind when they realized I was getting my ticket and my professional outfit paid for from a special fund at school. I made the mistake of telling my mother how mean they were to me, the things they whispered about my crooked teeth and discount store suit. You get what you get and you don't get upset, my mother hissed as she handed me bus fare so I could get to school early enough for the field trip departure. I think about the impact of that lesson that I should feel gratitude for whatever I'm given and look the other way if people act like, well, like they act at my current work. My entire life, I've been taught not to get upset, not to make a scene, not to acknowledge my feelings, and to just be grateful. And now that I've realized how wrong that is, it's like I can't put back the veil. I look around this room, and the only thing in it that makes me feel good is Cal. Suddenly, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be here with Cal under false pretenses and play into the hands of people who would suggest my behavior toward my clients is anything but professional. I don't want to contribute to Cal's rift with his father. I watch as Cal reaches into his suit jacket and hands his card to a man I assume is Pete Harris. The look on Cal's face conveys total sincerity, hopefulness. I stiffen and sigh. I've come this far. I can help Cal get something he wants. I turn back to my clients and smile. Chapter 19 Cal Seriously, man, it's great to meet you. I know I sound like a fanboy, but fuck it. I definitely am. I can't believe we never ran into each other at school. Turns out Pete Harris and I were in college at the same time, although he was a year ahead of me. It was a small enough engineering program. I must have been too blinded by partying to notice the people around me. This guy founded a multi-million dollar artificial intelligence empire while I, what? Fucked the servers at my favorite sandwich shops for nine years and did whatever grunt work my family sent my way. This guy took initiative. Pete and I drift away from Logan's asshole co-workers to grab another drink for him and an actual drink for me, since my dad took mine. I really wasn't going to come tonight, he says, rolling his eyes. 
bunch of rich folks gushing about how their financial advisors are making them richer. Good networking opportunity for Beagle, though, right? He grins. Why? You know someone looking to invest? I'm about to laugh and remind him that I am hardly in a position to talk with rich folks about their money when I see James and his date sliding toward us. Pete groans. Ah, crap, they found me again. Yeah, that guy definitely sucks. I agree, glaring daggers at James as he approaches us with a fake smile on his face. Calvin, right? Great to see you again. Where's Logan? It's Cal, and she's with her admirers. I smile, noticing how Logan is swarmed by satisfied clients, who seem to be pulling in other party guests to gush over her big-ass brain and the way she applies it to their finances. She? A girl named Logan? That's so weird. James's date wrinkles her nose as James snickers. My eyes snap over to her. My name is Callum Amon, I say. Is that weird, too? She laughs again, thinking I made a joke, I guess. But I don't smile, and her face shifts. I set my glass down on the table and turn toward Peter. I've got to go rescue my girl from the masses, I tell him, jerking my head over toward Logan. I reach into my pocket for the single business card I printed for just this occasion. I didn't want to give him anything branded with Beltane in case my father got word that I'm having this conversation. I look down at the neat black letters of my name, my professional certifications, and my email. I remember how much harder it was for me to pass my professional engineering exams than it was for my brothers and Orla. I never used the P.E. in my email signature or anything at work. It's a bit of a sore spot, actually because my dad didn't want the company to foot the bill for me to sit the exam. Uncle Kellen had to remind my father that it looks good for Beltane to have a deep roster of engineers with professional credentials. Neither of them made the arguments that I should be able to take the exam for my own career development, of course. And if I'm being honest with myself, I haven't done anything to make good on that investment for them. I sigh and push those thoughts right back down as I slide the card to Pete. Hit me up sometime, I tell him. I'd love to hear more about those fuel sensors. Pete takes the card as James frowns warily. I'll do that, Pete says, sticking my card in his jacket pocket. That makes me feel better than if he'd put it in his pants pocket, for some reason. Seems more serious. Good luck with your Bronco, Pete says, shaking my hand. The fact that he remembers which model car I drive tells me he was definitely into our conversation earlier. I was totally geeking out telling him how long I've been working to refurbish the fuel lines in my ancient Big Red. I try not to dwell on how amazing it would be to sink my fists into a similar project with an autonomous vehicle. Feeling high on the encounter with Pete, I slide back over to Logan, whose cheeks are rosy and who seems uncomfortable from the past hour of praise she's been having to endure. As I walk toward her, I notice a whole bunch of tightly pursed lips from other folks from Logan's company. I can't believe they're all actually this petty, giving Logan this much shit because she's obviously really fucking good at her job. My dad's always talking about how some people surround themselves with people who challenge them, and other people are so desperate to cling to their piece of the pie, they shove down others around them. Logan has landed at a company that's trying to hold her head beneath the water. She absolutely shines because she's totally genuine, and the clients can all tell. I'm sure they can also tell the rest of these finance folks are miserable. I've had just about enough alcohol to speak up about it, but then I hear my dad. This is the gal I was telling you about, Rudy. She lives with my boy Cal. Remember my middle son? Dad sidles up to me with the guy his age at his side. He looks familiar, but I can't place him. Denny Rudy, he says, shaking my hand. There's a bit of a hush at the mention of his name and the people surrounding Logan all fizzle out of their conversations as they turn to look at the man pumping my hand. You look just like your old man did at your age, Cal, he says. Then he points to my dad. I always was telling him to get a haircut. Dad laughs and runs a hand along his thinning, short hair. It's gone completely white in recent years, and the look is pretty good on him. I'm glad he didn't dye it like he always said he was going to. Dad looks at Logan. Have you met Denny yet? I know he said he just signed on with you guys. Logan pales a little and shakes her head, 
then takes a big breath. So good to meet you, Mr. Rudy. I don't think Mr. Alexander has finalized the team for your portfolio yet. Mr. Rudy was my father, he says, holding his drink toward her in a toast. Please, call me Denny. Mickey here was just telling me you're a genius. Oh, she absolutely is? The woman who had been gushing over Logan earlier chimes in, and the crowd that had been yakking her ear off all starts murmuring in agreement. Dad perks up. Rudy, I've got Logan here taking care of my grandson's future. Did I tell you I'm going to be a grandpop? You already? Which kid is it? Denny looks at me, and I start shaking my head. My brother Liam, I say. Sometime next spring. Denny starts pulling up pictures of his own grandkids on his phone and showing them around to Dad and the other people nearby. I lean in to Logan. They're drawn to you like moths to a flame, Lo. Logan waves her hand at me like she's trying to shoo me away. But I just step closer to her. Seriously, you're the main event tonight, hands down. She looks down at her drink and nods. Is anyone from the office looking? I'm really trying not to make waves. I take a look around the room, and basically everyone in here is staring at Logan, my dad, and Denny. Logan's co-workers from the bar are all staring major daggers at her, and I remembered that they're all vying to be the account managers for the Rudy family. It all clicks together, and I remember that this guy owns the Iron Men, a professional football team in a city where football is church. I know Beltane keeps a set of season tickets my dad and uncle use when they're trying to woo new clients or impress existing ones. Or, I guess, trying to buy off boat repair guys. I somehow forgot my dad is apparently besties with the team owner. I try to distract Logan and ask, Hey, Dad, how do you and Denny know each other anyway? Denny throws his head back, laughing. What was it, Mick, thirty years ago? He was being a loudmouth during the mayoral race. My dad cracks a grin. There were some issues with the tax structure for small businesses then, Dad says. He shrugs. We were just starting out, and I favored the candidate who was easy on the wallet, tax-wise. I met Denny here at the victory party after the election. Denny tosses an arm around Dad's shoulder and tells the crowd how Mick Brady has always known how to have fun, so he asked Dad to come along when the Iron Men had an exhibition game in Japan. Always knows how to have fun. The words sink in deep. The exact same words people say about me, paired with never knows how to be serious. Christ, I'm turning into my father. What am I, two years away from two baby mamas like him? I stare at my dad while everyone keeps talking, remembering that much like Pete Harris, my dad is the ultimate entrepreneur. He and my uncle were younger than me when they started Beltane. Then he shrugs and keeps talking about taking my dad to Japan. We wanted community and business leaders to go with us on the trip and sell Pittsburgh as a good place for Japanese companies to do business. Then he gestures at me with his drink. Your dad was in charge of making sure everyone had a good time, even if they didn't speak the same language. I did a damn fine job of it, too, Dad says, and Denny laughs again. At one point, Mick was up in the cockpit flying the plane, then he says. And before you ask, no, he absolutely does not have a pilot's license. You were flying the plane? Logan is riveted and looks horrified at the thought of my dad taking the controls. This story just sounds like par for the course for my dad. Him shooting the shit, silently observing everyone. I'm sure he left the experience with a million new contracts for Beltane. Solving problems people revealed on the sly when they thought they were all just talking about sushi. When I take the controls, I just crash into trees. Mick Brady works his way into doing things most people wouldn't even think to ask about. Then he says, but damn it, the man knows how to build lasting relationships. Aw, oh, shucks, Denny. Dad nudges his shoulder. You're just trying to butter me up so I go easy on you on the back nine. I'm desperate to get away from this. Once they pivot to golf, I know they'll be here for hours, so I lean in to ask Logan if she needs another drink. She nods, and I go grab us something lighter, since I feel like I already had too much whiskey. I'm heading back with a pair of highballs, extra soda, when I see some douchey guy talking to Logan. 
He's young and looks mean, so he must be a co-worker and not a client. She bites her lip and looks like she's in agony. She's mentioned a few times that she's always expecting people to be pranking her, pretending they want to do something social with her and setting her up to look like a fool when she says yes. I'm sure these fuckers are pissed off that she's getting so much attention from the white whale client, especially since her office seems like they're more interested in brown-nosing than putting the best person on the job. Hey, Lolo, I say, stepping between her and the douche. Can it wait? I was just asking Miss Miller here for her secrets. He winks at me dismissively, and I ball my hand into a fist at my side. I set the drinks on a high table nearby and reach for Logan's hand. Sorry, dude. Logan saves all her secrets for me. I wink right back at him, and he glowers. Who even knows what he was about to say to her if he got her alone? I give Logan's ass a squeeze, and I see my dad notice and give me a strange look. I don't really care right now that my dad and his golf buddies are here to witness me getting hot for my roommate. If I wasn't already half stiff at the sight of her in that damn dress with no bra, I'm definitely the rest of the way there seeing how every client she works with seems to idolize her. Competence born, I think the phrase is. I'm watching it, and Logan's the star of my fantasies right now. Never thinks about the consequences, acts before he thinks. I know I'm traveling a dangerous road with Logan. I've known it the day since I moved in, and I guess what they all say is true. But I don't care. I have to touch her right now. Have to. Come on, Lo, I say, pulling her toward the dance floor in the middle of the space. Hardly anyone is out there. A few older couples reliving their youth as the band plays some jazz. Nice to have met you, Denny, Logan says as I take her away. You kids have fun he says, already turning back toward the crowd of suits. I'm amped up on adrenaline from meeting Pete Harris, rattled about meeting my dad's friend, and I've had just enough whiskey that I'm not thinking too hard about the ramifications of pulling Logan tight against me while we start to dance. Her eyes go wide as I tug her in close and spin her slowly around the room. You smell nice, I tell her in the most inadequate possible response to the fully intoxicating aroma of her. She smells like whiskey and mint, and I can tell she dabbed on some sort of perfume because I inhale something musky right near her ear. It doesn't feel wrong. It feels incredibly right, actually, to be holding her. Thrilling and sexy and perfect. Logan rests her cheek on my shoulder as we move, her fingers clasped tight in my left hand, and I remember again that she's not wearing a bra. I concentrate until I can feel her nipples pebbled against me through my dress shirt. With the hand around her waist, I squeeze her a little tighter against me, wanting her to feel how hard I am right now. When she gasps, I know she's figured it out, and she looks up at me, her face full of questions. Do you want to get out of here, Lo? I need her to say yes. I need to take her back to our place and fuck her and get it over with, because we're done pretending to be together after tonight. At the moment, I don't care if she makes me move out tomorrow. If I have to go stay with my dad or my uncle or sleep in my car, I just need to do something with all this energy I feel when I look at her or think about her or, Christ, feel her luscious ass with my fingertips as we dance. Yes, she says and a wave of heat and relief rolls through me. I don't hesitate for a second. I barrel toward the door, pulling her along without a glance back. Chapter 20 Logan Cal calls for a car as we walk through the lobby. When we're outside, he presses me up against a brick column, his chest heaving as he breathes. I don't know how to describe the look in his eyes, except he seems like he's starving, and I'm what he wants to eat. Do you know how sexy you are, Logan? He brings a hand up and strokes my face, and his touch sends sparks shooting through my body. I shiver and lick my lips. Oh, Logan, he says, more of a growl. A car pulls up, and he looks as it slows to a stop. 
He opens the back door for me and I slide across, then yelp when I realize he slid in right up against me. Not even saying hello to the driver. Cal, I hiss, you have to wear a seatbelt. He wriggles beside me and finds the center seatbelt, clicking it into place and leaving his hand between us, fingers rubbing at my upper thigh. He slowly manages to bunch up the material of my dress and reaches across with his other hand to slide a palm up my leg. This dress is killing me, Logan. Cal's voice is deep and smooth as the whiskey he gave me earlier and makes me feel just as warm inside. I'm still shocked that he seems to be on the same wavelength as me, that he is attracted to me the way that I've figured out I am definitely attracted to him. What happens if we do this? I ask him, biting my lip, clutching the armrest on the door on my side of the car, afraid that if I touch him, I won't be able to stop. Terrified, he will look at me and laugh, asking what I mean by this. Cal shrugs. We figure it out, he says. All I know is I can't go another second without tasting you. The words are barely out of his mouth before his lips crash against mine. His jaw moves slowly and he moans into my mouth. I feel like my skin is on fire, like a lump in my throat has exploded, and the energy of that is radiating through my body into Cal's. I press my lips back against his, curious about the sensations this is building in my body. I feel my heart racing, even faster when he slips his tongue inside my mouth. I gasp at the feel of it, wet and hot, exploring. He isn't just tasting me right now. He's claiming me with his mouth, moving into the space of my body. And I like it. I like it so much I forget to worry about the driver seeing us. I forget to worry about what it might mean to let go of control in this situation. I pick up the hand I had fisted in my lap and squeeze Cal's leg, loving the feel of him beneath my fingers. He moans again, and I love thinking I produced that sound by touching him. I'm startled when the car slows to a stop and the driver clears his throat. Cal pulls back and grins, a megawatt smile that leaves me as breathless as his kiss. Sorry about all that, man, Cal says, slapping some cash in the driver's hand before he backs out of the car and leans in to reach for me. I'm actually not sorry. I stumble out after him, tripping and wobbling in my heels as he gives up on the elevator and pulls me up the stairs, through the door of our condo at last. Cal, I breathe, feeling the world turn upside down as he scoops me off my feet and plunks me on the counter. I wasn't done tasting you, he says, peeling out of his suit coat and loosening his tie. I liked how he looked in the suit, but I love seeing him now, disheveled and glassy-eyed, standing between my legs, it doesn't feel forbidden or even like a bad idea. It just feels necessary. Oh, I say, oh, yes, Cal. He starts licking my throat, and I clutch his shoulders, groaning when I feel his teeth nipping at my skin. Take off that dress, Logan, he says. I can't. I needed you to help with the zipper before, remember? I lean back, gripping the edge of the counter with one hand and trying to twist my arm behind my back. Fuck it, he growls and tosses my skirt up around my waist. And he falls back asleep, petting my hair again. God, I like that. As dawn breaks, I lie in his bed pondering all the new things I just learned about my body. Cal tore me to pieces with pleasure four times last night. I've never even succeeded in getting there once on my own. I realize now that whatever I was doing was just not complete. Every time I would try, I felt this increasing urge, almost like I had to pee, and I could tell there was something else just out of reach that I could never quite find. But I thought that was it, and I was shockingly wrong. There is so much pleasure inside me. I had no idea. What does it mean that my roommate helped me get there? What does it mean about all the other aspects of my life where I've held back? Something has shifted tonight. 
I don't know if Cal fucked me to a spiritual awakening, or if I just had some sort of epiphany thanks to his family and him supporting me. But I feel like I've seen a different way of being, and I don't know what to do with myself. I try to climb out of bed so I can go sit in the living room with a cup of tea and think about it. I'm unable to move, though. I look down to see Cal's arm locked around my waist like a seatbelt, holding me against him while his chin nuzzles into my shoulder. I come to full awareness and feel his breath tickling my ear as he sleeps. This is my first time waking up beside someone in this way. It feels nice and comforting and concerning all at once because Callie is not supposed to be my lover. He's not actually my boyfriend. Cal is my roommate, my tenant, actually, whose rent money I send home to my mother for her rent money so she can cut back to just one job. I sigh. This feels wrong. There's a power differential here, and that's not okay. Cal, I say, shaking his arm. He grunts and digs his chin in a little deeper. I remember that we are both naked as I feel his erection thickening along my butt. What a predicament. Cal, let me up, I hiss, and he blinks and wiggles, slowly becoming conscious. Strong, Logan. He cracks one eye open and studies me. He loosens his grip on me but doesn't retract his arm. Don't you want to cuddle? I actually would like that very much, I realize, but it's still a bad idea. So I shake my head and extract myself from the bed. I stoop to gather up my dress, remembering with a flush that my panties are on the floor in the kitchen. Cal rolls over and mutters something, and I soon hear him softly snoring, telling me he's fallen back asleep. He normally gets up early to run on the weekends, but I guess he was planning to skip that today. I run down the hall to my room, feeling strange moving through my own house, naked, and I take a shower. As my hands move over my body, I remember last night in vivid flashes of heat. I scrub my skin, but feel Cal's mouth and fingers on me instead, causing me to rush and get dressed. It won't do to linger on those thoughts. Voices sneak into my thoughts. The older women who waitressed with my mother at the diner saying to her, it don't do no good to linger. Sometimes a handsome customer would leave a note or a phone number along with his tip but my mother never called. Men are too much trouble, was the mantra of my youth. I gather up the panties from the floor in the kitchen, stuffing them in my back pants pocket as I spray cleaner on the counter and wipe it down, trying to turn off the memories of me thrashing around up there like a rabid animal, while Cal's face was buried between my thighs. I make a cup of tea and drink it, and Cal still hasn't emerged from the bedroom, so I decide I'll open up my laptop and check through my work emails. Maybe I'll review the market analysis and get a jump on this week's client work. Right now, the sex and the decision to stop letting people at work steamroll me feel related. But the more I think about it, the more I decide they don't have to be. Cal and I were scratching an itch last night, both attracted to each other. He said a few times that he wanted to show me what it meant to have good sex. Mission accomplished. We should focus on our friendship. His family is helping me stand up for myself at work, after all. His mom seemed serious about helping me contact HR. I can help him mend fences with his dad. We can't work on those things if we're also navigating a romantic relationship while living together. It's too much. I sip the tea. Feeling better now and in control again. Cal is my friend. I need to focus on making changes at work. Yes, this seems like something Sally and Linus McClinton would approach together. But then I remember that Sally and Linus are lovers. And The Red Coat is a romance novel. I shake my head and try to focus on my inbox. I nearly drop my mug when I see the number of emails flashing at me. Half of my clients sent notes about enjoying spending time with me at the event last night, and the other half sent messages mentioning they'd been talking to one another and are interested in increasing their investments to match some of the portfolios I set up for their friends. For a social event, 
Last night seemed to prompt a lot of business conversations. Maybe that's normal. I'd probably know if I felt like I could approach my coworkers to ask them. Scrolling down further, I see a message from Dennis Rudy with the subject, New Account Manager. I bite my lip and open the email, seeing that it's addressed to Mr. Alexander, the big boss, and I'm copied. The message is brief and to the point, addressed to my boss's boss and sent late last night. Nate, lovely event this evening. Enjoyed meeting my new account manager. Mick Brady and Mary Emerson assure me she's top notch. Have your people call my people to set up a time. D.R. I stare at the screen, not sure what on earth to make of this. I snort out a laugh at the folly of thinking I could fly under the radar at work, sitting quietly in my office and just analyzing the best path ahead for my clients. Without even trying, and without any awareness, I seem to have landed the white whale. I also know that this news is not going to do me any favors socially. I feel like a pariah at work. Devin is sort of decent to me, but everyone else just acts like I'm an unwelcome backpack they have to carry through a theme park. I close my eyes and bring up the voices of Cal's family, assuring me that my employer should be supportive and creating a collaborative environment. Such a different message than I've received my entire life from a mother doing her best to overcome a mountain of hard luck. I've been thinking about Mick's comment in my office, that I need to stand up for myself at work. I'm not even sure what that would look like. I know all the rules of the game when it comes to actually calculating what's best for my clients and their individual tolerance for risk. But when it comes to my colleagues, there seems to be some sort of playbook full of terminology and behaviors that nobody gave me. I've felt unprepared for every social interaction my entire life, and there's nothing I hate more than feeling unprepared, whether that's for a dinner party or a class or a meeting at work. But I can't control how my coworkers act or evidently Dennis Rudy's preferences for who manages his account. What I can do is prepare to walk into work on Monday, ready to talk numbers with Mr. Alexander. I've spent the past five years honing my analyst skills. I need to let go of worrying about the other stuff and focus on what I do best. I take a deep breath, read Mr. Rudy's email again, and decide I'm going to spend the day researching him, his family, and his financial holdings. I know tomorrow will bring a boatload of unpleasant interactions with my coworkers, but at least I can go into the inevitable meeting with Mr. Alexander, ready to take off running. Chapter 23 Cal She left? I wake up expecting to see her still here in my bed, but I remember that she left sometime in the middle of the night. What the hell do I do with that? If I'm honest, I have no idea what I would have done if she were here when I woke up. But somehow, knowing she was freaked out enough to leave makes me feel more alone. I'm afraid to leave my bedroom. I lie in my bed for hours longer than I want, hoping I'll hear Logan leave the condo so I can grab some food and mope. I feel like the worst kind of scumbag after giving in to my irresponsible lust for her. I can practically feel all my brothers telling me this was careless and impulsive. Typical Cal giving in to a desire just because it's there, tempting me. But damn it, last night didn't feel impulsive. Nothing about that was anything like previous encounters where I fucked first and dealt with consequences later. I don't think the intensity I felt last night was one-sided, but of course I didn't have a conversation about that with Logan. I got into this mess on a whim, signing a lease without meeting my new landlord-slash-roommate. God, what if she throws me out now? What did she say earlier when she woke up? I cringe, remembering that I asked her to cuddle. Eventually, I don't hear anything for a long enough time that it seems safe for me to at least go to the bathroom. I pee for what feels like a decade and make my way into the kitchen, freezing when I see Logan on the couch with her computer, 
typing furiously and nodding her head along with whatever's flowing through her headphones. I consider just dashing out the front door like a coward, but two things pull me over to sit on the couch beside her. First, I'm worried that she's listening to our audiobook without me. Second, I know I have to talk to her about what we did last night, even if it sucks and feels too big and uncomfortable. I plunk down next to her and nudge her with my shoulder, realizing that I should probably have put on a shirt or at least some pants before approaching this conversation. I sigh, shaking my head at myself, while she pauses whatever she's jamming to. Oh, sorry, she says. I didn't hear you come out. Her eyes widen when she sees that I'm just wearing boxers, and I try to stuff a pillow on my lap and reclaim a tiny shred of dignity. Just making sure you weren't listening to the McClintons without me. I would never. She seems insulted as she pats my arm. Although, can we listen to a chapter? I'm dying to know what happens in the battle. Nicole convinced us to crank up the audio speed to 1.5 so we could ingest more on our commute, and then Logan and I agreed we could handle 1.75 speed. We've been flying through and are almost done with book two at this point. The Revolutionary War is in full swing since we heard the spicy bits on our commute. Linus is about to swear allegiance to the Colonial Army, about to leave his red coat in the mud back at the British camp. I grin, loving how into this story we both are. Sure, Lo, but I just want to do, you know. I scratch my head and she stares at me. Are we cool? Oh, she says closing the laptop and setting it on the coffee table. I think so. It was just a one-time thing, right? She shrugs, and I feel a lump of dread press down on my shoulders. She's right, sure. It would be dumb to dive into something romantic when we're just getting to know each other as roommates. But damn it, something about hearing her say it was a one-and-done makes me want to drag her down the hall and take her again even though I absolutely know the right thing to do is keep things friendly between us. I take a deep breath and nod. Right, one night. We stare at each other for a bit, not talking, until Logan grabs her phone and cues up the audiobook. I sit next to her, wanting to drape my arm around her shoulders while we listen, but keeping my posture stiff and awkward so we don't touch. The story hits an exciting part involving surgery after a battle when the audio cuts out and a robotic voice announces, Incoming text message from Nicole, Cal's brother's girlfriend. I bark out a laugh at Logan's contact label. She'd shit if she knew you were identifying her by her relationship status, I say, finally nudging Logan with my shoulder, like I always do when I'm teasing her or giving her shit. Logan rolls her eyes. I know, I know. I keep meaning to ask you what her name is. Oh. She waves a hand to shush me as the phone reads the message to us. Bitch, please tell me you are coming to Brady family dinner tonight. As you know, I am hosting. Don't plan on swimming in the pool. Apparently Liam and Maddie fucked in it. Neither of us seems to know what to say in response to that message, and we stare at each other for a long time before we burst out laughing. The air feels better after that, like we're back to old times. What time is dinner? Logan frowns at her laptop. I have a big meeting tomorrow I need to prepare for today. I glance up at the clock above the television. Lo, it's only noon. You've got at least four hours before we have to head over there. She nods. Okay, good. I want to go over everything at least once more so that I don't get nervous tomorrow morning. She tells me how she's been voluntold she'll manage the big account with my dad's golf buddy, Denny. Personally, I think it's great, because Logan is clearly amazing at what she does, and the clients think she breathes sunshine and farts gold coins. Listen, I tell her, Nicole Kennedy is just the woman you want to give you a pep talk before that sort of thing. I pat her leg and stand up so I can go change and hopefully get a run in before we leave. I'm glad you're coming along tonight. Honestly, it'd be weird going to family dinner without you after... everything. She smiles sort of stiffly and reaches for her laptop again, and I head back to my room to get dressed. 
It's a warm day, and I decide not to wear a shirt. I also realize as soon as I step into the hall that I've forgotten my keys. But at least I've got my phone on me, so I can call Logan to let me in when I get back. I try not to dwell on the fact that I'm such a big cliché. I've always been like this. And I know that's because it's the huge family party line. Cal's irresponsible. Cal's always making a joke, good for a laugh, but not someone you rely on. Growing up, when Mom left Dad, shit was super tense at home. Liam was already the surly kid. Then Zach showed up, and then his mom left too. Everyone was sulking around being bossy all the damn time. Me and my dad were just wired differently, I guess. Only thing is, everyone views my dad's quirky shit as some stroke of genius, where every story about pistachios eventually winds up being related to him investing in efficient agricultural engineering technology or some shit. When I fuck up rushing through the math on an inspection report because I can't stand it for another second, I'm just being careless. Dad was friendly enough last night that I'm thinking he might be over the boat situation. But that still doesn't change the fact that I'm more tolerated at work than valued. I have to tread carefully if I'm going to actually have a conversation with Pete Harris outside of the fancy party with Logan. I want to make a career change so bad I can smell the idea burning in my gut. But I just don't see a way to do that. I work for my family, with my family, in a city where my family apparently knows literally everyone. Leaving Beltane would look like just another impulsive, reckless cow move to them. I shake off that thought and turn to run back toward the condo. I can't worry about leaving Beltane yet. Hell, I don't even know if Pete is hiring. I gotta get through family dinner first. Chapter 24 Logan Cal drives us to Nicole and Zach's house for Brady family dinner, and when he lets himself in the front door, we're slammed by a wall of noise from inside. Are there way more Brady's here than last time? I was worried coming here would be strange. Like his entire family would be able to tell we had slept together. But Cal hasn't really brought it up, so I think we are carrying on as if it had not happened. Maybe it really was a one-time thing. Similar to the one time Cal and I rented bicycles and rode around some of the trails for an hour. Did we discuss that afterward? Not really. It's better that way. And I really liked going to the last Brady function. I barely paused from my meeting prep to eat today. And I'm feeling a little woozy. So I'm not sure what to make of all the loud yelling and... Is that crying? Before Cal can answer me, a pair of sock-clad kids streaks up the hall and they slip on the hardwood floors, falling in a heap at our feet, punching each other. All right, Cal exclaims. These are definitely stag kids. Stag? Like baby deer or like... Cal surprises me by bending down and picking up the boys, one in each arm. That's enough, you two. Which ones are you, huh? The kids are still scrapping, reaching around Cal and trying to get in a few more smacks. A man comes around the corner and I gasp, reaching out for Cal's arm. Oh my God, Ty Stagg is here. I turn to face Cal. You know Ty Stagg? I don't follow a lot of professional sports, and I never made time to go to any games. Not that I could have afforded the tickets, but growing up in Johnstown, PA, Everyone lived and breathed the Pittsburgh sports teams. Ty Stagg took the Fury to a few championship wins before he retired to be a stay-home dad. I'm standing there staring at the man with my mouth hanging open when he walks up to us, gesturing for his kids. And then, like an idiot, I place my hand in his outstretched one, pumping it up and down. Ty grins, and I pull my arm back. He says, Pleasure to meet you, Cal's friend. Oh, sorry, man, Cal hands Ty the children, who climb up Ty like he's a tree. This is my roommate, Logan Miller. Big fan of yours, apparently. Well, like I said, pleasure to meet you, he tilts his head to the side, studying me. Did you not know this was a double family dinner? Nicole did not mention that. Nope. Cal reaches out and ruffles the hair of each of the boys, who I can now tell look exactly like their father. 
Ah, Ty says. Well, Nicole double booked herself for family dinner, so she just invited both families. He shrugs. Happens sometimes. He turns and walks toward the epicenter of the noise, and I follow behind when Cal does. Ty disappears into the crowd, and Cal moves to walk toward his brothers when I grab for his shirt. Wait, I say. You can't just leave me alone. There's a celebrity here. He blinks a few times and then shakes his head. Sorry, you just fit in so well with my family last time. I honestly forgot you don't know all this. Okay. He puts an arm around my shoulder and I tell myself the heat I feel from our connection is just due to the house being warm. Cal points across the crowded room. Over there is Nicole's boss, Tim Stagg. He owns Stag Law, and his wife Alice is the pregnant one over there. He points to a curly-haired woman standing and gesturing at Maddie's stomach. Tim and Alice have at least two of the boys roaming around here. Then we've got Emma and Thatcher Stag. She's the redhead, and he's the man bun. They've also got two boys. Wow, I'm just realizing how many boys there are. You met Ty and two of his. I think he and Juniper may have another one. It's probably a boy. When I look at Ty, he has a third child on his shoulders, and he's laughing animatedly with Liam, offering him some of the children to hold. Liam doesn't accept, which makes Zach laugh. I see Nicole over in the kitchen with Uncle Kellen, stirring a giant pot of food, and Mick is in deep conversation with a tall woman who seems really familiar. I gesture toward her. Who is that? That's Juniper. Judge Juniper Jones, Cal says. Oh, I've read about her, I tell him. In graduate school, actually. She's an Olympian and grew up in the foster care system. I remember taking a women in business elective, and Juniper was featured as a case study for her work with women's sports teams, helping them to get fair funding. When I read Juniper's quotes about having grown up struggling financially and how that experience informed first her legal practice and now her work on the bench, I felt so inspired, like I wasn't the only woman to reach up for something different. I sigh. I can't believe these are the people Cal hangs out with, casually. Celebrities, career professionals, it all feels so foreign. I'm on the verge of a panic attack about it when Nicole sees me and squeals. Oh, Logan, you made it. She rushes around the counter and pulls me in for a hug. Did this doofus introduce you? Oh, he told me who everyone is, but I didn't get to. Hey, everyone, Nicole whistles and cuts me off. The room goes silent, except for the kids, who are somehow all trying to physically maim each other. This is Logan. She and Cal are just friends. She throws her head back and cackles. I turn beet red at Nicole's joke, but nobody seems to notice. There are a few snorts of laughter, and the Bradys tip their glasses in my direction, and then the talking resumes. Nicole procures a drink from somewhere and hands it to me. Kellen took over with the spaghetti, and Alice brought all the salad and bread and stuff, so now we just get toasted and watch Liam and Maddie squirm while all the stags offer them parenting advice. Oh, that sounds uncomfortable. I take a sip of the drink. Wow, this is amazing. What is it? My friends I was telling you about, those ladies who take no shit, one of them owns a bar and is teaching me some things. I'm telling you, you need to hang out with me. Have you been reading the book? Cal reappears over my shoulder. Nicole Kennedy, you slight dog. You've got us totally hooked. We're about to finish up the sequel. You went ahead? No fair. You're supposed to wait for the group, she says. And then she and Cal dive into a heated discussion of revolutionary politics in the 18th century. I sip my drink and nod along with them until Kellen announces that dinner is served. Come with me, Nicole says tugging me to her sun porch. Trust me, you want to wait out the rush back here until all the kids get released into my backyard. Did you see what my Isaac did back there? She gestures out the window at the beautiful landscaping with a view of the river, telling me how she met the Brady family when half her yard dropped away in a landslide, which the youngest Brady boy repaired for her. Like I said earlier, though, 
Don't go swimming until I disinfect. Liam told me they conceived the baby in my stock tank pool. I'd hate them if I didn't think that was pretty badass. By the time we talk through the features of the trendy, Pinterest-worthy galvanized steel pool, complete with white rocks and a hot tub feature, the scrum at the spaghetti buffet has died down, and we can grab our own plates. I sit down next to Nicole, and am surprised when Mick slides into the chair next to mine. Nicole has set up a bunch of folding tables and chairs in a U-shape to accommodate everyone, and it feels simultaneously formal and totally laid back as everyone digs in and continues their loud conversations. Mick grins at Nicole. Nikki, did Logan here tell you about her big work news? She arches a brow at him and he waves his hand. Aw, oh, come on. If an old man can't call you Nikki, what pleasures do I have left in life? I assume his news is that he came on as a client at my firm. But I'm stunned and touched when he explains that his buddy, Denny Rudy, insisted on me being the analyst who handles his investments. Nicole grips the edge of the table with both hands and beams. Logan, that's fucking amazing. You're such a badass. Way to go with your financial skills. I bite my lip and hope they'll move on and talk about something else. I'm sure it's just because Denny is friends with Mick. I force out a laugh. Nepotism. I didn't tell him a thing, Logan. The broads at that shindig think you breathe diamonds, sweetheart. Mick grins and shakes his head, then leans the other way to talk with Tim about the joys of having three sons. But of course, I can't stop thinking about whether what he said is true. I feel tears threaten at the idea of my clients saying such nice things about me. I absolutely cannot fall apart like I did in front of Cal's mom. That was a mess. Nicole leans toward me. What's with the face? Talk to me. I take a deep breath. I'm really new at work, I tell her. I'm not trying to rock the boat. Getting this big client, it's going to make people really jealous. I realize how juvenile it sounds as I'm saying it. But the atmosphere at the office has been so heavy, and I already have enough heavy shit in my life without having to walk on eggshells each time I open my office door. All of my resolve from early this morning slides away in the light of day, and I'm back to feeling like a tourist in my own life. Nicole sneers. Well, fuck them, then. If your colleagues wanted better clients, they should be better at their job. I blink at her a few times and burst out laughing. I've never been around anyone young who is as blunt as Nicole. It's refreshing. She's like all the old ladies my mom worked with, but not bitter. I wish I could take that attitude about it. It's just so hard. I had really been hoping to lay low this first year, really get myself settled with the accounts they gave me when I was hired. I had hoped to let the other guys sort of duke it out over the Rudy account. I trail off, hearing what I sound like. For someone who worked as hard as I did to maintain perfect grades and keep my scholarship and then repeat the same process for my fellowship in graduate school, it sounds ridiculous to hide. I sigh as Nicole rolls her eyes. You said, guys? You work with mostly dudes, right? Enough said. Let me guess, the few women who do work there are total assholes to you? I give a little nod, and Nicole barrels on ahead. I already told you, I worked in tech. I am very familiar with this episode of the Patriarchy Show. She slugs back the rest of her drink and points at me with her fork. You need to come to Bridges and Bitters for foof. Foof? Nicole nods. Fresh out of fucks. F-O-O-F. Foof. It's a group of women committed to releasing our last fuck into the breeze and grabbing life by the horns. But instead of slamming all the doors shut behind us, we help other women release their fucks, too. Oh my gosh, Nick, are you talking about foof again? I really need to get back to one of the meetings. Emma Stagg had been pacing behind us, holding one of her sleeping sons over her shoulder, and paused behind Nicole. She sort of waves at me with one hand. I'm Emma. 
I haven't gotten to meet you formally yet. I'm up to my elbows in baby mucus, but Foof totally supported me when I broke up with my publisher and started self-publishing my books a few years ago. Nicole beams and takes a big bite of her dinner. Asshole publisher tried to say our Emma here was only worth a $100 marketing budget. What was your latest royalty check, Ems? Emma sort of hides her cheek behind the baby's head, but I hear her say, I was able to hire an assistant to help with my administrative work, since I'm technically still on maternity leave. That's incredible, I say, looking around the room. Everyone here is so accomplished. I feel out of place. Uh, hello? Did you not just woo the owner of the Pittsburgh Iron Men with your brain powers? I shrug and bite my lip, unaccustomed to talking about my achievements at work. I have a feeling it's going to take a lot of work to feel at ease among Cal's family. But as I look around the room again, blushing when Cal winks at me, I decide the effort will be totally worthwhile. Chapter 25 Cal Hey, Uncle Callum. I wade toward my uncle where he's helping Alice navigate food prep. I wave a grocery bag at him. I found this old car manual when I was unpacking my stuff. Thought maybe Jake would dig it. The kid across the street from my uncle is obsessed with engines. Reminds me of me in some ways. And my uncle has the hots for the kid's mom. So I figure everyone wins when I saved this old Bronco manual from the landfill. Kellen's face totally shifts, and he smiles at me for the first time in weeks. That's really thoughtful of you, Callum. I shrug. Where's your stuff? I'll set it down for you so you don't have to clean your hands. He's got tomato sauce splattered all over his front, and he chuckles, shaking his head a bit as Alice whirs past with something fragrant. Thank you, son. I'll let him know it's from you. I make my way to the heap of coats and bags in the laundry room, and find my uncle's stuff before heading back into the dining room to grab a beer. While I'm making amends here, I decide I'm going to go stand near my dad and refuse to move until he talks to me. Maybe I should apologize to kick things off. I don't freaking know anymore. I grab a beer for me and a tea for my dad as a peace offering, but then I get distracted when I hear Logan laughing. I'm drawn toward the sound of her voice captivated by the look of her talking to all the important women in my life. I hadn't expected to feel anything at all watching her interact with my family. But she sits there having a heart-to-heart, -heart, and I can hear the women periodically shouting encouragement to Logan. And now I find myself here next to my dad with a heart on. This makes no sense. I tell myself my body is still experiencing aftershocks from last night. Hello, Callum. Dad snaps his fingers in my ear and I turn toward him. Sorry, Dad. What's that again? He sighs. Where's your head today? Did you tie one on last night after the party? No, Dad, I'm just distracted. It's loud in here. That's true. Dad glances at the herd of baby stags fighting in the backyard. Twenty bucks says one of them is bleeding before Kellen and Alice serve dessert. I wave a hand, mimicking one of my dad's old man moves. That's not a bet. That's a certainty. Honestly, it's good to have him talking to me again. I should say something to him about the boat incident, but it feels so calm right now just chatting with him while I stare at Logan. So instead, we stare out the back patio door as one of the kids face plants in the rocks around Nicole's pool. The kid bursts into tears, and Ty and Thatcher hurry over to his side. See? Dad smiles as Ty pulls a pack of bandages from his jeans pocket. So anyway, son, like I was saying, I'm concerned about the long-term project over at the steel plant. I know the project he's referring to. Beltane is a guy working there full-time to monitor the equipment, checking everything out. These machines are the size of city blocks, and having something go down could cost millions of dollars a day. Something isn't sitting right with me about Tony's reports. I raise a brow at my dad. Since when do you look at the paperwork? Don't get smart with me. I talked to your uncle. I'm telling you, Tony needs someone to look after his work. You want me to go ride herd on Tony? He's got ten years on me, Dad. My dad frowns. I didn't say ride herd, but the last time I talked with him, Tony was going through a rough patch at home. I worry what that means for his concentration. And he's all alone there. 
Dad swallows a big gulp of water and smacks his lips appreciatively. I'd like you to shadow him this week. Your uncle is aware. I don't bother arguing that I have no desire to spend a week in a steel plant measuring the rust on eye beams. I'm being banished there, and it occurs to me that this is him telling me what's going to happen as a result of the boat crash. I'm the family fuck-up, working for a pair of men who still think of me as the kid who missed the school bus, or spilled food on himself at a scholarship interview lunch, or, you know, the 31-year-old man-boy who stole a boat and crashed it. I'm not in a very festive mood by the time I finish eating, and I have no real desire to linger. I see all the stags gathering up their babies, and hope that means a ripple effect of mass departures so we'll all cut out early. Those hopes are dashed when Emma, Juniper, and Alice all settle into Nicole's couch, explaining to Logan that Ty is driving the daddy wagon and leaving all the girls behind to catch up. Emma, Maddie, and Nicole all went to college together, and they all get along really well with Orla, Juniper, and Alice, and it's nice seeing them tug Logan over to their circle. But why do I care? She's my roommate. She doesn't need to be best friends with my family. Shouldn't she make her own friends? I carry my plate to the kitchen, where my brothers are washing dishes and giving each other shit. I don't even linger to join in, wandering over to the girls instead. Hey, Lo, you ready to head out? Her face falls a bit, but she sighs. I really should. I want to be well-rested for tomorrow. Just remember you got this, Maddie tells her, rubbing her own stomach like it's a good luck charm. Fuck those bitches. Nicole says, winking dramatically. Come to Foof this week. Do I want to know what she's talking about? I steer Logan toward the door. I see my dad has slunk away without saying goodbye to anyone. Or maybe he just skipped saying goodbye to me. Good. I don't feel up to talking to him. But I'm a little irritated he beat me to the Irish farewell. Oh, they were giving me a pep talk for tomorrow, Logan says climbing into Big Red and struggling as she tries to pull the heavy door closed. Watch your fingers, I say, taking pity on her and giving it a slam. What's tomorrow? She rolls her eyes. Um, remember, I'm meeting with Mr. Rudy and everyone at work will know they didn't get selected to manage his account, and they'll all hate me worse than they already do? God, Logan, I hate all those assholes so bad. Have I told you that? She bites her lip and looks out the window. They just aren't nice to you. I mean, at first I wasn't sure if they were just being weird because I was around. But seriously, screw them if they're going to act like children. They're impacting the bottom line of their company if the clients get wind of this sort of behavior. It's not lost on me that my father could say the same thing about my own mopey attitude. My mood blackens as I realize I'm Logan's shitty co-workers in this analogy. What did I hear Nicole say? They should be better at their jobs if they want to be assigned better projects? Maybe I'm not as good a mechanical engineer as I thought I was. I'm feeling pretty good about my approach for tomorrow, Logan says stiffly. I don't really want to talk about that anymore. Fine by me, I say, snapping on the audiobook. We're at a part of the book where everyone is at war and characters are dying left and right. It all feels fitting with my mood, and I grunt as I shift into fourth gear and speed toward home. Chapter 26 Logan Nicole advised me to wear a fitted suit today, with heels and red lipstick. She even gave me a tube she said would be a flattering shade, since I confessed my makeup all comes from the dollar bins at the drugstore. She also told me to make sure I get myself off because there's nothing like an orgasm to recharge your power vibes. I think I probably blushed redder than this lipstick when she said that. Thankfully, I'm pretty recharged in that respect from this weekend. But I already decided not to think about that right now. The women in Cal's family are just what I need in my life, and I'm grateful I get to spend time with them. It's this thought that keeps my eyes averted as he wanders around the apartment in his underwear this morning, skin glistening from his shower. Nope, not going to pair that image with memories of what we did the other night. 
For the first time in my life, I have friends who are confident. Nicole is blunt. She literally told me to apply my own expertise to my budget and stop acting like I'm poor. She's not wrong. I slick a comb through my hair, aiming for a low bun while I remind myself that I've fully stocked a six-month emergency fund and am sending Cal's rent payments to my mother. I keep meaning to call her and make sure she quit her second job. I take a moment to recognize that my fear of this good fortune disappearing comes not from a rational place, but from my mother's fears, from her lived hardship. I hear a rap on the door to my room and mumble out a noise since I've got bobby pins in my mouth. Cal pokes his head in the door. Just wanted to remind you I'm working on a job site this week so we can't ride in together and... Whoa. I turn toward him, plucking the final pin from my mouth and smoothing the sides of my hair. I remember. Thank you, Cal. I smile and twirl around. How do I look? I expect him to wink and say something crass like usual, but he stares at me for a few beats without speaking. You look absolutely fierce, he says finally, with a small smile. Thank you, good sir. See you tonight? He nods, still looking a bit shell-shocked, as I click past him in my heels and head for the bus, and then I realize that I let myself put on my shoes before the doorway. I'm starting to unfurl a bit at home. The power of that fuels me toward my office, even though I'm still nervous about what awaits me there. When I get to my building, I take a deep breath. Marie will likely meet me in the hall. She will greet me with a mean facial expression, and her body language will convey her truth. I remind myself what Nicole, Maddie, Emma, Juniper, Orla, and Alice all emphatically reassured me. It's inappropriate for my supervisor to be angry that I'm good at my job. That's on her. I start thinking about Linus in the book series. In the beginning, he's just doing his job and feels honored to serve his king and country. He slowly starts to realize the administration he's fighting for aren't really all that noble. I'm starting to feel a connection with Linus, torn allegiances, where Linus has Sally urging him to do what's right. Well, I've got my roommate and his family. The elevator doors slide open, and I walk confidently toward my office, setting my bag on my desk and turning to hang my coat on the hook. I hear someone approach and know it's Marie. I don't know what you think you're playing at, she says, standing in my door and tapping her foot. Good morning, I say, not meaning it. Rather than ask her what she's referring to, I walk around my desk and pop open my laptop. I'm expecting Mr. Alexander's administrative assistant to reach out about a meeting, and I grin when I see an email from her at the top of my inbox. I hear Marie inhale through her nose. You know damn well that Carl and Jason were working toward the Rudy account. What did you do? Flash him your tits Saturday night so he'd pick you? I frown. I'm not going to dignify that with a response, Marie. Perhaps Carl and Jason should have worked harder to earn their client's endorsement. I type a response to the email invitation, clicking accept with an enthusiastic tap of my index finger. I can do this. I can push back against Marie's words. I am like Linus McClinton, brave and strong. But Marie doesn't apologize like she did in my fantasy of this scenario. She leans forward on my desk and snorts. Client endorsement? Please. You're fucking the son of Rudy's golf buddy. Don't kid yourself, Logan. She tosses a file on my desk, this week's meetings and report expectations. Good luck keeping up with your client list while you manage the Rudy account. Wouldn't want to shuffle anyone off to an analyst who isn't endorsed. She huffs out of the room as her words sink in. I'm going to maintain my full load of clients while also managing the complex investments of one of the city's most wealthy families. I'm never going to sleep again. 
By the time I make my way to Mr. Alexander's office, I'm wobbling in my heels and biting my lip. It's too late to check and make sure I didn't smear the lipstick. Logan, he greets me brightly. Come on inside. I follow him to his desk, and he sinks down behind the massive wooden slab that's larger than the table Cal and I have at our apartment. I notice that his guest chairs are plush leather, a stark contrast to the plain plastic chairs we have in our offices. As I sit, he says, You know, analysts like you have gotten me where I am today. I hope you know how much we value your skills when it comes to forecasting trends. I smile and nod, still reeling from Marie's sharp tongue. Thank you, sir. I've known Denny Rudy for a long time, he says. And Mick Brady, too. I hadn't realized his son was a particular friend of yours. I purse my lips, uncertain what he assumes about Cal. Anyway, he says, Rudy said he got a good feeling about you from meeting you Saturday night. He leans forward and steeples his fingers. Look, I'm not new at this. You're the new kid in town, and I'm sure it chaps all their asses that you're getting this sort of opportunity, he says gesturing around as if he's aware that everyone else here is indeed mad at me. I'm not going to get involved in schoolyard drama, but if any of them pulls shit that puts our reputation at risk, I want to hear about it. I swallow and try to control my facial expressions as I nod back at him. He grins. Great. Well, Marie is going to be managing the client relations, and you can start working your magic. We're looking at a few million to play around with. To start, I nod. I actually prepared a few scenarios this weekend. I have some options to send, depending on his risk tolerance this quarter. Mr. Alexander grins. Risk tolerance is high. Nice work, Logan. Thank you, sir. After Mr. Alexander dismisses me, I am feeling a small resurgence in my confidence and try to maintain that as I walk back to my office, ignoring the creeping dread of too much work and not enough time. I want to message Nicole and the girls and give them an update, but I made a commitment not to do personal communication on company time. No sense shifting from that now, especially when I have even more work than before. I hurry back to my office successfully avoiding contact with anyone else, and I shut myself in to dive into the work. Chapter 27 Cal I flash my Beltane badge at the entrance to the steel plant and park in the visitor's area. It's nice wearing boots and a hard hat to work for a change. I've always hated sitting at a desk in an office. I'll be damned if I tell my dad that I'm appreciating the change of scenery, though. I still don't understand quite why I'm here. Big deal. Tony's having trouble at home. I'm having fucking trouble at home, and it's not impacting my work. I whistle as I walk inside to find Mr. T housing down donuts behind a cluttered desk. Hey, man, I say, leaning on the doorframe. We're going to be buddies this week, I guess. He grunts. After a while, it's pretty clear he has no plans of getting up from his chair anytime soon so I grab a tablet from his desk and head out onto the floor. It's kind of amazing being here. With my earplugs in, I can still hear the roar of everything, but there are no distractions. I wander up and down the line, just looking. I decide to take a full lap of the plant before I even open the inspection software to take a look. I'm not sure what my dad was most concerned about. God forbid he send me with notes. That's more Kellen's bag. But I forgot to check in with him this morning. I remind myself to check my email when I'm back somewhere with Wi-Fi. I pause in front of the coal conveyor bridge. This is the main thing, I recall. It's not some dinky little footbridge. This sucker is so big a car could easily drive across. It's hard for me to imagine a structure like this failing. These are usually so overbuilt. This one's been in service for a few decades, though, so I take a careful look. I admire the track that has the deep pockets moving coal from the hopper to the furnace. The mechanics of this equipment are a beautiful thing. Everything is pure simplicity. I hear a groan as the belt crosses the middle of the structure, and I frown. I should not be hearing anything above the other noises in here, on top of my earplugs. 
I pull up the inspection software and see what Tony's supposed to have been monitoring. Everything seems in order. Hell, I don't even have to calculate anything. This algorithm Uncle Kellen wrote for the inspection program does it all automatically if I just plug in the readings from the different instruments. Something doesn't sit right with me, though. I find the foreman and ask about the groaning, but he just shrugs and says the sound is part of the job. We're communicating mainly through gestures because of the noise. I should go back in the office with Tony and watch some monitors, but something nags at me. The furnace sits at the far end of the structure, and the belt is bringing coal from the trap door in a huge bunker. Both ends of the bridge seem sound. It's that middle section. The thing is the length of a football field. The support columns are the size of tree trunks. I go through the list and I check for rust, for signs of corrosion. I don't notice anything dripping or leaking. But when the conveyor belt groans over my head again on its way to the coal hopper, I decide I have to at least call my uncle. He'll know what to do. I march back to the office, where Tony is actually working on reports, although his desk is still an ungodly mess. I can definitely see what my brother and Logan are talking about here. I'm just a few years away from this place, a place where sloppy crosses from charming into scary. Tone, I say, plunking my hard hat down on the floor beside me as I perch on a stack of papers and try to sit. What can you tell me about that coal conveyor bridge? Other than it's been there thirty years? He shrugs. Seems fine. Does it always groan like that? Another shrug. I blow out a breath, wishing I'd taken one of those donuts from his desk earlier. My dad tell you why you sent me out here? Tony waves a hand. He was in the other day talking with the top brass, something about drones. I nod. Dad and Uncle Kellen are very interested in getting drones and sensors doing most of our preliminary inspections. Makes sense, since they could tell things I definitely can't. Like the temperature of that conveyor belt after it passes near the furnace. What do we know about the age of the belt? How often is that sucker replaced? Tony roots around for some papers, and we study the numbers together. On paper, everything should be fine. At any rate... This isn't necessarily something Tony would be missing because of a domestic dispute distracting him. I shoot my uncle a text, and he calls Tony's office phone almost immediately. I'll get it, I tell him, snatching the oily handset with my sleeve pulled over my hand. Hey, Uncle Kel. I tell him what I've seen, mostly everything is fine, and what my gut tells me. Something is off about that conveyor bridge. Here's what will happen, he says, sighing. I'll have to go to the plant manager with your hunch, and he will tell me that he cannot risk a multi-million dollar pause in production for a hunch. Can they even pause? From my brief stroll through the steel mill, I gathered it would take hours just to slow the machinery. This isn't like a small factory spitting out rivets. Just stopping the turbines is a whole process. A beautiful, mechanically wonderful process I am dying to examine but obviously nobody's going to do it for shits and giggles. No, son, they can't. Not unless it's a crisis. Hang out a little longer and see if you can get me some hard facts, Kellen says. I wander back out with my earplugs, talking to a few employees here and there. I ask if anyone changed any settings on the furnace, if there's been a new batch of coal. I can't point to anything that would have changed, and nobody but me seems bothered by the conveyor belt. At the end of the workday... I head home because I'm ravenous. I never did find any lunch. I can't cook worth a damn, so I go across the street to order something. It seems like no time has passed since I took Logan here for her first enchiladas. But it's been almost two months. I consider how tight she is with my family. How much I like spending time with her just goofing around. Talking about that book series or checking out new beers. And licking her pussy. The thought flashes through my head before I can stop it. Suddenly, I'm in line for takeout with a fully erect dick, thinking about how she looked this morning. I shift uncomfortably, sticking a hand in my pocket to try and adjust things while I wait for my order. I start to recite equations, think about the melting points of various metals. By the time they call my order, I can almost walk without my zipper grating my skin. I hustle back across the street and into the condo, tossing the bags of food on the counter. Logan isn't home yet, and I absolutely have to take care of the situation in my pants. So I sink into the couch, unzip, and reach inside. 
Chapter 28 Logan I work until my eyes start to cross, and the numbers on my monitors all start to blur together. I've run more reports and analysis today than I did in my entire final year of graduate school. With a deep sigh, I decide I have to head home and at least change into sweats before I keep working. My mouth waters at the thought of food, since I didn't stop for lunch. I feel a flutter of nerves when I open my office door. I don't want to face more of my co-workers. Somehow I used up all my reserves standing up to Marie, and I didn't even do that as well as I'd practiced. But the good news about working late is that most people are already gone, and I'm able to make it down to the street without talking to anyone. That puts a skip back into my step, and, just my luck, I arrive to the bus stop just as the express is pulling up. I even manage to snag a seat in the back, and I grin when the bus pulls into the stop near our building just a few minutes later. If only Cal and I were racing today, I would have totally won, and he and his bucket of rust would still be sitting at the light downtown. I shouldn't make fun of his car. He loves that thing. Thinking of Cal's car reminds me of his family dinners and listening to audiobooks as we ride together, which has me thinking of our night together Saturday. I wriggle around in the elevator, remembering his face between my legs, him between my legs. Everything about that night was so far beyond my expectations. It was like, well, it was like all of the sex I read about or saw in movies. My skin feels charged with electricity as I open the door to our apartment, and then I freeze because I'm not sure if I'm imagining things or if Callum Brady really is sprawled out on the couch, touching himself. Chapter 29 Cal How does this keep happening? Am I really the selfish idiot my family says? Honest to God, that was exactly what I needed after a long day at work, and the fact that it was with Logan makes it all the better because we get along so damn well. That was the hottest fucking thing. It's like I conjured Logan right out of my fantasies. She literally walked up to me while I was imagining what she'd look like with her mouth wrapped around my cock. She snores quietly next to me in my bed, and I feel a little bit bad that she fell asleep before she could finish her work. But fuck that company. They can't just dump double work in her because all the other employees are too shitty to handle her clients. Shouldn't they want to hire a full staff of people like Logan? I guess she is uniquely brilliant. I hate how stressed her job makes her feel. Like, I get that she grew up poor and needs to send money home to her mom, but does she really think she's a week away from being evicted? How much of an asshole am I if I feel glad that jumping into bed with her helped her kick back and have a little more fun for a minute? She carries so much emotional weight around with her. I sigh. Logan doesn't need my brand of fun. I roll onto my side and stare at her. She's so relaxed when she's asleep. Logan is beautiful. I love the lines of her chin, the slope of her shoulders. I really love the way her hips swell up from her narrow waist. I reach out to touch her, just needing that connection. And I drift off to sleep with my hand on her skin. It's still dark when I start hearing my phone ring furiously again and again. I think it's in the living room, rattling around on the coffee table, and I groan as I stumble over to it, knowing it's not going to stop ringing at this point. Uncle Kel? Callum, you need to tell me exactly what happened at the steel mill today. Shit, he's using his stern voice. I told you everything I could figure out, I tell him, scratching myself as I try to wake up. And you left? Without concrete evidence to support your suspicion? What the hell did he expect me to do? Stay there all night and see why the belt was groaning? Yeah, I came home at the end of the day. I hadn't eaten. I was spent. Doesn't Dad always say those basic needs are the most important element of a good... Callum, the fucking bridge collapsed, and I need you to meet me at the site as soon as humanly possible. The line goes dead, and I stare at my phone. Did that just happen? I turn when I hear a shuffling sound and see Logan padding into the room. She's wearing my t-shirt and I feel something happen in my chest at the sight of that. What's wrong? 
She walks toward me and reaches out an arm to touch me, but hesitates. I shake my head. Something collapsed at the job site. I tell her, I gotta go in to meet my family. I start rooting around for my jeans and a clean shirt. Logan stands at the door holding my hard hat, her eyes puffy from interrupted sleep. It's such a nice gesture, and I don't quite know how to respond to it, so I cram my feet in my boots without tying them and bend down to kiss her on the cheek before grabbing the hat and heading to the parking garage. Damn, I had no idea the bridge was on the point of collapse. I just figured I'd go in this morning and stare at everything again with fresh perspective. As I drive, my mind wakes up fully and I consider what's likely going down at the job site. I think my uncle would have told me if anyone was killed. God, I hope nobody was killed. It's one thing to cost a client millions of dollars in lost work time. Loss of life is something else entirely. There is a whole army of security at the site when I pull up to the gate and I have to dig around to find my Beltane badge. Someone directs me where to park, and I see my uncle and my father standing under a huge light with a bunch of very angry-looking corporate dudes. The whole place smells like acrid burning stench, like metal and rubber caught fire or opened up the pits of hell. The sounds of creaking metal and generators overpower all my senses, and I wish I had grabbed earplugs from inside Big Red. I hang back, but my uncle sees me and stomps over to me. He doesn't speak, but I can see his nostrils flare. I try to remain calm here. I did my part. I told him what I saw, what I suspected. He clearly chose not to inform the client, or else they chose not to respond. My dad is not as calm. He marches right over and shoves me in the shoulder, hard. What in the hell is the matter with you? Did I raise you to be an idiot? What the fuck, Dad? I called Uncle Kellen. I told him something was off. Kellen pulls up a spreadsheet from the inspection application on his tablet device. You didn't notice this? He taps at the column of temperatures. Of course I fucking noticed that. That was the first thing I checked to see if the heat was warping the belt. Kellen double-clicks the column and it gets larger. All the numbers are the same, Callum. Tony dragged the same number down the entire column. I frown. It should be the same, though, I tell them. Shouldn't the furnace have the same output, given a consistent input and air circulation? My uncle shakes his head in disbelief. Down to the tenth of a degree? Every single time? Grow the fuck up, Callum. We sent you in here to supervise this. It was your job to notice that he wasn't actually taking this measurement. Tony was phoning it in, and now the client is losing a million dollars every few seconds. I've never heard my uncle raise his voice before, let alone curse. Not like this. I literally have nothing to say in response to him. I just stand there for a long time, and I must not have noticed that my dad had walked away because I see him stomping back up to us with someone else in tow. Edward, this is my son, Callum. Shit. Is he going to feed me to the wolves right here? I actually feel like I might shit my pants, especially as I hear a terrible roar of machinery from inside the plant. Edward squints at me and runs his hand through his hair. My dad clears his throat. I stick out my hand. Nice to meet you, sir. I have no context for who this guy is. If my family is going to give me this much shit about a situation, they really need to brief me more fully. I can't imagine Liam would ever walk into a scenario like this. But I guess Liam would have asked questions about the temperature column. My dad's eyes flash anger at me, and I clench my jaw. Callum is going to personally oversee the design and repair of the system, he says. I whip my head around to stare at him. Dad continues. I give you my word that my own son is on this, because I know you know the Brady name equates to excellent engineering. Edward looks me up and down and gives a curt nod, then turns on his heel and marches back over toward the mayhem. Nobody speaks. None of us move. Finally, my dad raises a hand, and I flinch, worried he's actually going to hit me this time. But he points a finger at me. I was embarrassed tonight, son. I blink at him a few times. Why are you putting me in charge of fixing this? He inhales deeply and lowers his hand. Because this is your mess to fix. Make it right. 
and without another word, he and my uncle walk back to their cars and drive away. Chapter 30 Logan I should go back to sleep, but between my concern for whatever emergency pulled Cal away and the nagging pull of unfinished work, I find my mind is on fire. I make a pot of tea and pull on the sweatpants I had imagined wearing before, well, before tonight went off the rails. Snuggled into Cal's shirt, I grab my laptop and nestle into the couch. Before I left the office, I determined that the bulk of my clients were at the same investment level and approximately the same age, which usually indicates they share a similar willingness to take financial risks. I never wanted to offer anyone a cookie-cutter approach, but given the complexity of the Rudy account, I've decided the best way forward is for me to recommend a very similar investment strategy for my other clients. I tell myself, this is okay, because at the gala they all seemed interested in each other's portfolios. By the time the sun comes up, I've selected a few safe choices and made note of a really interesting opportunity. I write a note for myself to look into this one local business that keeps turning up in my research, and then I close the laptop to stare out the window. Cal's scent permeates this shirt, and I can't stop thinking about him now that he's not here. This isn't some perfumey fake smell. He wore the shirt all day to a job site, and I smell both his deodorant and a little of his sweat, and I try to understand why I like it so much. Nothing about the way my body responds to him makes sense. I'm upset that once again, I dove into a physical experience with my roommate before we've had a chance to talk about things. I want to have a plan with Cal, talk through worst-case scenarios. I want to make lists of expectations if we're going to have this sort of relationship. And yet, what I enjoy most of all is the unexpected and unplanned rush I feel each time he kisses me or touches me or slides inside my body. I press the back of my hand to my cheeks, feeling the heat bloom there as I remember how completely I let go with Cal. Sexually. It felt so wrong, but so absolutely right all at once. And I was so brazen when we were together, telling him just what I wanted, what I needed. I don't know if there was ever another time in my life where I desperately needed something and asked for it. And got it. My mind races while I try to make sense of it, what it means going forward. He seemed to agree with me when I said it should have been a one-time thing. But then he also slept with his arms around me after he speared me with his musket in the kitchen. I giggle, remembering his red coat joke. Reluctantly, I rise to turn on the shower. I peel off his shirt, folding it and placing it on his pillow, and slip into the warm water, trying to reorganize my thoughts to begin my day. The apartment feels empty without Cal here this morning, and it feels strange to leave for work without any of his questions, comments, or observations. I consider sending him a text, but I don't want to distract him if he's in the middle of dealing with an emergency. Even the vibration of a cell phone can pull me right out of the zone if I'm concentrating. It's partly why I leave my phone off in my bag while I'm at work most of the time. I catch the express bus toward the office and smile when a text comes in from Nicole. You never told me how it felt to burn your bitch boss to ashes with your words. It was a medium successful operation, I write back, and Nicole immediately responds with a finger-wagging jiff. Logan. You need Foff. I'm calling an emergency meeting for tonight. Oh no, please don't bother anyone. I did stand up for myself, and I have a plan. Too many fucks are being devoted to this. You're coming to the bar tonight at 5.01. Do I need to send a car to fetch you? Apparently, everyone but me knows about 5.01s as a concept. Really, I'm okay. Your pep talk was so great. I hate to think about my roommate's family pulling together over this especially if there's some sort of all-hands-on-deck situation with a belting client. Nicole sends an eye-roll gif and types, I'm sending a car, which I will also be inside. Do not make me come up and drag you outside. I have to admit, 
It does feel nice that someone cares this much, that I'm having a rough time at work. I bite my lip and type back, okay, before I hop out of the bus and shove my hand out just as the elevator doors are closing in my building. Of course, Marie is inside the car. Her eyes flare when she sees me, and it looks like she's about to spit coffee at me. I wince, wondering if she'd really do that. I say nothing, and she says nothing, until the doors open and we approach her office door. You have Ms. Emerson at two o'clock, and Mr. Dolan at two o'clock, she says curtly. A joint appointment? No, she snaps. They each ask to meet you individually. Marie, why would you schedule them both simultaneously? How is that supposed to work? Figure it out, she snaps and slams her office door. Okay, maybe I really do need Nicole to summon her cavalry. I ease into my office and try to decide a course of action that won't impact Mr. Alexander's bottom line. I don't want to have to reach out to him only a day after I took on the new account. I stare at my desk for a few minutes, thinking, this isn't so different from when Linus needed to arrange a meeting with town leaders in the red coat. My fictional hero was dealing with volatile people on the brink of starvation and revolution. My clients seemed to get along the other night at the event. Pretty sure I heard Ms. Emerson ask to hear about the same opportunities as some of the other clients. Like Linus, I can help them find common ground, right? A mutually beneficial arrangement. Interpersonal relationships with clients is not part of my job expectation, and for good reason. My brain does best with numbers, but I decide to build on the rapport and energy I had going Saturday night and just roll with the double meeting. I pull up some of the analysis I was working on at home. I type up some bullet points for what I plan to say to the clients, print out some visuals, and touch up my lip gloss before I make my way toward the conference room. I channel my inner Nicole and do not glance to either side as I walk down the hall full of colleagues who are jealous of me and a supervisor who is setting me up to fail here this afternoon. I paste a huge smile on my face and walk up to both of my 2 p.m. meetings. Jim, Mary, I fake enthusiasm when I see them sitting with their coats in their laps. Is the receptionist against me too? This is really unacceptable. Let me grab those coats from you. Do you want to make your way into the conference room and I'll join you? Mary looks at Jim and back at me. Both of us? I thought we were meeting, dear. I wave a hand as I scoop up the expensive coats from their laps. I'll explain everything in just a moment. I hurry over to reception and plunk the coats on the desk, causing Janine to startle and look up at me, then wins. I grit my teeth. You will take these coats and then come offer the clients refreshments, as per usual, or I will not hesitate to march directly into Mr. Alexander's office. I don't wait for her response. Maybe I'm channeling Nicole without needing tonight's foof meeting. Maybe I've just had enough. I slide into the conference room and sit between Jim and Mary, who have each taken a seat at opposite heads of the table. I was so glad when Marie told me you had each requested a meeting, I lie. Ever since Saturday evening, I've been wanting to discuss an opportunity with you. I pull up two packets and slide the printouts toward them. You know I look very closely into the companies where our clients invest, any and all information about spending and hiring, and I'm studying it night and day. I rifle through the pages of my own packet, holding it up like a librarian at story time so they can each see. Each of you is heavily invested in healthcare and life sciences, I tell them. Jim nods and aims finger guns at me. Yeah, thanks to your good advice. I nod back. Well, you know, I do tend to recommend the same good investments to all my favorite clients. I'm really laying it on thick, but they seem to be eating it up, so I carry on. Notice anything on the budget lines for each of the companies? I don't wait for an answer, charging ahead. Trick question, I wink, channeling Cal's fun energy. I highlighted the interesting part for you. 
Jim and Mary squint at the paper, where I've pulled snapshots of the main budget items for a few different labs, most of them spin-offs from the research universities and medical school nearby, and all of them places each of them are already pretty heavily invested. Mary taps at the paper. What is Vinia? Great question, I say. That exact question had me up most of last night. This is true. I noticed all our chemistry, healthcare, and biotech companies, where many of my clients invest, are utilizing Vinia. I did some research, and best I can tell, it's a pretty new venture actually based locally, here in Pittsburgh. The founder built the company from her dorm room in college. I flip my packet to a page featuring a smiling blonde, printed from Vinia's website. I'm going to play some calls, but hear me out. Vinia is actively seeking investment funding. All of these trusted companies are already using their services. I pause for effect here, trying to draw on my presentation skills from my MBA courses. Mary and Jim seem confused. What if you invested some seed money into Vinia? I'm not sure if it's possible for my eyebrows to shoot any higher into my hairline while I smile and wait to see what they think. I actually don't even know if this is something we're able to facilitate as an organization. This is very different from buying into a mutual fund and building an investment portfolio. But here I am, figuring out what to say to the clients. I remind myself that I'm in this room right now because my supervisor acted inappropriately. I clench my toes inside my shoes, hating Marie with every hair on my head. Mary looks at Jim. Jim looks down at the papers. It feels risky to me, he says, looking like he wishes he didn't feel that way. In my younger days, I took chances on new companies. Mary nods enthusiastically. I completely agree, she pats my hand. It's not that I don't trust your instincts. I actually had come to talk about moving along that risk scale you showed me months ago, siphoning to more stable funds. Mary bites a lip, and I guess she doesn't want to admit her real age or financial circumstances to Jim. I force myself to smile. I completely understand, I tell them. And I do want to apologize again about the scheduling confusion today. Mary, I'm happy to move you up the scale as we discussed earlier. I turn toward Jim, who keeps staring at the papers. Is there anything I can do for you today since you came all the way here? A few minutes later, I usher both of them to reception, insisting they keep the packets to look over if they change their minds. I storm back into my office and slam the door, sinking into my chair and hoping neither of those clients complain to anyone higher up. It's one thing for them to laugh and joke with one another at a party, but discussing their portfolios in front of each other? They could easily walk, and Mr. Alexander would want to know about this. But I can't bring myself to run to him with this issue. The time for that would have been before the meeting. At this point, it would truly be my own fault if either of those clients raised a complaint about my little presentation. I can't go on like this, I say aloud. I massage my temples with my palms, realizing how badly I really do need advice from Nicole and her friends. 501 can't come soon enough. Chapter 31 Logan I decide to wait for Nicole outside. I feel lighter just stepping outside the doors to my building. I suppose this is how my mother has felt for years when she leaves work. Even the skin on my scalp loosens up. A whisper of guilt climbs my spine as I think about her having no options and working so hard so that now I have options. I have options. I have to keep reminding myself of that. I laugh when I see a fancy black car slow to a stop, and Nicole leans out the back window, her curly hair flying around in the wind. I've noticed that it's always windy downtown in Pittsburgh, probably because of the rivers. My own straight hair whips me in the mouth as I slide into the car next to her and lean my head back on the headrest. You look like you still have, Fox, Logan Miller. 
You need to release the fucks if you're coming with me today. It's just really complicated, I start to explain, but she claps her hands in my face, startling me. No fucks. Fresh out of fucks. These women are serious about reducing bullshit. Hey, she directs this latest comment to the driver. There's still a sinkhole on 10th. You need to go up Liberty Ave or we'll never get there. He turns around in his seat and makes a face at her, but she points a finger at him. Liberty, she repeats, and he rolls his eyes and puts on his blinker. Turning to me, Nicole reiterates, you cannot have any fucks, Logan, or you will never get anything done. Nicole tosses the driver a 20 when we stop in front of a cute building on Smallman Street. Nicole could definitely have walked here from her house, so I feel extra grateful that she made the extra trip to come retrieve me in a car. Inside, Bridges and Bitters looks less like a bar than it does a fancy Victorian parlor. The chairs and benches have velvety cushions. There are beautiful carpets throughout the space, and a dark mahogany bar takes up the back wall. Everything is illuminated by those lights that look like old gas lamps. This space Definitely gives a lot of fucks, I whisper to Nicole, looking in awe at the elegant design. Nicole nods. You should give fucks about your career. Esther gives a ton of fucks about this place. Foof is mostly about giving no fucks when it comes to nonsense. We really should make shirts. A woman in a beautiful red dress winks as she reaches toward Nicole for a hug. She thrusts a hand toward me and says, Esther Storm, I own this joint. Logan Miller, I tell her. Your space is amazing. I notice the pride evident in her face as I gesture around. Logan is releasing her fucks with us. A familiar voice comes up behind me and I turn to see Juniper Jones shaking out her short, dark hair. There are just a few patrons in the bar and Esther points a thumb toward the back wall where the bar is set up. Go on in, she says. I'll bring a tray in a minute. I see a hall to the left of the bar and we round the corner. I'm expecting it just to be restrooms and maybe an office, but I gasp when we approach an elegant banquet room. The crystal chandelier sends rainbows and sparkles of light bouncing off the walls, and I watch with delight as Nicole sinks into a vintage settee, looking very much like she'd fit in on the Titanic. I squeeze in next to her as she kicks off her shoes, and I watch as a stream of confident women make their way back into our hideout. Orla slinks in, and somehow doesn't seem out of place, dressed as if she were climbing around a dusty job site all day. I'm sure she was doing that. After a few minutes, Esther returns with a silver tray of fancy drinks, and someone stands and taps her ring against the stem of one of the glasses. Ladies of Foof, she says. We have a newcomer. I should feel embarrassed. Normally I would with all this attention lobbed at me. But I already know Nicole and Maddie, and I sort of know Juniper. I can feel the three of them forbidding me from feeling uncomfortable. The blonde woman smiles and says, Esther, you introduce yourself first and tell us what we're drinking today. Esther gestures at the tray. I'm Esther Storm, proprietor of Bridges and Bitters. Yes, Storm is my real last name. Everyone chuckles. Today, you're enjoying a transition teeny. It's local vodka, ginger liqueur, pear juice, luxardo, morello cherry, half a lemon squeeze, a splash of syrup, and let's get these fucks flying already. Esther sips her drink and smacks her lips. The blonde woman does the same. Amazing flavor combinations, babe, as per usual. I'm Samantha Vine, data scientist. I hear from a personal trainer named Piper and a romance novelist named Chloe before all eyes turn to me. Hi, I stammer. I'm Logan, and I work at... Nope, Nicole shakes her head and takes a sip of her drink. Not... I work at. What are you, Logan? Remember, foof. It's the sound of your fucks floating away, Logan. I nod. Okay, I am a financial analyst, and I'm new at expressing my feelings. Nice, Juniper whispers. Samantha points at Juniper. 
Before we learn about how Logan is freeing her fucks, I want to hear an update from Juniper's re-election campaign. Last time, some asshole was upset about her clothing choices. Juniper rolls her eyes. The trolls are out there in force. They were commenting on my pantsuits as unfeminine the last time I was here, but this week I'm catching flack because my husband stays home with our boys. There's a collective gasp around the room as people murmur angrily in response to Juniper's comments. She nods her head and rolls her eyes. My clerk literally fielded a call today from someone wanting to know if I'm proud of myself now that I've emasculated my husband. Juniper goes on to explain that Ty wanted to go to the caller's house and beat him up, or at least speak to the press about how much he loves being around for his kids. Ty's dad wasn't in the picture when he was young, Juniper says. Being a father is really important to him. But fuck that caller. What did you say in response? I blurt out my question on the edge of my seat and forgetting I'm new here. Nobody seems to recoil at my outburst. Juniper grins. I ask to hear my opponent's thoughts on having a stay-home spouse caring for their family, and kept pushing him to clarify why he hadn't asked my male opponent that question. Eventually, the jerk hung up. There's a round of cheers from the room and lots of clinking glasses. Maddie nods fiercely and pats her belly. That's such horseshit. Samantha says, and everyone takes a breath. She turns to me and smiles. Juniper has had a lot of practice freeing her fucks from her last time running for judge, but Nicole says you're new to the art. Let's hear it, Logan. I bite my lip. Nicole pats my leg. I'm going to summarize to save time. Logan is a badass analyst, fresh out of an Ivy League MBA program. Obviously, she got swooped up by a big firm to come work here in the city of Bridges. Her co-workers are a bunch of whiny man-babies who can't handle it that someone with a vagina is smarter than them, and they treat her like shit at work. I open and close my mouth, feeling like I should refute her. But she keeps flaring her nostrils as she talks, and honestly, she's not wrong. I pick up the thread, explaining that the firm landed a huge client who ended up requesting me personally to handle his account. So now they're dumping grunt work on me, and, like, the receptionist isn't taking clients' coats? They've left me to operate alone and are sort of refusing to work with me in any supportive role. And my big boss said I should let him know if there were shenanigans that impact the bottom line, and honestly, I don't know when to go to him or how I should proceed with just doing my job. I take a deep breath. I feel like I can't stop talking now that I started, and the room is full of gasps and shocked faces, making me feel like I'm not insane, and I realize I maybe thought my feelings were off since I was the only one who seemed to feel them. I wish I'd listened to Cal and his family sooner. I swallow and turn to Juniper. We studied you in grad school. I was so awed by your background, how you came through the foster system. I grew up with a single teen mom, I spill my guts, telling these women how I've spent decades learning to tamp down any strong feelings and act grateful for anything I get. Anything. Juniper comes and hugs me. She clasps my hands. Those are heavy lessons to unlearn. I'm here to tell you, you are worthy of success. Hear, hear, the women in the room clamor to agree with Juniper, shouting words of encouragement. So, I say shrugging and sipping my drink. I don't know what to do. What's your worst case scenario? I think it's Chloe asking. I wonder if she's going to use my story in one of her books or something. I bite my lip in fear at the thought, but everyone else nods. Another deep breath. Well, like I said, I was raised by a single mom. Anyway, things were always hard for us. Mom always had two jobs, and I always had a job. Anyway, I keep saying, anyway, I had scholarships for school so I don't have loans. I just want to be able to take some of the burden off my mom. I've been paying her rent. I feel myself getting choked up as I talk. If I lose this job, I won't be able to do that for her. Or me, I guess. Samantha's face is sympathetic as she leans forward on the table, stretching to grab my hands, which feels odd. 
but I let her. You know you won't be destitute if you leave a shitty job, right? Someone else will snap you up immediately. I do know that. Rationally. It's a lot of years of housing and food insecurity to overcome with rational thinking. I say quietly. I take a shaky breath. I know I have an attractive degree, but I also know what it feels like to be evicted. I feel like everything I bring home I have to hoard away just in case. Logan's still living like she's poor, Nicole butts in. My eyes widen at her blunt speech. You do, babe. You've got an emergency fund. You've got friends with awesome houses with guest rooms. Hell, if things get really bad, you know you can live in the back of Cal's disgusting Bronco. Nicole looks around the room. I think she needs to jump off that shitty company. There's really no way to salvage that toxic climate. Toxic climate is a new phrase for me, but it hits home immediately. Shouldn't I try to fix the problem, though? Piper taps a fingernail on her lip, considering. I put a lot of effort into working on communication with the staff at my former place of work. It was a similar thing. I kept getting more personal training clients than the other trainers who had been there longer. And who also had dicks. Orla blurts. Everyone rolls their eyes. Right. It was a bunch of men threatened by me. She shrugs. I tried HR. I tried professional development. But honestly, the other people there weren't interested in changing, and there was no pressure from management for them to do so. I was bending over backwards to improve that work atmosphere, and they didn't give a rat's ass. So I quit and took my clients with me, thanks to moral support from Foof, obviously. Samantha grins. Best move you could have made. I look around the room at all the supportive faces. I'm not ready for private practice, though. I don't really want to do that. I enjoy working for a company, being part of a larger team. Piper leans across the table to meet my eyes. Are you ready for an agonizing process of working with human resources and sitting across from your colleagues as you all attend civility trainings? I shudder at the thought and shake my head. Then you need to find a recruiter and work for a better company, Nicole says, beckoning the newly appeared server for another tray of drinks. That's my homework for you, I think. Call a headhunter. What about my clients? That's a fair question, Samantha says. If the clients are unhappy with your firm after you move on for a better opportunity, they'll move to another one. You can't keep yourself miserable just because you like your clients. I hadn't considered that, and I sit for a minute sipping my drink, my head swirling. There's so much confidence in this room, so much assurance. Maddie talks a little bit about her own career challenges. She was laid off from the newspaper, has no safety net other than the women in this room, and doesn't want to be financially dependent on Liam. She catches my eye and says, My parents worked shitty jobs in shift work, too. My first couple paychecks at the paper were more money than I'd ever seen before in my whole life. I relate to her words so deeply. I feel a little tingly. Maddie nods her head at Nicole. This one here forced me to make a budget and tape it to the fridge so I could remind myself I really, truly did have spare money to spend on fancy fanny packs. Everyone laughs as Maddie pulls a stick of gum from the pouch around her waist. She shares a few job leads she's chasing and lets everyone know she decided not to work with Liam's mom. Things are actually getting way better with us now that that's settled, she says and then she winks. But I know we're not talking about that sort of fucks. We'll get back to that sort of fucks, Samantha says. I need to butt in and say that I definitely took the Nicole spreadsheet approach and decided I'm going to pursue funding more aggressively. Vinia is ready to spread, I think. Wait, did you say Vinia? I snap my mouth shut, not meaning to interrupt. Is this seriously the founder of the company I was researching earlier? Is Pittsburgh that small? I tilt my head, feeling my drinks a little bit, and study the attractive, kind woman across the table from me. It is her. The woman from the photo online. I'm not sure how I didn't put it together earlier, but I chalk it up to me being nervous. Samantha nods. Yep, Sam Vine. Vinia. 
cheesy, I know. But like I always say, I want my solutions to spread like a vine and dig their tendrils into every lab, every research project. She talks about her team she's putting together and the successful launch of their new product. Samantha created a cloud-based tool for scientists to track, measure, and forecast their scientific work. There is so much repetition in labs, she says, plus these idiot geniuses keep misplacing data and doing shit on paper. Paper! Liam hates paper, Maddie blurts and gets a round of hearty shushing. Literally, nobody cares about him right now, Orla says, leaning towards Samantha. I want to hear about Samantha's funding. Well, I mean, that's my work right now. Finding the millions of dollars, I... Her eyes sparkle and she looks around the table. I think we can get a billion. Foof. She blurts the term like a battle cry and slaps the table. I know we can get a billion. I agree, I say, causing everyone to turn and look at me. I shrug. I was looking into the budgets of the companies where my clients are currently invested. Vinia is a line item on basically all of them. You're already in use by the big players that attract the attention of the big investors. Samantha blinks a few times and then points at me. We need to have a chat. Chapter 32 Cal I don't know where to start. Uncle Kellen fired Tony as soon as he found the drag and drop temperature shit. I don't have project management experience, not like this. I don't know what my budget is, who our suppliers are. I know literally nothing except that I'm surrounded by actual hellfire and I've been left here to burn. The guys cleaning up the mess on the floor seem to have their marching orders, so I go into Tony's office. I try to channel everything I've ever heard my dad and uncle say about business. My dad's big thing is looking at people's trash cans. He has a theory that if a company isn't managing something simple like regularly emptying the trash, then there's something really wrong at every step of the process. Sure enough, Tony's trash is full and has flies hovering around it. Not knowing what else to do, I start cleaning up his office. At first, it's easy to find the obvious trash and food wrappers, and I bag those up and find a dumpster outside. But then, I don't know what to do with the papers everywhere other than fucking read each of them. Tony's office has filing cabinets, but he doesn't seem to use them or organize anything in any meaningful way. I start to suspect my dad sent me here initially, knowing I'd wind up having to clean this office, and that would be my penance for the boat thing. Since the heaps on the desk are useless anyway, I take an arm and sweep them all to the floor so I have a clean surface to start making piles. And then I just start organizing shit as best I can. I find inspection reports and realize I can sort these by machinery type so I start making stacks. Then I find repair contracts and purchase orders for components of the different machines. I really start to feel like I'm getting somewhere. The sun is up before I stop for air. I open the door to the office and see that it must be a shift change. Workers are filing into the office area to punch in and stash their lunchboxes. I follow the line to see if there's at least a vending machine where I can buy something crappy to fill my belly. I grab the least disgusting sandwich and look around, noticing that people are staring at me. Hey, everyone, I say, waving and trying to swallow the dry sandwich. Overly dry is better than soggy, I guess. I'm, uh, here to fix the bridge. More than a few of them make a face, like that's the most shocking and upsetting news they've ever heard. I can't help but agree with them. I'm Cal, I say, and gesture around. I met some of you yesterday, I think. Anyway, you're all the experts of how this place works. I hope I can learn from you while I find my bearings. Someone snorts. You gonna pay us overtime for training you? There's a round of agreement, and people bang on the table supportively. I wish, I tell them, feeling like Linus McClinton in the red coat when he had to appease the angry villagers. I know these guys are stressed, too. Hell, they work here every day. In the book, Linus kept trying to find ways to relate to everyone, find the right levers to pull that helped people agree. I say, the sooner we get this place back up and operating, the more secure your jobs are, right? Hopefully we can find some common ground. 
The mention of job security shuts everyone up. But honestly, they're all getting laid off if the company keeps losing money this way. Bankruptcy is always a looming threat for industries like this. I nod and make my way back to Tony's office, starting on a new heap of paperwork in my sorting journey, before I finally locate the name of the company who last serviced the bridge. Fuck yeah, I shout, wiping off Tony's office phone and calling the number on the invoice. Now we're getting somewhere. An hour later, my new best friend Frank is here with a crew to haul away broken shit and assess which pieces of the bridge are salvageable. Frank knows exactly what to do, and I'm so grateful I could hug him. But I don't, because I know that getting started on the repair work here is basically the least of my concerns. I commit to getting Tony's office in order before I leave here today, but take the time to fire off an email to the head of the mechanical department at Beltane. I know Dad put me in charge of overseeing this, but if he wants this to go well, I'm at least going to need advice from people who have managed this sort of project in the past. I work until it's dark outside, which is a pretty long time considering it's summer and I'm sweating up in a barely air-conditioned office. Frank introduces me to his second-shift top dog, and I make sure they both have my cell before I take off. I have got to get some sleep, or I'm going to be useless in the morning. The condo is dark when I get there, and I'm too exhausted to call Logan and figure out if she's okay. I know she's got some shit going on at work, too. I make myself a sandwich and pass out. When my alarm goes off at five, I feel groggy and hungover. I down a bunch of aspirin and start shoveling food into a bag to take with me today. I cannot continue living on that vending machine and skipping meals. I look down at what I have in the cupboard, mostly bars and peanuts. I feel like, on one hand, I should rush back to work and be there, but then something tells me I need to pause for a minute and make a plan. This isn't going to be a sprint repair where I pull one late night and then make up for it over the weekend. I cringe when I look in the open cupboard and notice that I still haven't contributed any dishes or towels to the kitchen. I think back to Tony, just sitting in piles of disarray. Sloppy. This isn't who I want to be. Okay, one thing at a time. I stop at the 24-hour grocery store and fill a cart with non-perishable stuff that doesn't seem too unhealthy. There's a lot more options than I thought, between dried fruit and nuts and these little quinoa pouches that are basically adult baby food. From the parking lot of the store, I pull up the Fiesta website on my phone and see there's something literally called a starter set. I get why my mom was keen to go to their clearance sale, but sometimes a guy just has to pay full price to solve a problem. I order the starter set in the sunflower color, because it makes me think of Logan, all bright and cheerful. I email my mom to say I took care of the dishes, thanking her for the lead on the brand name, and tell her I won't be able to make it to dinner this week because of a crisis at work. Then I set some reminders for myself to drink water, turn my phone on Do Not Disturb, and drive back to the worksite, ready to keep sifting through the ashes. Chapter 33 Logan The ladies of Foof wrap up official business, and most of them head off into the night. Samantha beckons for me to follow her out to the bar, where she asks Esther to pour us something celebratory. I climb into the stool next to her, noticing that there's a footrest at exactly the right height, so my legs aren't dangling as I sit. Sam sees me noticing and nods. Esther thinks of everything, she says. This is a place where women are centered. She gestures toward a series of hooks beneath the bar, and I realize I can hang my bag there, right where I can see it, but don't have to hold it. All these little touches make me feel so comfortable. I can absolutely see why Nicole loves it here, and I'm so grateful she included me in this circle. Sam rests her elbows on the bar and turns toward me. I'm just going to get right to it. I want you to work for me. I almost spit out my drink. What? We just met. Maybe. 
But you didn't just meet my business. You obviously have a sharp eye for financial analysis. And you come with Nicole Kennedy's blessing as a boss bitch. I need someone with your skill set. I recall how Nicole said, Most startups have ideas people and hustlers, but always need to find someone with an MBA to round it all out. I... My instinct is to insist I can't possibly walk away from my job and my clients. My instinct is to tell her I need the stability of an established company and the health insurance and so many things. But what has that gotten me so far? A situation where I walk around with my entire body clenched and a sense of dread every time I open my office door? It's like Sam can read my thought processes. Because she says... I'll match your salary. We've got a decent health plan at Vinia. You've seen for yourself that my software is the real deal, Logan. I'm not being cocky here. I know there's a problem in the world of life sciences research, and I know Vinia can solve it. You know it, too. I swallow and take another sip of my drink. It's something light this time, and it might not even have any alcohol in it. But it's refreshing, and the pause lets me gather my thoughts. I do know it. Sam, I tell her. But I'm not sure if I'm ready to make that move. Come build something extraordinary with me, she says. Do you really want to spend your career being nice to assholes while you apply your skills to build other people's dragon hordes? Come help build the tool that lets scientists discover the cure for cancer and transform regenerative medicine. I sigh. This woman sure knows how to lead a sales pitch. I thought computer programmers were all socially awkward, I tell her laughing. She takes a big swig of her drink. I told you, I'm a data scientist. We laugh together, and Sam beckons Esther for her bill. Esther swats her hand like Sam's money is no good here, and Sam snorts, fishes in her purse, and slaps a 50 on the bar. Come on, she says. We have to run before she tries to give the money back. Feeling elated and overcome, I grab my purse and follow her out the front door. The steamy summer air hits me when we reach the sidewalk, and I have to pause and catch my breath from the drastic change. Call off sick tomorrow, Sam says. Let me give you a tour of Vinia and make you a proper offer. You can have Juniper look it over if you're worried. I have never called off before. My mom never had health care or paid sick days. Calling off always meant missing pay. For the first time, this really feels like a past tense worry for me. Like, I've finally internalized that this is no longer something I have to worry about. I've got personal days and paid sick time and vacation time at my job now, and most likely any job I'll get from here on out. I signed a non-compete when I moved here, I tell Sam, biting my lip and watching as she uses her phone to call for a ride. Where do you live? We can share a car, she says, ignoring my comment. It turns out, we're both in the east end of the city, and my heart soars at the thought of having a friend live nearby. As we slide into the back seat of the SUV that pulls up outside the bar, Sam finally acknowledges my last remaining worry. Wouldn't a non-compete clause just prevent you from joining another investment firm? I'm not hiring you to do that, Logan. I'd be hiring you to lead and build my finance team. The car pulls up in front of my building, and Sam hands me her card. Call me when you wake up. We'll talk. If you want, I'll have someone from legal take a look at whatever contract you signed. Let's make this work. I nod my head, only slightly, and Sam grins as the car pulls away. My emotions are swirling, my thoughts racing. Can I really do this? Leave a sure thing I hate to take a chance on something I might love? I own my own condo. I have a job with growth potential in a company that pays well. I have a graduate degree. I think about my goals and realize that they've all failed to take my happiness into account. The only parts of any of it that I enjoy or the thrill I get when one of my predictions pans out, and my roommate. I take the elevator up to my floor and see that Cal must have come home. His boots are in the tray, and he left the light on over the stove. I smile, 
remembering how my mother used to do that so she didn't have to turn on the big kitchen light and risk disturbing me since the door to my room never quite shut all the way. I think about something Juniper said at the bar. If the people at my job right now feel like it's totally okay to talk about my personal life and accuse me of going after clients romantically, it's going to take a huge effort to shift the needle on office culture. Samantha Vine is an entirely different sort of leader and likely runs a company with an entirely different feel. I nod my head, determined to do this thing. It feels scary, but it feels right somehow. Glancing down the hall, I see Cal's door is shut tight. I'm glad he's getting some rest. He must be exhausted, and frankly, so am I. I take a magnet and pin Sam's card to my fridge and pull out my phone to dial Marie's work line. When her voicemail picks up, I say I need to use a personal day and don't feel up to coming to work in the morning. It's not even a lie. I know better than to call my mom for her support about this. Better to let her know once the ink is dry and I've made a change than to expect her to pep me up for a meeting like tomorrow. Instead, I email Sam's Vinia address from my phone to ask what time works for her in the morning. And I smile when she responds almost instantly, telling me to be there with a smile on my face at nine. My heart soars, and I wish I had someone to celebrate with. I wish for a moment that Callie had been real, and that she and I could jump and hug and clap our hands about this opportunity. But then I wouldn't have met Cal, and I wouldn't even be in the position to make this change in my life without him. I know that if I went in and shook him awake, he'd give me a high five. I could probably convince him to have sex again in celebration, but I also know that he needs his rest so he can be on top of his game at work right now. So I just smile and pat his door as I walk past his room. I head off to bed feeling satisfied for the first time in a long while. Chapter 34 Cal I'm not expecting my cousin Orla to show up at the steel mill, so I almost drop a pile of files when she inserts herself into my new office. Jesus, Callum, she snorts, plunking her messenger bag on the chair. You need me more than I thought. Who sent you? It comes out like some sort of threat in a thriller movie, and I realize I'm pretty darn tired. I start looking around for my snack stash to see if I've got anything caffeinated. I heard my dad and Uncle Mick talking about this disaster, Orla says, rooting through her bag and finding a banana, handing it to me. The smell of it when I crack open the peel has a hypnotizing effect, and I sink into my chair, which groans. How did Tony work in these conditions for so long? So, anyway, you emailed the head of mechanical, which is great, but obviously you are also going to need to consult with someone from electrical. That's me. She pulls out her iPad and loops a set of earplugs around her neck. Tell me where you are right now, and I'll tell you who you need to call to help get this fixed. Dad told me I had to do it. I sigh, smashing my forehead down against the desk, which I finally managed to clear off. Did he say you personally had to do something outside your skill set? Did he really say you, Callum Brady, were meant to tighten every screw and solder every joint on that bridge? I shake my head. Orla sounds an awful lot like my Uncle Kellen, just with more ire behind her words. What's the number one motto at work, Cal? I just blink at her a few times, too tired to argue and not really sure if this is a rhetorical question. She rolls her eyes at me. Hire the right person for the job, Orla says. She starts screwing the earplugs in and slips a set of safety goggles on her face before flipping her ponytail so it sticks out of her hard hat. You coming with me? I trail behind her as she starts talking to the crew working on the conveyor. They're definitely nicer to her than they are to me. For as long as I can remember, Orla has been the only girl in any of her engineering environments, even at a huge school where tons of women enrolled in environmental and mechanical and civil engineering. The electrical specialty was a huge sausage party. Orla always says she has to be mean so they don't turn on her. Watching her now, I'm certain everyone listens to her because she's so damn competent. Expertise seems to swirl around her like a current. Why aren't you in charge of everything? 
I marvel at how quickly Orla checks over the specs for repairing the wiring in the damaged conveyor. You're asking the right questions, at least, she shouts as someone nearby starts sawing apart the crumpled metal to be hauled out of here. Look, Cal, you can still oversee this project personally, but you need a project manager who's used to working on projects that span multiple departments. I think you need to tap Dakota. I wince. She's Uncle Kellen's favorite person at work. There's no way he's going to let her go from whatever else she's working on. Orla looks at me like I'm the stupidest person she ever met. She's probably right. Cal, this is a steel client. Do you know how many zeros they add to the Beltane revenue? You're an idiot if you don't think Dad is waiting for you to call Dakota over here. Did your dad send you over here, Orla? Is this some kind of test? Of course it's a test, but no, like I said, I'm here to oversee the electrical. Because unlike you, I aspire to climb the ranks at work and run the department someday, and I need to seize opportunities like this when they come up. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You think I want to sit and file paperwork for my entire life? She shrugs. You never do or say anything to suggest otherwise. I just thought you were content. What is she even talking about? I've complained about my lack of responsibility at work for years. Years. You can't tell me you don't know I hate inspection write-ups. Big deal, you hate them. What initiative have you taken to do anything else? Orla turns as she notices a beeping sound from across the room and sighs. I gotta go look into that. Call Dakota. Trust me. I'm a little shaken up by this whirlwind visit, and I start to wonder if I imagined the whole thing. Like, maybe I'm exhausted and she's some sort of hallucination sent to make me question my entire existence. Do people really think I'm just content? I drag my hands through my hair and look around at the chaos that is my new home until I restore order. Somehow. Right. I mutter. I literally don't know Dakota's last name or how to look up her number. I have to call the freaking front desk and ask Em to connect me. Dakota picks up right away. Hey, Dakota, Cal Brady. Oh, hey. She doesn't sound surprised to hear from me. So, I'm sure you've heard about the conveyor collapse? I bite my nails as she tells me that everyone at work is scared to breathe too loudly around my dad, and how Uncle Kellen showed up today with his top button undone. I swear he's a minute away from rolling up his sleeves, she says. I should laugh. If I were less terrified and overwhelmed, I'd probably laugh at the thought of my uncle looking rumpled. But yes, Dakota continues, I was sort of expecting your call. I can be there in an hour, but I'll email you some cascades and punch lists right now. My phone bings with an email notification as she speaks. Wait, you have all this stuff ready to go? Like I said, I was expecting you to call. I know this project predates me, but I pulled up the notes from my predecessor, which wasn't easy because everything was all handwritten then. That bridge was reaching the end of its life, but I guess nobody quite expected this. Thank you for saying nobody expected it. I breathe out. My family acts like I'm a royal fuck-up for not expecting this. That's not entirely true, I remind myself. I feel bad for putting her in a position where she has to comfort me. I hang up with Dakota who says she will get here as soon as she can. I look through all the organized charts she put together of who specifically is responsible for what, on what timeline. Glancing down the list, I'm relieved to see calling in Frank was the right move, and it seems like his crew is on schedule for the repairs. Dakota even has notes on here for when I'm supposed to email updates to my uncle to sign off on. It's strange to see my name in so many different slots on this list, as point person and the decision maker. Like I just told Orla, I've been desperate for more responsibility. Now that I have it for something like this, I feel really inadequate. In my office, which seems less dreadful now that I've finally filed all the piles of crap lying on every surface, I sit down and really study the lists. I think about the past few weeks leading up to this moment, starting with my birthday. I'm not proud of anything I've done recently. All of it has been impulsive, reckless. God, especially sleeping with Logan. I feel like an utter slime ball for messing with her trust that way, just because I felt horny and couldn't control my urges. Tamping down those feelings of self-loathing, I look at Dakota's spreadsheet and find the first task with my name on it. 
Of course, she has hyperlinks to the schematics of each machine component on the manufacturer's website. I pull up my design software and, for the first time in a really long time, get to work on actually engineering a solution to a problem. Chapter 35 Logan The air feels different at Vinia. I decide this must be because the offices are in a brand new building with tons of south-facing windows and the whole space is filled with light. As the receptionist walks me to meet Sam, I notice that all the employees on the floor have privacy walls that move up and down in their workspace, depending if they're on the phone or collaborating on a project. Everyone has a happy expression on their face, and seeing the contrast to the energy at my current office takes my breath away. I'm actually winded when Sam pulls me in for a hug as she greets me before saying, Sorry, I know I'm supposed to ask first if you're a hugger. I'm a hugger. I'm so happy you're here. We sit down in her office, which looks an awful lot like my living room in the condo. She's got a couch and a fridge, a table and chairs. Her own desk is a small one off in the corner, with one of those yoga ball chairs and a floor lamp. Everything in here screams comfort and approachability. I've got some paperwork, she says. I want to talk numbers with you and tell you what I need most. And then I want to hear all of your worries so I can address them. She shows me the Vinia software I've seen appear as a budget line item for so many of the companies I've suggested my clients invest in. We watch a promotional video explaining how the software works. Wow, I say as the short clip ends. I was expecting a lot more jargon there, she beams. The target audience for that isn't the scientists who will use the software, she explains. This one is aimed at investors we need to convince to fund the software. She tells me she hired a great PR firm with staff members who have degrees in the hard sciences. They can translate all my data brain dumps into gold nuggets for rich people to scoop up, Sam winks. But like I said, I need a numbers gal. My focus is on the solutions, on coding them and building them out so they're tailored to research institutions, startups, and huge biotech firms. I've got people doing my hustling. I need someone like you to manage the forecasts. She slides me a contract, and my eyes bulge when Sam taps the highlighted salary figure. That can't be right. I slide the contract back to her. That's more than I'm earning now. Way more. That's industry standard for someone with your degree, she tells me. This would be a promotion, Logan, in every way. She thumbs through the contract, looking for something. Ah, here. Last night I asked my legal counsel if there would be any concerns about poaching you. Did you bring your contract? My MJ can check it to be totally sure, but said this is a totally different industry and your non-compete clause shouldn't be an issue at all. My jaw works up and down as I take in everything she's saying. Our HR person can review all the nitty-gritty with you. We've got a gym on site and showers and all that crap. You can work from home if you want. We serve lunch and breakfast here every day. On-site childcare, PTO. You'll probably understand the retirement options better than I do. Sam leans back in her chair and takes a sip of water. Tell me your worries, Logan. Cause I want you here. An hour later, I have exhausted every nervous concern I can think of, and Samantha grins at me like a Cheshire cat. I don't want you to sign today, she says. I want you to go show all this to Juniper, or whichever lawyer you like, and I want you to sleep on it. And then I want you to sign it electronically so we don't have to go through the extra step of scanning it. That's so annoying, and I hate physical paper. You saw that in the promo video. I laugh, and then I bite my lip. Honestly, all of it sounds too good to be true, Sam. Friendly colleagues, a pleasant work environment. Sam rolls her eyes. You've obviously never worked anywhere run by women before, she says. I take leadership very seriously. I take classes on this shit because it's important. Building a sense of belonging for everyone. Did you notice there's no stairs in this building? I don't ever want to have to retroactively add a ramp to accommodate someone who uses a mobility tool. 
My ideas can't change the world if I'm not looking at everyone who lives in this world. I don't just talk about equity and inclusion. I pay cold, hard cash to experts to help me bring diverse minds to the table at the planning stage of everything. Sam grabs my hands and looks into my eyes. Vinia has the potential to be something amazing, Logan. I know it. I want you to help make it so. Whoosh. This feels so different from when I visited the recruiting events in grad school. The companies I visited seemed to care more about my GPA and the prestige of the school than the skills I was building. Samantha seems like she can see through my skin and shockingly likes what she sees in there. I'm not used to feeling appreciated. I leave the Vinia campus. It's weird to me to use that word for a workplace, but it definitely has the collaborative, inquisitive feeling of a place of learning and feel unsettled. I don't know what to do with myself, but know I can't go home in this state of mind or I'll do something rash. I take a few deep breaths and then pull out my phone, deciding it's close enough to lunch that maybe I can catch Nicole and pick her brain while she takes a break. She answers after one ring. Oh my God, did Sam will you? Are you going to work for her? You have to tell me everything. I laugh. She's trying her best. Hey, do you have a few minutes? I hear a loud clanging sound in the background. Ha, huh, I've got 30. Where are you? Wanna come for lunch? I hustle across the Rachel Carson Bridge to the Stag Law Office building, where Alice is apparently just serving lunch for the entire company. Nicole meets me at the door and rushes me into the cafeteria where she snags Alice from behind the serving line. It's sandwiches today, Al, Nicole says. Let everyone just take their own shit. You have to come sit with us and hear Logan's scoop. Thrown off guard once again by their friendliness, I find myself seated in a cozy booth with a tray of sandwiches and fruit. Nicole even drops a pickle onto my plate. The scene is both an echo of and totally opposite from the diner where I spent my formative years. How many times did I serve lunch to groups of colleagues like this, talking about something important in their world? And now it's me, sitting down with successful career women, biting into the pickles instead of serving them. I still feel anxious about what leaving will mean for my clients, I confess, as Nicole nods. She folds her fingers on the table and clicks her tongue. Our clients here are like family, she tells me. I don't even really have any business connecting with our clients, and I still love all of them. So I get that. But you know what? Sometimes our lawyers leave and go on to better things, like being elected judge, and we find someone else new and lovely to take on those clients. Alice beams. Tim agonizes over reassigning clients when someone leaves. Hell, it's hard enough for him to delegate clients to his staff to begin with. He'd be a total micromanaging monster if we didn't have Donna here to yell at him. Um, and me. Thank you very much. Nicole throws a grape at Alice. Yes, of course. You yell at Tim very effectively. Alice looks at me. Nicole is always right, you know, even if it doesn't feel like it at first. The only actual question here is whether you want to be a total big swinging dick and take all your current clients on as angel investors for Vinia. My jaw drops. I would never do that, I tell them. That feels really slimy. Nicole shrugs then you'd better go give them your notice and get to work for Sam. It's your boss's problem if he doesn't have anyone else capable of making your clients happy. We eat together for a while, and Alice talks about how the baby is kicking her in the organs. Nicole rolls her eyes and says she doesn't care about babies, but I suspect she's not being totally genuine about that. Before I can decide whether I should ask if she and Zach have talked about kids, Nicole asks to see my contract. You should have Tim look at it, she says. He will make a referral if he thinks you need a more specialized opinion. That would be amazing, I tell her, swallowing the last of my lunch. I really appreciate the help. Alice pulls Nicole in for a hug and kisses her on the cheek. We help each other out in this family, Alice says. And family for us includes everyone we care about. Alice reaches out and squeezes my hand. I hope you know that includes you too, Logan. This time I don't succeed at holding back my tears. 
I don't know how to tell you what that means to me, I say. I haven't had a lot of people on my side in the past. Well, Alice says, slamming down her juice glass. From now on, your bigger problem will be holding us back if someone is mean to you. As Nicole spies Tim and barks at him to come over, I say, it feels like my whole life is changing. Nicole rolls her eyes. Well, good, she says. You were overdue for a shakeup. Chapter 36 Cal I haven't been home during daylight hours in days. I've texted Logan a few times just to let her know I'm still alive, but I'm barely hanging on, and I'm desperate for some rest by the time the whistle blows at the end of the day shift on Friday. I find Dakota and Frank and let them know I'm going to head out. Dakota grins. No reason for you to stay, Cal. We're right on schedule. I feel frozen in place even after her go-ahead, and I scratch the back of my neck while I watch her clicking around on her tablet device. She eventually slides it into her bag and looks startled to see me still standing there. I'm heading out, too. Seriously, things are okay here. Frank nods in agreement, waving as he makes his way toward the second shift captain. We're working three shifts a day on this situation, weekends, too, but Dakota says the line will be back up and running in a few days. Go home, Callum. Take a shower. Go to bed early. I'll see you back here at nine tomorrow. Not six? She laughs and waves, heading to the parking lot. I blow out a breath and follow her, heading home. There's a huge package for me in the lobby, so I heave it up on my shoulder and make my way into the apartment. Slicing it open, I see that it's the dishes I ordered. Hey, now, I say, tossing down my stuff and unpacking the box. I'm reaching up to put the dishes in the cupboard when I hear the door open and Logan rushes inside. Oh my gosh, is it you? In real life? She looks happier than when I last saw her which I remember was a few hours after I was inside her. God, what a mess. It's me, I say, and hold up a dish. Finally doing my part here. I stretch up again to put the dish in the cupboard, and I'm startled when I feel Logan wrap her arms around me. I nearly drop the plate when she reaches up to try and kiss me. Hey, now, I say, stepping back. I see her face crumple, so I hold out my hand. Lo. I'm sorry. I lean back against the counter. She looks like she's going to cry. God, I fuck everything up. Come here. I try to hug her, but she's stiff and feels like she's holding her breath. I'm sorry, I say. I've been... Logan shakes her head and cuts me off. No, I'm sorry. I know you're tired. You've got a lot on your plate. Plate? Get it? I hold up another dish and wave it at her. She cracks a smile, but I can tell some of the light has gone out in her eyes. I've really messed things up with her. And I mean, obviously. I slept with her and then haven't talked to her in days. Days. Jesus, I'm a dick. She climbs up on the counter next to me and pulls her knees up to her chest, looking like a young girl. So what happened at work? I know it was an emergency, but... I lean against the counter next to her and give her the overview. It's been bad, but is it wrong that I'm feeling okay about how things are shaking out this week? Now that I've got Dakota and Frank and even Orla all working together, it feels really... invigorating. Logan smiles. That's really great, Cal. Why would that be wrong? I shrug. I know my dad thrust me into this hoping I'd fail so he could, I don't know, finally fire me or something and send me away. She reaches for my arm. I don't think that's true, Cal. I shake my head quickly. No, it is. I mean, why would he and my uncle plunk me in such a big role otherwise? They've been giving me shit work to do for years. What if they knew you were up for the challenge? I lean my head back on the cupboard and close my eyes. I don't think so. But you know, it does feel like a challenge. In a good way. I tell Logan about my idea to make the new conveyor less vulnerable to temperature changes from the furnace. I've been reading about some new material coatings, I tell her. Even called in some of our guys with a chemical background. And I'm working with them on engineering a new design for the mechanics. It's actually pretty cool. That sounds right up your alley, 
Logan says, relaxing her body a little. Tell me more. And so I do. I tell her about this new vendor I found who is making cool sensors. We're going to put these tiny stickers with wireless sensors all along the conveyor and a bunch of other parts of the seal process, actually. These sensors are heat resistant, and I believe they will prevent this sort of thing from happening again. I haven't spoken directly with my uncle, but Dakota sent in the budget and everything has been approved. I shrug. I just hope the client is happy. Logan seems to be hanging on my every word, which reminds me how good a roommate she is. She's always listening to me and supporting me. It's another reminder that I can't be stomping all over her goodwill. I absolutely cannot look at her cleavage while she's perched on the counter next to me. I start putting the dishes away again, so I'm not tempted to ogle her. You didn't have to buy all new dishes, Cal, she says. I don't mind sharing with you. I shrug. I feel like I'm contributing here. She climbs down from the counter and wraps her arms around me again. You definitely contribute, she says, looking up at me with huge eyes. And then she reaches again to try and kiss me, and I jerk my head back, because I can't keep going there with her, not if I want to be able to sleep at night. I watch her smile melt, and I don't know what to say, how to explain to her that I need to grow up, that I can't keep being the guy who bonks his roommate just because it feels good the guy who crashes boats and fucks up checking measurements. Logan, I whisper, swallowing thickly as I see that I'm hurting her. I can't do this. I think we made a mistake getting physical. She stiffens and backs away, smoothing out her shirt and shaking her head. Of course, she says. She starts nodding and grabbing dishes, stacking them on the counter. I'm sorry for crossing a line, Cal. It won't happen again. Hey, I say, reaching for her arm. But now it's her turn to jerk out of the way. I'm actually going to change. It's been kind of a long day and I might just go to bed early. She bites her lip. Are you around tomorrow? I shake my head. I have a few more days of intense work on the conveyor. She nods. Okay, well, I'll see you around. She hurries down the hall and slams her door closed before I can think of something to say to make her feel better. Shit, I say, slapping the counter where a week ago I had her screaming my name in pleasure. Even when I try to do the right thing, I fuck it up. Chapter 37 Logan I feel so foolish. I walked into the apartment so high and energized by my week. I heard back from Tim and went over my Vinia contract. I even talked through a few different things with Sam and was so excited to see Cal and just tell him everything. And then I had to mess everything up and try to kiss him. I just equated my happiness with our physical experiences in my head. Clearly that was a huge mistake. Isn't that what Cal called our hooking up? A mistake? I feel tears rolling down my cheeks as my heart pounds in my chest. I hate feeling this way. It's like when people manage to rip the rug out from under me in social situations. I'm always caught off guard. I always think I understand reality and am reading people accurately. I really thought things were different with Cal. We shared something so intense. Maybe it wasn't intense for him. He certainly has more experience in that arena. It occurs to me that maybe he slept with me out of pity. How many times did he mention that he couldn't believe I'd never had a good sexual experience? I hear him continuing to slam things around in the kitchen. It's clear that Cal enjoys living here with me. He invested in domestic stuff he never had before. He just wants to keep a boundary when it comes to physical stuff. I choke down the lump in my throat, knowing he's probably wise to set that limit. After all, I'm just starting to fall in love with his family. I need them. Romantic relationships fizzle, but friendships stick around. Or so I've heard. I wipe the tears from my face, wondering if I'll ever really be able to trust someone with my feelings and my secrets and my body. I swallow thickly and shake my head, 
One thing I do know I can control is my work. I have everything in place, and even now, while I'm questioning my sanity, I can still see the right decision for my career. I pull out my laptop and digitally sign the contract with Vinia and send that back to Sam. Next, I email Mr. Alexander, skipping right over Marie in the chain of command, to let him know I've accepted an offer as the finance director at a research company. The email could serve as my notice but I believe they'll want me gone effective immediately, since they won't want me to poach clients or anything. I fall asleep, feeling empty and full at the same time. My phone rings at six. I slept fitfully, wondering when I'd start getting calls from work. I recognize the number as one from my office, but don't have it saved in my phone, so it's not Marie. Hello? Logan! It's Mr. Alexander. Your email comes as quite a shock. He seems distraught, which isn't entirely unexpected. I take a deep breath and remind myself to stick with the script. I actually have a script that I put together with Orla, Maddie, and Nicole via text messages all week. It's my first time being part of a group chat, in fact. I was offered an opportunity that was too good to pass by, I say. This is a big move for my career, but as I mentioned, I'm happy to stay on and help transition my clients to other analysts. Mr. Alexander sputters, and it sounds like maybe he slaps a piece of furniture. Is this about money? I can match a salary increase. I shake my head. Maddie predicted they'd offer me more money, and she urged me to just stick with facts. I'm sorry. I start to apologize. And then I remember Nicole adamantly insisting that I should never apologize for following my career goals. I clear my throat. My new position is a vertical move, Mr. Alexander. It's a real opportunity for me as an analyst. Rudy is going to lose his ever-loving mind, he says with a growl, to think about all the work that went into landing him. And he was adamant that you be the one to work with him. What can I do to persuade you to stay? I sigh. Mr. Alexander, the culture at your company is not a good fit for me. I told you to come to me if those imbeciles threatened the bottom line, he nearly roars. I wince and hold the phone out from my face. It's very early, and I have plans today, I say, faking more confidence than I feel. My arms are shaking with adrenaline from this confrontation, but I'm glad it's happening over the phone and not in person. Please let me know whether you'd like me to help with the transition or whether I should come collect my things on Monday. Now it's his turn to sigh. You know you can't maintain access to accounts if you've already signed with another company, even if it's not a competitor. I'll have security box your personal belongings and you can turn in your badge and computer Monday morning. He hangs up. I start shaking in earnest. I really need a friend right now to reassure me that I've done the right thing. Why should I be responsible for Mr. Alexander's frustration at work? Because I always feel responsible when people around me are upset. Strong emotions have always been forbidden to me. I open the door to my room and pad down the hall softly to see if Cal is awake. His door is open, and my heart swells, hoping I can at least confide in him, hoping he'll make me laugh and maybe take me out for pancakes. But his room is empty. When I look by the front door, his boots and bag are gone. I'm all alone, like always. Chapter 38 Logan Did you send it? Nicole starts texting me after I've collapsed into the couch, feeling empty. Do you work with Sam now? I have to know. I consider just throwing my phone on the floor and trying to ignore the world for a few hours. But avoiding other people is my old MO, and making changes the past few months has felt pretty good, apart from today. God, I'm a mess. I dial Nicole's number. Spill, she says, and I hear shuffling sounds in the background, like she's jumping out of bed and bothering Zach. I take a deep breath. Mr. Alexander did not take my resignation very well, I tell her. He called everyone else at work imbeciles, too, which they are. But the boss shouldn't say those kinds of things, right? 
I expect Nicole to retort with something snappy and crass, but she takes a deep breath on her end of the phone, and there's a pause. Hey, Logan, I know that kind of shit is not easy to hear. Can I take you out for brunch, and we can talk about it? Brunch? I'm rattled by the idea of going out in public. I'd have to do something about my face, for starters. I don't know, Nicole. Hmm, she counters. Why don't I come to you? Text me your address. I'll order takeout. Is Cal there? I'm not getting enough to share with him. He eats like a hog. Oh, I should see if Emma and Maddie want to come over. They're really excellent listeners. I hear muffled noises as Nicole talks, and I can almost see her throwing on clothes and grabbing her bag. I hear the beep of a car alarm, and her voice skips briefly when Bluetooth picks up her call. I'm on the move, Logan. I'm hanging up so I can use my voice to text and deal with everything. Did I tell you that fucking voice in my phone finally understands all my cuss words? I can't help but sneak a small smile when we hang up, although it's short-lived. I take stock of myself and decide I need to at least wash my face and put on a bra if an undetermined number of foof ladies are coming to my house. God, where will everyone sit? Cal and I just have the small table and a few stools at the counter. What if they want to sit on the deck? I only have one flimsy camp chair out there. I can't believe I'm about to host my very first social gathering of my adult life, and I'm sitting here like a total slob. The intercom beeps, jolting me back to awareness from my anxiety fit. Nicole? I don't expect a loud, woo, I hear back, and I smile, pushing the button and opening the front door. A minute later, I see and hear Nicole, Maddie, and Emma, with my new boss, with Juniper Jones, bringing up the rear. Piper's exercising, obviously, and Chloe has an emergency meeting with her cover designer. Something about man nipples getting censored? Nicole plunks bags on the counter as she talks. Orla is apparently with your roommate at the factory. Do we still say factory? Plant? Oh, and we don't call Esther before noon. Remember that. Girlfriend owns a bar and works till two in the morning. Juniper waves a bottle of champagne and asks for a dish towel so she can uncork it. How did you all get here so fast? With food. Juniper shrugs. I'm knocking on doors today in the East End anyway. Nicole talked me into a pit stop. Emma sprawls out on the couch. I just wanted to get away from my kids. I love them. Also, I'm sick of them. And as you know, I live near you. Now we're best friends and co-workers, so you have no hope for any work-life balance. Samantha starts pouring orange juice into glasses from my cupboard, muttering that this would all be better with actual champagne flutes. Look, Nicole's text said you're upset about some nonsense with asshole men, and I want to hear about that. But first, she hands everyone a glass and stands in the middle of my living room, smiling in the sunshine from the patio. We need to celebrate, Logan. I'm excited. You're bringing amazing talent to my baby. Obviously, in this metaphor, my company is my baby. No offense to human babies. None taken, Emma and Maddie shout. Juniper just rolls her eyes. So, Logan Miller, here's to freeing your fucks and taking a leap and helping me out. To Logan, everyone says, and they all clink glasses. I feel overwhelmed. I feel so celebrated and seen, and it's just too much for me on top of my boss yelling and Cal's rejection yesterday. So instead of drinking my mimosa, I sit on the stool at my counter and start crying. Oh dear, Maddie says, reaching into her fanny pack and pulling out a tissue. She walks over to me and pulls me into a hug. Come here, Logan. Let it out. I've got you. And nestled in her surprisingly strong embrace, I do. I cry until I'm not sure why I'm crying. All the stress of the past few months at work starts leaking out in my tears. All the anger that life was so hard for my mom that she had so little support. All my confusion at my complicated feelings for Cal. I cry it all out while Maddie hugs me and everyone stands around me drinking and watching. When I stop, I take deep breaths and Juniper slides me a plate of food. You should eat something, she says, and I do. Samantha leans on the counter with her elbows, taking bites of quiche and chugging her mimosa. God, I hope I never make an employee cry based on our office culture. 
Can this guy seriously not tell that his employees are miserable? I shrug. He never really mingles. I only ever saw him at big meetings. Sam taps her chin. Do you think the Vinia people are sick of seeing me? I see everyone, like, every day. Nicole snaps her fingers. You are not going to allow this man rent-free space in your head, Samantha Vine. You're the best boss to ever boss anyone around, apart from me. And Juniper, obviously. Juniper winks. I'm wondering, apart from him being an asshole, of course, if Logan is suffering from imposter syndrome. Say what now? Maddie grabbed all the sweet crepes from the brunch buffet Nicole brought and keeps swatting Emma's hand away when she tries to taste the Nutella confection. Imposter syndrome. Juniper looks at me sternly. It's when you feel like a big faker when something good happens to you, like you don't deserve it or you haven't earned it properly. My eyes widen as she speaks. Juniper nods. Look, I know you know I grew up in foster care. When I went to college, I had a lot of that. Hell, I wound up living with a man who didn't deserve me, just because he was the first one to be nice to me. Imposter syndrome makes you doubt that you have earned your success, even if there's rational evidence that you're awesome. Nicole snorts. Juniper continues. So instead of running around Boston demanding everyone bask in my brilliance, I felt like I was lucky to be there, like I was a minute away from someone discovering that I was a fraud. Oh my God, yes. Yes, I lean forward. You're describing my life right now. Why am I like this? Juniper shrugs. We have a lot of systems that really suck at taking care of people. If you care to read my judicial platform, I can show you how I'm working to improve these things from the bench, like making it harder to evict people and making it way harder to raise rents unfairly. I clutch at my chest. What my mom would give to have had you overseeing her case for half my life. Juniper grabs my hands. Logan, nothing about your background means you are unworthy, she shrugs. You just need to tell yourself every day that you're amazing. You do amazing things. You have amazing friends. We are amazing, Sam says with her mouth full of food. She swallows and grins. I feel a lump forming in my throat again. You're my friends? Oh, Jesus Christ, Nicole shouts. Of course we're your friends, Juniper. How do we help her with this syndrome? She shrugs. We just keep showing up when she needs us. Everyone is quiet for a few minutes, just eating and drinking our mimosas. It's overwhelming, but feels really nice. Comforting. Maddie, I don't care if you're pregnant. You have to let me try at least one of the chocolate ones. Emma dives across the table to grab the last bite from Maddie's fork. They both laugh as Emma wrenches the fork out of Maddie's hand. Liam would die before he'd share silverware with someone, Maddie says, reaching for a scone, since Emma took her crepe. And yet he licks your fork for hours, Nicole says, laughing at her own joke. She turns toward me. The Brady men are good with their tongues, she says, slapping high five with Maddie across the table. I blush, remembering how true this is. I don't say anything, but Juniper shouts, oh, stag men too, cheers to that. Emma raises her glass. Samantha stares at me. Well, I'm not fucking a stag or a Brady, but I want to know why Logan is making that face right now. I'm not making a face, I say too quickly. I'm just thinking of the red coat, I lie. Nicole sits back in her chair and crosses her arms, staring at me. You guys totally fucked, she says, nodding. I feel my heart rate increase again. Just when I was starting to calm down after all the emotions this morning, I really don't want to talk about this with Cal's brother's girlfriends. I start shaking my head rapidly, but I don't want to lie to them. Not after that big speech about how they will be here for me. Because they're my friends. It's not like that, I mutter. But then I start crying again, so I quickly try to hide my face inside my mimosa. Nicole leans forward. Not like what? Like... No, Cal didn't ram his rod in your musket, or... She drifts off and I stare at her. Then Maddie. Everyone is silent, staring, and waiting for me to say something. God, even my new boss is here waiting to see what I'm going to say. I close my eyes. He said it was a mistake. I whisper. Oh, Christ. Here we go, Juniper says. She opens another bottle of champagne and starts filling everyone's glass. 
Maddie wraps her hand around the top of her glass and reaches for the juice. First of all, Maddie says, these Brady men say a lot of really dumb shit. I shake my head. He thinks it's better if we're just roommates. And something occurs to me and I start crying again. I'm the one who told him it should have been a one-time thing. I said that. But then we did it again. Maddie nods. They're irresistible. I get it, babe. He's trying to focus on this big emergency at work and making up with his dad and... I look around and bite my lip, worried about spilling too many secrets to Cal's family. He just made me feel really good. And I am the one who went back on what I said. But he was saying my name, so I thought it meant something. But I read it wrong. My breath hitches as I exhale. Oh, Cal, you beautiful moron, Nicole mutters. Please don't call him that. Oh, honey, if he says it was a mistake to raid your honeypot, then he's definitely a moron. Do you think it was a mistake? I shake my head rapidly before I can think about the best response. No, it was, it was all I wanted to do after I signed my contract with Vinia. And I really wanted to talk to him after I put in my notice at work, and he's just not here. He does seem to run off when there's something big to discuss, Maddie says. She sighs. That whole family. They haven't had a lot of practice communicating. Plus, they're engineers. Sam perks up. What's that got to do with anything? Nicole shrugs. They're so busy thinking about efficiency that they never pause to consider the human, emotional aspect of anything. Liam does like a nice, efficient conversation, Maddie says. He makes checklists about potential topics. She grins. I make checklists, I shout. I even sent Cal meeting invites with an agenda. Yeah, you should probably move in with Liam. Maddie laughs, but seriously, I think Cal's always tried to be the diffuser, always cracking a joke to ease the tension, that sort of thing. I swallow. I guess I'm too much bad energy for him, I say, prompting Juniper to grunt. Nuh-uh, that's imposter syndrome again. What if he said that for a dumb reason? Like when Ty and I first got together, I rejected him because he was my boss's brother. Never mind that he was my greatest supporter and made me feel like a goddess. Everyone sighs collectively as Juniper talks about how much she loves Ty. I remember the media clips from when Juniper won gold at the Olympics. The entire internet was on fire, talking about how obviously smitten Ty was as he celebrated her win. I really thought Cal was looking at me that way the night of the gala. Maybe Juniper's right. I guess I need to talk to him, I say, and slump down in my seat. If he ever comes home. Maddie winces. Liam says things are pretty bad at the steel mill, like, really bad. Nicole points an index finger at the ceiling. These disasters aren't forever. Not that it's the same scale, but my backyard sliding into the river was really bad, and the engine nerds were deeply engrossed for a long time. And then they weren't, so we could talk it out. This will pass, Logan. Sam bangs her glass on the counter. Well, that's enough talking about angry men who aren't good at feelings, she says. Back to Logan's celebration. What are we doing this afternoon? Um, hello, Juniper waves around a pile of campaign literature. How about you all help me get reelected? Samantha knits her brows, considering. The thought of knocking on other people's doors right now terrifies me, and not just because my face is puffy from crying. But Maddie leaps to her feet. Yes, duh, of course we'll help you, Juniper. Now, can you explain what exactly you are trying to do? Because I actually have no idea. In the end, Juniper convinces us all to come to her campaign headquarters, since none of us ever knocked on people's doors before. When we arrive, there's a flurry of activity as Juniper's campaign manager organizes volunteers into groups based on which neighborhoods they'll visit. Someone has taped talking points to the wall, giant bullet points of Juniper's philosophy as a judge, compassion, empathy, fairness. Nicole and I get assigned to fold and organize information packets, while Sam, Emma, and Maddie hit the streets to talk with neighbors. This is amazing, I tell Nicole. Everyone is like a big team here. She just nods. Women of foof, stick together. She squeezes my hand. It won't always be you feeling overwhelmed and needing support. It's all reciprocal. 
I eavesdrop on a few phone calls, listening to campaign staffers talk to voters about what issues matter to them. I start crying when I read about the impact Juniper has made on evictions in Pittsburgh. She set up a program where people who struggle to make rent are connected with social services. There are even grants for single mothers to help cover the gaps. I realize that in accepting her help to further my own career, I have connected myself to Juniper's mission, and now I'm helping her help families like mine. The whole morning fills me with hope. Suddenly, my former boss's harsh words sting less. I stand up from my completed pile of folded and organized pamphlets and walk to the head volunteer. I want to do more to help, I tell her. Where do I sign up? Chapter 39 Cal I grab my hair at the roots and silently scream after Logan storms out of the kitchen. I had no idea it was possible to feel so deeply, thoroughly like garbage. I'm in a weird place with my family, work is a shambles, and I just hurt my roommate, who has been the most supportive person in my life the past few months. I punch the counter until my knuckles split, not knowing what else to do with my frustration. How long has it been since I went for a run? I know I'm supposed to be resting before going back to the mill, but I feel like I have hornets inside my skin. I rip off my shirt and yank on a pair of mesh shorts and my sneakers, making sure I put my ID and my key in the zip pocket. I tear out of our building into the dark, not stopping at intersections, but just turning right each time until I'm able to cross streets without waiting. I don't know how much time passes or where I'm headed. I think about how badly I want to change and how much I have no idea what to do about it. Before Logan... All I really cared about was restoring my Bronco, and I pound the pavement thinking about how pathetic that makes me. When I feel like my legs are about to give out, I stop to get my bearings. I'm actually not too far from home. If I cut through the park, I can be there in a few minutes. It's after midnight when I make my sweaty way into the apartment. I shower as quietly as I can, not wanting to disturb Logan any more than I already have. I notice that, of course, I still haven't replaced her towels, and I scoff at myself as I use her nice linens to dry off. I'm not sure that I actually managed to get any sleep, and it's not yet light out when my alarm goes off, so I head back to the steel mill still feeling like death. Frank and Dakota arrive as I'm parking, and my mood shifts a little bit. I like working with these two. Dakota's a smartass, and she's confident in her work which makes me feel better about my contributions. I smile and walk over to Dakota's car, bending to help her with the crate of paperwork she's trying to haul in. Hey, I say. What's with all this? She beams and hands another crate to Frank. Final approvals on designs, she says. You sign, Frank builds, and off we go. No shit? It seems crazy that all of this work would be ready to go so soon. I feel like it's been a month since the collapse. But I know it's only been about a week, I think. I'm not exactly certain what day it is today. We carry everything to my office, and Dakota walks me through what to sign. Kellen approved all this, she says, waving at a stack to her left. He didn't even send it back for revisions, Cal. That doesn't happen often. So that's a good thing? She blinks a few times. Uh, yeah. Frank rifles through a summary sheet on top of the stack Dakota handed him. We can assemble this today, he says. Our machine team finished up late last night, according to the third shift report. By the time we work our way through the stack, Dakota says she thinks we can get the line back making steel before Monday. Monday? In a few days, this whole nightmare will be over and I can get back to... What? Paperwork? Bad decisions? Dakota and Frank head out of my office, leaving me with instructions to update Dad and Kellen. But I don't know how to pick up the phone and make that call, so I just sit and stare at the wall. Before too long, there's a knock on my wall, and I look up to see my father leaning against the door jamb, dressed for a run. Am I hallucinating? I rub my eyes with the heels of my hands and stare back down at the paperwork I was supposed to report out to him. Nah, I needed to stop in and check on this mess. 
Thought I'd wrap it into my morning sweat. You know, it's not good to skip a workout. Keeps the ticker healthy. Dad doesn't sit, because he hates being still. He stands across my desk, looking at me, snapping his gum, waiting for me to talk, I guess. I was about to call you and Uncle Kel, I say, swallowing and gesturing at the papers on my desk. Dakota and Frank say we could be up and running Monday morning. Dad breaks into a grin and slaps my desk. That's some good news, kid. That's good news indeed. Kellen worried it'd take a month to deal with his nightmare. Kellen approved all the designs last night, apparently, I say, biting my lip. I wonder why my uncle didn't report out to my dad. Kellen doesn't approve just any old designs. Dad walks around the desk and leans on a filing cabinet, gesturing for me to hand him the summary report. He studies it, snapping his gum and nodding, before setting it back down on the desk. You know why I was upset about my boat, Callum? I groan. Dad, I'm so sorry about that. I don't want to make excuses, but it was my birthday, and everyone bailed, and... He holds up his hand. I didn't say I was upset at you, kiddo. Now let me talk. I lean back in my seat and snap my mouth closed. Dad lets out a long sigh through his nose. You're a lot like me, you know? I nod. I never could stand it when the mood got heavy, but I also couldn't sit still long enough to ever do a good job in school. They didn't have ADHD when I was coming up. I roll my eyes. I don't have ADHD, Pop. He waves a hand. I'm talking about me here. Your uncle is the only person in my whole life who never gave up on me. You know that? Why do you think I wanted to go into business with him? My kid brother has been my hero. I think about how important my brothers are to me and nod wondering why I never stopped to think about the bond between my dad and my uncle before. Dad keeps talking. I wasn't a good husband. I'm a lousy boyfriend. I had no idea how to be a father. But I'm damn good at reading people. And your uncle and I make a good business team. Dad. I want to tell him he was a great father, or say something reassuring. But he holds up a hand and keeps talking. You aren't as serious as your brothers and your cousin and I think that's made you think people don't take you seriously. Dad leans forward and puts his hands on the desk so his face is close to mine. But son, there's value in being the peacemaker, in being the person who helps break the tension. I swallow, considering his words. Do you know what it meant to that kid, Jake, that you gave him that old Bronco manual? That kid's own father doesn't even show up to hang out with him. And Kel said Jake's showing that manual around school and using it for his research paper. So, Dad stands back up and wraps his gum in a tissue, reaching in his pocket for a pack of pistachios instead. The boat. When you called me, I was upset we had all let you down on your birthday. You didn't tell us how much that day mattered. I was angry because we shouldn't have needed to be told. Beltane is an important thing to this family but we can't let it be more important than the people in it. Dad pauses to munch his nuts while I swallow, feeling the room close in on me. I don't know what to say, I tell him, pursing my lips. I mean, of course I'm pissed that you wrecked my boat, kid. It cost me my season tickets to the Ironman. Thank that girlfriend of yours for reconnecting me with Rudy, why don't you? He gave me another set. She's my roommate, Dad. He rolls his eyes. You're still an idiot, he says. I know he's joking, but I feel like the exhaustion of the last week, combined with feeling overwhelmed at his earlier speech, just combines until I burst out of my seat. Of course I'm an idiot, I shout. I'm a fool who crashes his dad's boat and ruins all my shirts with food stains and goes home to fuck my roommate instead of figuring out that Tony was fucking up all the data here. I start pacing around the office, shouting. I let myself push paper at work for nine years rather than demand anything more challenging until you thrust my ass into catastrophe cleanup at a steel mill that stinks like hellfire. My life is a total shambles, and I have no idea what happens now. Dad grunts. I knew you were sleeping with Logan. Your uncle owes me 50 bucks. I throw my hands in the air. Jesus Christ, Dad, why are you here? Are you seriously here to kick me when I'm down? To my surprise, he steps forward and wraps his arms around me. I stiffen, unsure what to do next, 
but he just keeps hugging me until I sort of relax into his shoulder. Callum, your life is not a shambles. I shake my head. You helped your brother make peace with his pregnant girlfriend. You fixed your mother's porch railing. Between you and me, I think you helped your uncle get lucky with his neighbor lady. God, Dad, I say into his shirt. You're going to make me puke. He releases me from the hug, but keeps his hand on my shoulder. I put you in charge here because I knew you could fix this situation. I see now that you've been waiting for permission or approval when it comes to Beltane, and that's on me for making you think this company was so precious to me that it can't handle a setback. I groan and sink back into my chair, slumping forward to put my head on my desk. Cal, go home and take a nap. Tell Logan you're into her. Kiss and make up for being an idiot. Then, meet me tomorrow morning at the DeKesney Club. We're going to pitch old Eddie a long-term solution here for the mill. I think you're going to like it, kid. I lift my head a few inches and raise a brow at my father. Please don't be cryptic with me now, Dad. Can you just tell me straight what to expect tomorrow? He laughs. What's the fun in that? He laughs again as I moan. Okay, okay. Dad tells me he and Kellen were intrigued by the vendor I found who uses the sensors and drones. We already have a drone pilot at Beltane, he says. Why should we keep buying other people's hardware when we've got mechanical engineers in-house? My eyebrows shoot up. What are you getting at? Dad tosses me a pouch of pistachios, which I start munching as he talks. We want you to help us make our own drones and sensors, custom for the work we're doing. That machine learning guy your brother brought on board says he can get these things programmed if you can get them flying. You talked to Ray about this? Dad snorts. What do you think we've been doing all week? Sitting around eating snacks? Don't answer that. Anyway, Ray says he can write an algorithm, which your uncle tells me is basically a punch list for computers. You've just spent a decade inspecting pipes and towers and mines. Hell, Cal, you know better than anyone all the different environments where it's safer and more efficient to use a machine to keep an eye on things than it is to send one of our folks in. My eyes widen as he talks, because he's right. I've been making mental notes for ages about how much sooner we could capture a problem for our clients if we weren't relying on human eyes to physically inspect their buildings and machines and structures. Go on home and clean yourself up, Dad says. And don't wear those damn sneakers of yours to this meeting on Sunday. Shined shoes, son. With a final slap on my desk, Dad scoots out of my office, leaving me reeling in my creaking desk chair. Chapter 40 Cal With nothing further to do with the steel mill for the day, I decided to take Dad's advice and head home. I stop at the drugstore for a sports drink, needing to hydrate and think about tomorrow. What a mindfuck. It's been so familiar for so long to assume my family just thinks I'm this big screw-up. From the sound of things, Dad says they all actually appreciate me cutting through the tension, even if they won't admit it. Okay, even if Liam won't admit it. Logan's been on me to talk to my dad for months. Now, hearing all he had to say and getting ready for my meeting tomorrow, I wish I'd listened to her earlier. I wish so many things with Logan. Most of all that I hadn't caused the hurt look on her face in our kitchen last night. She's the first person I want to tell all my news today, and I know she had something to tell me about work. I feel shitty that I didn't get to talk with her about it. I know my dad thinks I should be straight with her, but I still don't know if it's a good idea to get involved. I have a pretty precarious grasp on adulthood without tossing in a complicated romance with my landlord. Hell, she's the one who first said it should have been a one-time thing. But then she's the one who came to me... Because I was jacking off, moaning her name on the couch. Gah! My head is so fucked up. I do need some sort of gesture to make nice with her, though. I decide to wander over to the beauty products section and see if I can figure out what I'd need to buy to have another spa night with her. How good would that feel to put those foot things on again and pass out on the couch together? We could listen to the Redcoat sequel, 
and pig out on fried shrimp while we open our pores or whatever Logan liked from that face goop, like nothing complicated had ever happened to us. Unfortunately for me, there are about fifty different flavors of face goop to choose from, and I furrow my brow, staring, until another customer must feel bad for me because she asks, You need a hand? Uh, yeah. I'm trying to do a spa night with my girl, my friend. Anyway, she likes those foot baggies and the face things. The shopper laughs. She reminds me of my mom. Somehow, Despite my terrible explanation, she hooks me up with a set of lavender mud masks and a set of intensive foot masks, which this lady says will make our feet peel, which this lady further explains is a desirable outcome for a spa night pedicure. I stop internalizing once I get to the word relaxing on the package and check out, hoping I can relax Logan into forgiving me. When I get to the apartment, though, she's nowhere around. I try calling, but her phone goes right to voicemail, and she doesn't respond to my text asking if she is up for a spa night. This sucks. I sigh, looking around the condo. There's a bunch of garbage in the can, which seems unlike Logan to leave, but I bag it all up and toss it in the chute in the hall. I come back inside and decide I can probably clean up a bit since I haven't been pulling my weight in that arena. I find all the cleaning stuff under the sink and scour the counter and stove and faucets. Still no Logan. Sick of checking my phone, looking for her, I decide to brave scrubbing the bathroom. Once I get the shower and toilet scrubbed, I remember that I still need to get some towels, but I don't want to leave and risk her coming home and me not being here. I pull up one of the delivery apps on my phone and see that I can get someone to run basically any errand for me. So I pay out the nose for some guy named Raoul to get me a set of towels, washcloths, and a few pints of ice cream from Target. I envision my mom's place, and remember she has candles sitting around. So I add a few of those onto my order, figuring Logan will like the ambiance. She's had a stressful few months. I scrub, dust, and vacuum the entire condo. I even wipe down the inside of the washer, and I feel good about how nice it looks around here. By the time my order arrives, I'm hungry again, so I call to have Japanese food delivered too. Just as I get the candles lit and the tempura plated, I hear a key in the lock, and my heart jumps a few times in my chest. I look up from the table as Logan comes in the door, and the sight of her takes my breath away. Her skin is all rosy like she's been outside for a while, and she just radiates happiness. She's calm as she sets her water bottle on the counter, but looking around the apartment, she seems confused. Cal? There's a huge question in her voice. What is all this? I shrug. I missed talking to you all week, I tell her. Something really good happened at work today, and I thought maybe we could celebrate with Spa Night. Just Logan and Callie. I wink and love seeing her smile. That actually sounds amazing, she says. My feet and back are killing me. Oh, yeah? I'm about to wonder what she was doing all day to cause that when she sinks onto the sofa and drops her head on the back. Tell me your good work news, Cal, she says, grinning. So I grab a plate and carry it over, sit beside her, and tell her everything. I tell her how I finally talked things through with my dad and how the crisis at the steel mill is averted. I tell her how I'm meeting with Dad and the big cheese tomorrow to talk about a new direction at work. And it's exactly the kind of work I want to be doing, Lolo. I have to resist the deep urge to reach for her hair and twirl it around my fingers. When she turns and smiles at me, I swear I can feel all my worries melt away. I've never seen a look of such pure admiration pointed my way. Cal, she says, squeezing my hand. I'm so glad to hear that you and your dad talked. Gosh, I knew it would be something good once the two of you just sat down and hashed things out. I nod, struggling with a lump of emotions in my chest, remembering again how he told me he wants me to head the project engineering the drones from scratch for Beltane. What's your work news? I whisper, glad she hasn't pulled her hand back, but worried about it all the same. If I'm going to be serious about not hurting her, 
I need to focus on not stringing her along. We can't be friends who secretly fuck. She deserves so much more than that. Can we do our spa feet before I tell you? I thought you'd never ask. I reach to grab her plate and stack it with mine on the coffee table while Logan rips open the foot mask bags. The scent of the lavender overpowers the fried shrimp smell in the apartment, blending with the citrus candles I lit. It definitely smells girly and, I'll admit it, nice. I laugh as we both groan when we peel off our socks. I know what I was doing all day, but what's got your dogs barking? Logan's smile seemed like it stretches all the way to her ears, still pink and a little sunburned. I was volunteering for Juniper's campaign today. She slides the foot baggies on and props her feet on the edge of the coffee table. I scooch it a little closer to the couch since I know her legs aren't as long as mine. Soon, both of us have our feet propped up. Logan snuggles into the couch and says, Cal, it was the most invigorating thing. All the foof ladies were there. Those are all Nicole's networking friends. My friends now too, I guess. She blushes and smiles again. Of course they're your friends, I tell her. So Juniper's volunteers are pretty cool? She shivers. She put so many programs in place. I can't believe how awesome she is. I mean, I can believe it. Cal, she helps families facing eviction. There's all these social services Juniper brings right into the courthouse, so if someone is facing an eviction trial, they can connect with these grants, and the landlord is able to get paid, and the families can get a little cushion to get back on their feet. You know, I think I knew she did that kind of thing. I remember Ty bragging on her one time when she missed a family dinner, and Nicole was trying to give Juniper shit about it. All my instincts are screaming for me to touch Logan while she tells me this stuff. To reach out and just... Massage her shoulders where she's pinching at a sore spot on her neck. I realize that I've been so lucky to get where I am, and I can give back in ways that really help families like mine. Cal, it was the most freeing thing. All this guilt sort of melted away, especially meeting some of the people Juniper has helped. They were volunteering. Hey! She squeezes my arm. I stare down where her hand touches my skin and swallow. Will you come with me tomorrow? I want to help her knock on some doors. What time tomorrow? Oh, right, you have that thing with your dad. Well, I kind of want to go all day, but there are shifts through seven since it doesn't start to get dark till around then. I grin and recross my legs, wiggling my toes in the foot baggies. I'll come right after my meeting with dad. I'll even be dressed nice, so people will take me seriously. Logan nudges me with her shoulder, and then doesn't scoot away toward her under the couch. She's initiating a lot of physical touch, and I'm going to have to crush her joy again and talk to her about it. We have to set up some boundaries. I don't know if I can trust my dad that it would be okay to move ahead with all these changes at work and pursuing something romantic with Logan. Hey, I tell her, you didn't tell me your work news yet. Oh my gosh, that's right. Well, I accepted Sam's offer. I'm going to be the chief financial officer at Venia. The data chick? Nicole's friend? Logan nods and claps her hands. I heard back from all the lawyers, and the contract is solid. I gave my notice at work. Oh my gosh, Cal, it was a nightmare. Mr. Alexander was so angry. Her eyes waver, and she bites her lip. I came out to try and find you after I talked to him, but you had already left today. Oh, Logan, I'm sorry I wasn't here for you. Shit, what did he say? She shakes her head. It's okay. Foof came over. They brought brunch and hugged me and... She smiles and shrugs. I guess that explains all the extra trash I found. Look at you, having chick parties with your lady friends. She beams. We basically went from a Logan pep talk to pressing the flesh for Juniper. Logan winces. That was Nicole's phrase. It doesn't feel right when I say it. I can't help myself, and I do reach out and run my fingers through her hair. Her breath catches as my fingers move through the silky strands. She feels so nice, curled up against me, and her hair feels so smooth and soft. I swallow thickly. I like it when you say things the way you feel, I tell her. She nods. So, 
Monday, security will box up my things, and then... Logan shrugs. I don't start with Sam for two weeks. I'll probably visit my mom and just spend a lot of time helping Juniper. Logan tells me how volunteering closed up wounds she didn't even realize were bleeding in her heart. Her words are so pure and honest, and I know she must trust me so much to say these things to me. I'm so glad you found those gals, I say. It's great to see you so excited. Logan takes a shuddering breath, closes her eyes for a minute, and says, So you said you got face masks too? I hop up carefully and hold my hand out to her. We hold on to each other as we slip and slide down the hall in the booties, laughing hysterically each time one of us wobbles. Once we get to the bathroom, I show her the packets of face goop. I'm told these are very relaxing, I say, offering a pack to her. She smiles, and together we stand in front of the mirror, smearing the stuff on our faces. Logan and I keep looking at each other and laughing. This kind isn't like the first pack she got us that we just plastered on in one sheet. I have to rub the mud around on my face. Logan pulls her hair back in a ponytail, telling me when I miss a spot. Where? I say, leaning close to the mirror. And she shoves the back of my head so my face hits the mirror. She grips the counter, laughing as I try to regain my balance and slip around in the socks. You big jerk, I just cleaned in here! Logan is laughing so hard she starts coughing, and I want to reach for her to shove her back, gently, of course. But I lose my balance and fall on my ass in the bathroom. Oh my God, Cal! She shrieks as she reaches for me and winds up on top of me on the bathroom floor. We lie there for a few beats, in silence, both of us trying to catch our breath. She reaches for my face, and I catch her hand in mine pinning it to my chest. Cal, she whispers. She takes a deep breath, her face covered in purple goop. I, she sighs. I disagree with your assessment that being intimate was a mistake. I feel nauseous. My closest friend is sprawled on top of me, and I've seen her naked. I've made her come, and she's brought me the most intense sexual experience of my life, and I can't. Cal, I know you're thinking a mile a minute. She interrupts my thoughts and places her palms on the tile on either side of my head. I also know your whole family thinks you and I should be together, and... Logan pouts, her brow furrowed behind all the goop. I will terminate your lease if you don't kiss me. Right now. Chapter 41 Logan I can't believe I just threatened Cal. What sort of awful human being am I to threaten to toss him out if he doesn't kiss me? Jesus, he could take me to court over this. I wriggle on top of him to try and find leverage to stand up. But between the bags on my feet and my palms sweating, I just wind up thrusting around on top of him on the floor. Christ, Logan! Cal groans. I feel him stiffen beneath my hips, and I gasp. Will you lie still a minute? I freeze, my body riding up and down as his chest moves with his breath. I can feel his heart pounding, and it's so hard to take him seriously when his face is covered in purple goop. But I know that I am also covered in mud mask, and damn it, he's being a scaredy cat about us. Cal must have insane core strength, because he wraps his arms around my waist and manages to sit up. I wind up kneeling around his hips, my hands still on his shoulders. He opens his mouth like he wants to say something, then closes it again. Logan, his voice is like gravel. With you, I've never felt anything like I did with you. Cal, we are amazing together. I know you felt it. It was like dynamite, Lolo. He takes a deep breath. But I don't know if it was worth risking what we have. What do you mean? I snap back, trying to disentangle myself from him. But between the mud masks and the slippery bags on our feet, I just wind up grinding against his lap until he groans. Lo, 
I mean that I want you more than I've probably ever wanted a woman in my entire life, but our friendship is so important to me. Lo, I can tell you things I've never said, not to anyone. When my dad left my office today, you were the only person I wanted. When you talk to me, things make sense, Lo. Cal, I start shaking my head and take a quivering breath. I feel all of that too. But don't you think that just means we'd be right together? As a couple, and not just as friends? I've never been in a couple before, Logan. I have no idea how any of that works. I shrug and cup his cheeks, not caring that his face is covered in goop. I don't know how it works either, Cal. But I know that it all works better when you're by my side. Cal hooks his mouth into a grin, cracking the mud on his face. It sounds better when you say it that way, Lo. He reaches for my hand, squeezing it. Being with you? I don't want it to just be another impulsive thing I get judged for later. I take a deep breath and close my eyes, swallowing and feeling the mud mask crack. Cal, why is impulsive always bad? Was it impulsive for you to buy all this spa stuff for us tonight? He blinks rapidly, his face shifting as he ponders that. I guess it was. We sit together until our breathing sinks up. This, you and me, it feels really big, and Logan, I'm a little afraid, if I'm honest. Well, good news, I tell him. I'm afraid of basically everything, but I did a whole bunch of scary stuff this month, and it's all working out so far. He chuckles, and we're pressed so closely together, I feel the rumble of his laugh in my own bones. So what you're saying is you're down to fuck, because it'll be scary, but in an exciting way? I nod curling my bottom lip in, and then scowling when I taste the face goop. He starts to laugh and then reaches up and touches his cheek. This stuff feels really weird. Can we wipe it off? He looks down and his t-shirt is covered with purple streaks of mud. Both of my hands are caked in goo. I think it's probably been seven to nine minutes, I say laughing. How's this for an agenda, Cal says. How about we take these bags off our feet and wash up? I thought I was jumping your bones. He leans forward and rips the baggies off my feet and tosses them into the trash. Then he grins a mask-cracking smile as he starts peeling my shirt off. Cal! I want to protest about him getting mud on my shirt, but he leans back and peels his shirt off too. And I'm distracted by his abs. Lo, take off my foot booties so I can get us into the shower. I nod and do as I'm told. And then squeal as Cal jumps up and cranks on the water. The bathroom fills with steam, and he starts kicking off his clothes. I yelp when he jumps forward, and his eyes flash as he starts peeling off my clothes, too. I should feel nervous, standing here in front of him, naked with my face covered in purple mud. But I don't. I feel fully myself, turned on, but comfortable in my anticipation of what is about to happen. Cal backs into the shower and tugs me in by the hand. I look up, and he starts gently rubbing the mud off my face in the water. I reciprocate and love the feel of his skin beneath my hands. It's been just over a week since I touched him this way. For more than an instant, and my body has missed his touch like it misses air when I hold my breath. After a few minutes of scrubbing, Cal's face is fresh and clean in the spray and I extend up on tiptoes, hoping to finally kiss him. Logan, he whispers, I'm going to fuck up. Probably really often. Me too, Cal. But we'll talk about it each time. I can set regular meetings for us to check in if you want. That gets a laugh out of him, and he pulls my body flush against his. Chapter 42 Cal Falling asleep curled up with Logan? is almost as good as being in bed inside, Logan. When her eyes creep open in the morning and meet mine, and her face lights up with a smile, I decide, actually, this is better than making love. This is being together. And I thought it would feel terrifying, but it just feels amazing. Hey, she whispers. Hey, I say back and I reach out to wipe a tiny smear of face mask from near her ear. I missed a spot last night. She nods. 
So you're not the best at spa nights, then? I smack her ass playfully and pull her in tight against me. I'm the best at spa night, and if you say otherwise, I'm going to hog all the supplies next time. We argue about it playfully for a while, and then we roll around in the sheets a while more. Eventually, Logan says she has to get ready to go to her volunteer shift. I check the time, panicking. But it's still early. I'm not meeting my dad for a few more hours. I decide I'd better wash my sheets after all that activity, and I'm bent over loading the washing machine when Logan comes up behind me. Cal, what all did you do yesterday? I close the door on the washer and stand, feeling nervous that I already fucked up after less than a day in a relationship. Logan holds an armful of towels and gestures around the apartment. You bought towels and candles and... Did you clean? Everything? Oh, I say, feeling relief wash over me. Yeah, I told you I was going to pull my weight. I didn't want you sending me another meeting invite. What if the meetings are more fun than you think? I like this side of her. I like everything about her. She plants a kiss on my cheek and adds some towels to the wash. Then she looks around the apartment, happily. It really feels like home now, she says. I squint, seeing how my stuff sort of blends with hers for a look that seems put together. It always felt like home to me, Lolo, from that first day. Hmm, she says, tapping that foot of hers and looking around. I pinch her behind and kiss her on the cheek. I think I just needed to get used to the idea, she says. That feels right. Logan heads to her volunteer shift, promising to leave her phone turned on this time so she can at least get my texts. I tell her to turn on her tracking app so I can find her if she's out knocking on doors, without me having to call and interrupt her if she's talking to someone. I suit up and head into the Oakland neighborhood near all the universities to meet my dad at the Swanky Club. I hate that he takes clients here. Orla told me they only recently started letting women in at all, and I make a mental note to tell my dad he should check out that bar Logan's been visiting. I find Dad and Edward as they're about to be seated, and the three of us grab mimosas from a tray on the bar. Mick, I certainly hope you have something to tell me worth toasting, Edward says, frowning as he sinks into his chair. Dad waves his hand. If it was bad news, I'd have met you at the plant again. He hooks a thumb at me. My kid here got you situated, and you'll be up and running again by morning. Edward looks like he's about to melt in relief at that news. I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding, seeing his response. Dad keeps talking. But I could have told you that on the phone. He winks at me as he takes a big swig of his drink. Eddie, my cow here was telling me some very interesting things about sensors. They're the way of the future for old dinosaurs like us. For the next hour... My dad prompts me to explain how the little sensors can adhere to all the parts of the machines throughout the steel plant and take human error out of the equation when it comes to monitoring the condition of all the parts and pieces of the steel-making process. Basically, instead of us coming in to check on things once a month or whatever interval, these babies are sending a constant stream of data around the clock. Edward squints, considering. Dad gestures for me to keep going, so I do. I tell him about the drones and how they can get closer to the heat sources, deeper inside smokestacks, further inside the coal storage. Dad takes over again when I start using the salt shakers to demonstrate what I'm talking about. He says, Eddie, we've got artificial intelligence experts at Beltane. And now that he's got you back on track, my boy Cal is going to be engineering our own custom drones for our bigger clients, the ones with the most complex needs. Out in the parking lot a few minutes later, Dad pats me on the shoulder. That was nice work in there, Callum. Thanks, Dad. I can't believe you got him to hire us to do predictive maintenance for them. Ray is going to shit when he gets to design that algorithm. Dad shakes his head. Cal, son, I wouldn't know predictive maintenance from a garbage truck. He pokes me in the chest. You got him to hire us for that, kiddo. Dad smiles and keeps patting my shoulder. You bringing your girl to dinner with your uncle later? Oh, crap, Dad, I can't tonight. I forgot to tell my family I'd be missing Brady family dinner today. 
Logan asked me to come help her with something for Juniper Jones. You know, Nicole's boss's brothers. Dad waves a hand in my face. I know who Juniper is, you goof. Go on and help her. And tell your mother hello from me when you see her this week. Dad kisses me on the forehead and spins on his heel as the valet brings his car around. I wave as he drives off. And then I pull up Logan's location on my phone as I walk to where I parked Big Red down the street. I would never trust a valet with my baby like that. I find Logan's blinking location dot in a neighborhood pretty easily, so I park the Bronc and head out to meet her. I didn't text her that I was coming, and when I spot her, I'm glad I get to watch her without her seeing. She stands on the corner talking to a woman with a young girl hiding behind her. I walk closer, and I can hear Logan talking about her own experience. I was raised by a single mom, she says to the woman and the little girl, and we struggled so much. So I know what it's like when people in charge don't care. And let me tell you, Juniper Jones cares. Logan shows the woman the list of programs Juniper brought into the court system. They go over the pamphlet together, and when Logan waves and starts to walk away, the girl actually runs out and hugs Logan's leg. I pop out from behind the hedge as Logan is working to pull herself together from her encounter. Hey, I whisper. She beams at me. You were great with them, I say. I feel great, she says. Everything is great. I love seeing her so happy, so light. We make our way through the apartment complex, knocking on doors and talking to renters, or just leaving pamphlets if nobody is home. I don't know how much time passes, but I feed off Logan's energy, watching as she gets more excited with each person we talk to. Juniper apparently gave Logan cards to hand out if people need housing support right now, before it gets to the point of going to court for an eviction, and Logan hands out a handful of those. I smile as she gives the families her personal cell number, offering to help them with the forms if anything is confusing when they try to sign up for help. Hey, I say stroking her cheek while she catches her breath after one of those conversations. You're really helping people today, Logan. You're making a difference. Oh, Cal. She wraps her arms around me and buries her face in my chest. That's all I hoped for. I had no idea I could feel this good, this useful. You're just getting started, Lolo. I squeeze her hand. When I moved in, I told you I was going to show you the world. She grins. I remember. I bring our clasped hands to my mouth and kiss her knuckles. I was so wrong, Logan. It's you showing me. You're showing me everything. We're quiet for a few blocks, hitting a bunch of homes where people don't answer the door. We pause at the street corner so Logan can check over the street list, and she tells me we have just one block left before it's time to head back to JJHQ. We make our way up the brick path to a house with a pretty sweet electric car in the driveway. I'm checking out the wheels when Logan knocks on the door until I hear the voice of the guy who answers it. Pete? I whip my head around when I hear Logan recognize Pete Harris, my hero. Hey, Callum, right? He steps out onto the porch and closes his door behind him. What are you guys doing here? Logan waves the flyers around to show him, but I cut in. We're out campaigning for our friend Juniper, but we can just leave this stuff and get out of your hair. I don't want to bother this guy or bore him if politics aren't his thing. It's one thing talking to strangers about this stuff, and another to be here asking a guy I wanted to work with if he'll vote for my friend. Juniper Jones? She's awesome, Pete says. She was on the bench when Beagle had to dispute a traffic situation. He waves a hand. It was a whole thing. She's running again? Logan nods and hands him a flyer. Hey, man, it was good running into you, I tell him, meaning it. I never did reach out, but we should grab a beer sometime. Pete nods and salutes me with the pamphlet. Definitely. It's so strange to come away from that conversation feeling like I finally have something at work worth talking about with him. Like, maybe Pete can just be my engineering friend instead of someone I want to use as a hiding place to run away from my family. My family, who is creating a whole new experience at Beltane that aligns with my passions, even if it doesn't involve automobiles. I feel like skipping as we finish up and make our way back to Big Red so we can drive to meet the rest of the crew. 
Logan is practically vibrating in the car, high on the sense of community she is building here. When we walk into the office Juniper rented for headquarters, the smell of food hits me in the face, and I realize I haven't eaten since brunch with my dad hours earlier. My stomach gurgles as I look around. I see Ty Stagg and his brothers in a room off to the side. It looks like they stayed behind to babysit about a million kids. What's all that? I whisper to Logan, gesturing toward the makeshift daycare. She giggles. The campaign wanted young families to feel like they could volunteer without worrying about their kids, she says as Ty pretends to be a zombie and starts chasing his giggling prey. We thought you two would never make it back. My uncle's voice rises above the cacophony, and I turn, startled to see him and my dad serving at the buffet line of food. Uncle Kel? He grins as he serves a piece of chicken to a young volunteer. Your dad mentioned why you weren't coming to family dinner today, he says, as my dad scoops out baked beans and mac and cheese. Kellen shrugs. We thought we'd bring dinner to you. Logan claps her hands in front of her chest. That's just the most amazing thing, she says. Thank you, Kellen, and you, Mick. She runs around to hug them both, and I stand with my hands in my pockets, grinning as my dad winks at me. I see Nicole and Zach come in the door, followed by Maddie and Liam. My face lights up when I also see my uncle's neighbor and her son make their way over from a table where it looks like they've been folding pamphlets. Everyone's here, Liam says nodding sternly and stating the obvious when Orla emerges from the childcare room looking like she's been to war. We all stare as Uncle Kel's neighbor Elizabeth gives him a shy peck on the cheek after he offers her two pieces of chicken at the buffet. Everyone is definitely here, I say. Logan comes back and inserts herself at my side. Without even thinking about it, I drape my arm over her shoulder and squeeze her close at my side. She kisses me on the cheek, and I grin. My family doesn't even give me crap about it, but Zack nods his head at me sternly until Nicole swats him and winks, giving Logan a thumbs up. Juniper stands on a chair and starts thanking everyone for their work until Nicole whistles and leads everyone in a round of applause for Juniper. I smile as my family whoops and hollers. I love how they showed up today. How they've all embraced Nicole as part of the family as much as anyone with the actual Brady last name. I love the way the Stag family adopted Nicole and then blended into the Bradys. How we've become this massive network of people who show the fuck up for each other eventually, when it matters. And then I look over at my roommate, looking sun-kissed and gorgeous as she bumps shoulders with my dad and steals food from my brother. She makes her way back to my side and my blissed-out feelings start shifting toward other sensations. Hey, I whisper to Logan, I have an idea. She reaches past me to grab a roll and bites into it as she makes a go-on gesture with her other hand. I hook my finger into the belt loop of her jeans and tug her closer to me. I think we should listen to the red coat as we walk back to my car and then go home and act out the naughty parts. Oh my gosh, she squeals. I love that idea. But instead of putting on the audiobook in the car, Logan is bubbling with excitement and starts to talk. I loved everything about today, she says. I loved how it made me feel good, and I loved how your whole family showed up. Well, my family loves you, I tell her. And then I realize something, and once I think it, I know I can't go another second without saying it. And I love you, Logan. The truth of it rings in the air, in her eyes, as she smiles back at me. You complete me. Or anyway, you make me better. And I look forward to just sitting next to you every day and, well, I love you. Wow, she says, slumping back against the seat. I pull the car over and turn to look at her. Nobody has ever said that to me before, she whispers. I've definitely never felt this way before, I tell her. For a second, I'm worried she isn't going to say it back to me. But I think of her face this morning, 
of the beautiful way she looks when she's asleep in my arms, the way she clutched my arm in excitement as she figured out how good she feels when she's giving back to other people. I know she cares about me, and I know she's right here with me in this, even if she's not ready to say it yet. So I say it again. I love you, Logan. I love you. A tear rolls down her face, and I reach to brush it away with my thumb. She turns her cheek into my hand and kisses my palm. Cal, she whispers, I feel so safe with you. I feel your love. She smiles at me in the dark, her eyes glittering beneath the streetlight. I love you too. I pull her in for a kiss, and I hold her until the windows start to steam. We pull apart, and I drive the rest of the way home, ready to keep on showing her how much I love her, ready to repeat it as often as I can. Epilogue Logan One year later Callum, you have to stop. He nips at my skin as he crawls around our bed as I try to swat him away from me. Cal. You're in the wedding party. He groans and stands up, scratching his bare butt and making me laugh. I still can't believe Nicole and Zach are having an actual wedding, he says, as he heads toward the shower. I pad down the hall to the office to wait my turn for the bathroom. Lord knows if I try to climb in there with Cal, we will never even get to the venue. Cal built a Murphy bed in what used to be my bedroom. If my mom ever agrees to come visit, we can pull the bed down and the whole desk just folds underneath. Mom finally let go of her second job, at least, once I send her a check made out to her landlord to cover the entire year's rent. Cal keeps reminding me, Mom has been balancing on a razor blade for so many years. It's going to take a long time for her to exhale. Meanwhile, after Juniper got reelected, I started volunteering with the organization here that provides emergency grants to single parents for rent. I pop open the software from our latest fundraising campaign and clap my hands when I see how much we've brought in to help these families. Cal sneaks up behind me and rubs his wet hair against my neck, making me squeal. You're up for the bathroom, Lolo, he says, starting to peel off my robe. I spin in his arms and plant a kiss on the tip of his nose. Later, I say, tugging it back closed. Today's about your brother. He follows me down the hall, trying to peek until I close the bathroom door in his face. He better watch out, or I'll make our wedding a whole weekend project, he shouts through the door. Cal and I joke about our eventual wedding all the time. Over the past year, we've worked so hard at communication. Being with Cal is easy. Talking with Cal about my fears, about the worries brewing in my own head, that is something I practice every day. But by the time Cal tugged me under the mistletoe at his family's Christmas party and the whole Brady crew applauded, I knew we were a permanent pair. It just feels like he belongs in my life. We'll figure out the best time to make it official. I love you, I tell him as we approach Heinz Hall. The wedding planner sweeps him away with the rest of the wedding party, and I head off to find my seat. Samantha waves and beckons me over, pulling me into a hug. You sitting with Foof for this shindig? She gestures around her, where Esther and Chloe and Piper are dressed to the nines. Juniper is officiating and gives me a wink from up at the podium as she organizes her notes. Nah, I say with a shrug. I'm over with Cal's uncle and cousin and such, but obviously we'll hang out at the reception. Sam shoos me away with a wink, and I squeeze into the front row, where Uncle Kellen and his girlfriend are taking pictures of everything. They're adorable. Kellen pointing out all the exciting features of the building, and Elizabeth telling him she loves that he notices that. She smiles warmly at me and squeezes my leg as I sit down. Isn't this terrific? She asks. And it is. It's terrific to see Zach overcome with emotion and Nicole being sincere as they promise to always care for each other. 
It's terrific to see Mick and his three boys looking so genuinely happy during photos after the ceremony. But the most terrific part is Cal pulling me close to him for a dance during the reception. I laugh as he tugs me over toward our family, who are all flailing their limbs as they dance with Nicole and Zach. I'm keeping my name, Nicole shouts as she spins and smiles. What if I take yours? Zach pokes a finger at his wife's ribs, a look of delight in his eyes. They start to argue about whether Nicole will let him become a Kennedy, and it's great to see them teasing each other. The balance they have between fun and serious. I feel like I have that same balance with Cal. I rest my cheek on his chest, feeling the heat radiate off of him as he laughs, and he runs his fingers through my hair like he often does. I love dancing with you, I tell him. Good thing we did a foot treatment the other day, he jokes. I'm on top of my game. He twirls me around a few times and then tugs me behind a marble column, planting a searing kiss on my mouth. I moan into him, twisting my fingers into the lapels of his suit. This isn't a game, I tell him. This is real life, and it's more than I ever dreamed of. I'm not good at saying that sort of thing, Logan, he says, running his lips along my jaw, but I definitely agree. He presses me closer to him, and I feel just how excited he is. Behave, I scold, and then kiss him again. I love the things you say, Callum Brady. How long do we have to stay? Let's see. At your brother's wedding? Until it's over. He groans and rests his forehead against mine. Hey, cheer up, I tell him. Nicole has a cookie table. Why don't we go get you a half dozen to distract you? Cal perks up at the mention of baked goods, and we search the lobby finding an overflowing buffet of every kind of cookie imaginable. Cal reaches in with both hands, delighting me with his excitement. I almost don't notice a flash of red dress rushing through the front doors. Hey, I nudge his shoulder. Wasn't that Orla? We look outside in time to see her dash across the street, tugging a man behind her, a determined look on her face. Who's that with her? Cal squints and nibbles his cookie, considering. That guy is a client, or his dad is. Anyway, it looks like Orla missed the memo about Brady staying till the end of this thing. Did she just grab his crotch? Cal winces and nods. Come on, he says, pulling me back inside the reception. I need to go gouge out my eyeballs and clear that memory. I look around the reception, where all my friends are smiling and waving, where our family is hugging and laughing, where the room vibrates with joy. We'll build new memories, I say to Cal, every day, together. I like that, he says. Hand in hand, we walk back toward the party, where we are welcomed with open arms. Thank you for listening to Vibration, an accidental roommate's romance. The Brady Family Series, Book Four. Written by Lainey Davis. Narrated by Tom Taylorson and Carly Robbins, both members of SAG-AFTRA. Produced by Blue Nose Audio. Production coordination by Karen White. Post-production by Banvard Audio. To stay informed about upcoming titles by Lainey Davis, go to laneydavis.com. Copyright 2023 by Lainey Davis. All rights reserved.